District of Columbia v. Heller, 554 U.S. 570, 2008. Syllabus. The District of Columbia generally prohibits the possession of handguns. It is a crime to carry an unregistered firearm, and the registration of handguns is prohibited. However, the Chief of Police may issue one-year licenses for handguns. District of Columbia law also requires residents to keep lawfully owned firearms unloaded and dissembled or bound by a trigger lock or similar device unless they are located in a place of business or are being used for lawful recreational activities. Respondent Heller, a D.C., special policeman, applied to register a handgun he wished to keep at home, but the district refused. He filed this suit seeking, on Second Amendment grounds, to enjoin the city from enforcing the bar on the registration of handguns, the licensing requirement insofar as it prohibits the carrying of a firearm in the home without a license, and the trigger lock requirement insofar as it prohibits the use of functional firearms within the home. The district court dismissed the suit, but the D.C. Circuit reversed, holding that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to possess firearms and that the city's total ban on handguns, as well as its requirement that firearms in the home be kept non-functional even when necessary for self-defense, violated that right. Held. The Second Amendment protects an individual right to possess a firearm unconnected with service in a militia and to use that arm for traditionally lawful purposes, such as self-defense within the home. The district's total ban on handgun possession in the home amounts to a prohibition on an entire class of arms that Americans overwhelmingly choose for the lawful purpose of self-defense. Under any of the standards of scrutiny, the court has applied to enumerated constitutional rights. This prohibition in the place where the importance of the lawful defense of self, family, and property is most acute would fail constitutional muster. The handgun ban and the trigger lock requirement, as applied to self-defense, violate the Second Amendment. The district must permit Heller to register his handgun and must issue him a license to carry it in the home. Justice Scalia delivered the opinion of the court, in which Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito joined. Justice Stevens filed a dissenting opinion, in which Justices Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer joined. Justice Breyer filed a dissenting opinion, in which Justices Stevens, Souter, and Ginsburg joined. Opinion of the Court Justice Scalia delivered the opinion of the Court. We consider whether a District of Columbia prohibition on the possession of usable handguns in the home violates the Second Amendment to the Constitution. 1. The District of Columbia generally prohibits the possession of handguns. It is a crime to carry an unregistered firearm, and the registration of handguns is prohibited. However, the Chief of Police may issue one-year licenses for handguns. District of Columbia law also requires residents to keep lawfully owned firearms unloaded and dissembled or bound by a trigger lock or similar device unless they are located in a place of business or are being used for lawful recreational activities. Respondent Heller, a D.C. special policeman, applied to register a handgun he wished to keep at home, but the district refused. He filed this suit seeking, on Second Amendment grounds, to enjoin the city from enforcing the bar on the registration of handguns, the licensing requirement insofar as it prohibits the carrying of a firearm in the home without a license, and the trigger lock requirement insofar as it prohibits the use of functional firearms within the home. The district court dismissed the suit, but the D.C. Circuit reversed, holding that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to possess firearms and that the city's total ban on handguns, as well as its requirement that firearms in the home be kept non-functional even when necessary for self-defense, violated that right. 2. We turn first to the meaning of the Second Amendment. A. The Second Amendment provides a well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. In interpreting this text, we are guided by the principle that to the Constitution was written to be understood by the voters. Its words and phrases were used in their normal and ordinary as distinguished from technical meaning. United States v. Sprague, 282 U.S., 716, 731, 1931. See also Gibbons v. Ogden, 9 Wheat, 128, 1824. The two sides in this case have set out very different interpretations of the amendment. Petitioners and today's dissenting justices believe that it protects only the right to possess and carry a firearm in connection with militia service. Respondent argues that it protects an individual right to possess a firearm unconnected with service in a militia, and to use that arm for traditionally lawful purposes, such as self-defense within the home. B. 
The amendment's prefatory clause announces a purpose, but does not limit or expand the scope of the operative clause. The operative clause's text and history demonstrate that it connotes an individual right to keep and bear arms. Operative Clause A. Right of the People The first salient feature of the operative clause is that it codifies a right of the people. The unamended Constitution and the Bill of Rights use the phrase right of the people two other times, in the First Amendment's Assembly and Petition Clause and in the Fourth Amendment's Search and Seizure Clause. The Ninth Amendment uses very similar terminology. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. All three of these instances unambiguously refer to individual rights, not collective rights, or rights that may be exercised only through participation in some corporate body. Three provisions of the Constitution refer to the people in a context other than rights, the famous preamble, we the people. Paragraph 2 of Article 1, providing that the people will choose members of the House, and the Tenth Amendment, providing that those powers not given the federal government remain with the states or the people. Those provisions arguably refer to the people acting collectively, but they deal with the exercise or reservation of powers, not rights. Nowhere else in the Constitution does a right attributed to the people refer to anything other than an individual right. Footnote 6. What is more, in all six other provisions of the Constitution that mention the people, the term unambiguously refers to all members of the political community, not an unspecified subset. As we said in United States v. Verdugo Urquidez, 494U, S. 259, 265, 1990. The people seems to have been a term of art employed in select parts of the Constitution. Its uses suggest that the people protected by the Fourth Amendment and by the First and Second Amendments, and to whom rights and powers are reserved in the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, refers to a class of persons who are part of a national community or who have otherwise developed sufficient connection with this country to be considered part of that community. This contrasts markedly with the phrase the militia in the prefatory clause. As we will describe below, the militia in colonial America consisted of a subset of the people, those who were male, able-bodied, and within a certain age range. Reading the Second Amendment as protecting only the right to keep and bear arms in an organized militia therefore fits poorly with the operative clause's description of the holder of that right as the people. We start therefore with a strong presumption that the Second Amendment right is exercised individually and belongs to all Americans. Bequi, keep and bear arms. We move now from the holder of the right, the people, to the substance of the right, to keep and bear arms. Before addressing the verbs keep and bear, we interpret their object, arms. The 18th century meaning is no different from the meaning today. The 1773 edition of Samuel Johnson's dictionary defined arms as weapons of offense or armor of defense. Bird Dictionary of the English Language, 107, 4th ed. here and after Johnson. Timothy Cunningham's important 1771 legal dictionary defined arms as anything that a man wears for his defense or takes into his hands or useth in wrath to cast at or strike another. 1. A New and Complete Law Dictionary, 1771. See also N. Webster, American Dictionary of the English Language, 1828, reprinted 1989, here and after Webster, similar. The term was applied, then as now, to weapons that were not specifically designed for military use and were not employed in a military capacity. For instance, Cunningham's legal dictionary gave as an example of usage. Servants and laborers shall use bows and arrows on Sundays, etc., and not bear other arms. See also, e.g., An Act for the Trial of Negroes, 1797, Delhi, Laws Ch. X3, Parker 6, Par 104, in Foreign First Laws of the State of Delaware, 102-104, J. Cushing at 1981, Pitta 1, C. Generally State v. Duke, 42 Tex of 455, 458, 1874, citing decisions of state courts construing arms. Although one founding era thesaurus limited arms, as opposed to weapons, to instruments of offense generally made use of in war, even that source stated that all firearms constituted arms. Fern J. Trussler, the distinction between words, 
esteemed synonymous in the English language 37, 1794, emphasis added. Some have made the argument, bordering on the frivolous, that only those arms in existence in the 18th century are protected by the Second Amendment. We do not interpret constitutional rights that way. Just as the First Amendment protects modern forms of communications, e.g., Renover's American Civil Liberties Union, 521U, S. 844, 849, 1997, and the Fourth Amendment applies to modern forms of search, e.g., Kylover's United States, 533U, S. 27, 35 36, 2001. The Second Amendment extends prima facie to all instruments that constitute bearable arms, even those that were not in existence at the time of the founding. We turn to the phrases keep arms and bear arms. Johnson defined keep as, most relevantly, to retain, not to lose, and to have in custody. Johnson 1095. Webster defined it as to hold, to retain in one's power or possession. No party has apprised us of an idiomatic meaning of keep arms. Thus, the most natural reading of keep arms in the Second Amendment is to have weapons. The phrase keep arms was not prevalent in the written documents of the founding period that we have found. But there are a few examples, all of which favor viewing the right to keep arms as an individual right unconnected with militia service. William Blackstone, for example, wrote that Catholics convicted of not attending service in the Church of England suffered certain penalties, one of which was that they were not permitted to keep arms in their houses. 4. Commentaries on the Laws of England V5, 1769, Here and After Blackstone, see also 1W, and M, C, 15 par 4 and 3 eng, Stat, at large 422, 1689, no papist on shall or may have or keep in his house, any arms. Warren Hawkins, Treatise on the Pleas of the Crown, 71, similar. Petitioners point to militia laws of the founding period that required militia members to keep arms in connection with militia service, and they conclude from this that the phrase keep arms has a militia-related connotation. See brief for petitioners, 16 to 17, citing laws of Delaware, New Jersey, and Virginia. This is rather like saying that, since there are many statutes that authorize aggrieved employees to file complaints with federal agencies, the phrase file complaints has an employment-related connotation. Keep arms was simply a common way of referring to possessing arms for militiamen and everyone else. Footnote 7. At the time of the founding as now, to bear meant to carry. See Johnson 161. Webster, T. Sheridan, A Complete Dictionary of the English Language. 1796. 2 Oxford English Dictionary 20. 2 Deodur 1989. Here and after Oxford. When used with arms, however, the term has a meaning that refers to carrying for a particular purpose confrontation. In Muscarello Vers United States, 524U, S. 125, 1998, in the course of analyzing the meaning of carries a firearm in a federal criminal statute, Justice Ginsburg wrote that Surely a most familiar meaning is, as the Constitution's Second Amendment indicates, wear, bear, or carry upon the person or in the clothing or in a pocket, for the purpose of being armed and ready for offensive or defensive action in a case of conflict with another person. Dorachian at 143, Dissenting Opinion, quoting Black's Law Dictionary 214, 6 1998. We think that Justice Ginsburg accurately captured the natural meaning of bare arms. Although the phrase implies that the carrying of the weapon is for the purpose of offensive or defensive action, it in no way connotes participation in a structured military organization. From our review of founding-era sources, we conclude that this natural meaning was also the meaning that bare arms had in the 18th century. In numerous instances, bare arms was unambiguously used to refer to the carrying of weapons outside of an organized militia. The most prominent examples are those most relevant to the Second Amendment. Nine state constitutional provisions written in the 18th century or the first two decades of the 19th, which enshrined a right of citizens to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state or bear arms in defense of himself and the state. Footnote 8. It is clear from those formulations that bear arms did not refer only to carrying a weapon in an organized military unit. Just as James Wilson interpreted the Pennsylvania Constitution's arms-bearing right, for example, as a recognition of the natural right of defense of one's person or house. 
what he called the law of self-preservation. Two collected works of James Wilson, 1142, and Nen, X. K. Hall and M. Hall Eds, 2007, citing Par Conster's Art 9, Par 21, 1790. See also T. Walker, Introduction to American Law, 198, 1837. Thus the right of self-defense is guaranteed by the Ohio Constitution. See also Eid, at 157, equating Second Amendment with that provision of the Ohio Constitution. That was also the interpretation of those state constitutional provisions adopted by pre-Civil War state courts. Footnote 9. These provisions demonstrate again, in the most analogous linguistic context, that bare arms was not limited to the carrying of arms in a militia. The phrase bare arms also had at the time of the founding an idiomatic meaning that was significantly different from its natural meaning, to serve as a soldier, do military service, fight, or to wage war. See Linguist's Brief, 18, Post, at 11, Stevens J. Dissenting but it unequivocally bore that idiomatic meaning only when followed by the preposition against, which was in turn followed by the target of the hostilities, see 2 Oxford 21. That is how, for example, our Declaration of Independence, P28, used the phrase, He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country. Every example given by petitioners Amici for the idiomatic meaning of bear arms from the founding period either includes the preposition against or is not clearly idiomatic. See Linguist's Brief 18-23. Without the preposition, bear arms normally meant, as it continues to mean today, what Justice Ginsburg's opinion in Muscarello said. In any event, the meaning of bare arms that petitioners and Justice Stevens propose is not even the sometimes idiomatic meaning. Rather, they manufacture a hybrid definition, whereby bare arms connotes the actual carrying of arms, and therefore is not really an idiom, but only in the service of an organized militia. No dictionary has ever adopted that definition, and we have been apprised of no source that indicates that it carried that meaning at the time of the founding. But it is easy to see why petitioners and the dissent are driven to the hybrid definition. Giving bare arms its idiomatic meaning would cause the protected right to consist of the right to be a soldier, or to wage war, an absurdity that no commentator has ever endorsed. C. L. Levy, Origins of the Bill of Rights, 135, 1999. Worse still, the phrase keep and bear arms would be incoherent. The word arms would have two different meanings at once. Weapons, as the object of keep, and as the object of bear, one half of an idiom. It would be rather like saying he filled and kicked the bucket to mean he filled the bucket and died. Grotesque. Petitioners justify their limitation of bear arms to the military context by pointing out the unremarkable fact that it was often used in that context, the same mistake they made with respect to keep arms. It is especially unremarkable that the phrase was often used in a military context in the federal legal sources, such as records of congressional debate, that have been the focus of petitioners' inquiry. Those sources would have had little occasion to use it except in discussions about the standing army and the militia. And the phrases used primarily in those military discussions include not only bear arms, but also carry arms, possess arms, and have arms, though no one thinks that those other phrases also had special military meanings. See Barnett, was the right to keep and bear arms conditioned on service in an organized militia? The 83 texts. El Rivero Stratiker, su exterior, tome cuadro. The common references to those fit to bear arms in congressional discussions about the militia are matched by use of the same phrase in the few non military federal contexts where the concept would be relevant. See, e.g., 30 Journals of Continental Congress 349 351, J. Fitzpatrick, Adir, 1934. Other legal sources frequently used bear arms in non military contexts. Footnote 10. Cunningham's legal dictionary, cited above, gave as an example of its usage a sentence unrelated to military affairs. Servants and laborers shall use bows and arrows on Sundays, etc., and not bear other arms. And if one looks beyond legal sources, bear arms was frequently used in non-military contexts. See Kramer and Olson. What did bear arms mean in the Second Amendment? The 6 Georgetown J.L. and Pub. Polly, forthcoming Septuagint 2008, Online at http papers.ssrn.com abstract he got 186176 as visited June 24, 2008, and available in Clerk of Courts case file. 
identifying numerous non-military uses of bear arms from the founding period. Justice Stevens points to a study by Amishi, supposedly showing that the phrase bear arms was most frequently used in the military context. See post at 1213N. 9. Linguists Brief. 24. Of course, as we have said, the fact that the phrase was commonly used in a particular context does not show that it is limited to that context, and in any event, we have given many sources where the phrase was used in non-military contexts. Moreover, the study's collection appears to include, who knows how many times, the idiomatic phrase, bear arms against, which is irrelevant. The Amitsi also dismiss examples such as, bear arms, for the purpose of killing game, because those uses are expressly qualified. Linguists, Brief, 24. Justice Stevens uses the same excuse for dismissing the state constitutional provisions analogous to the Second Amendment that identify private use purposes for which the individual right can be asserted. See post at 12. That analysis is faulty. A purpose of qualifying phrase that contradicts the word or phrase it modifies is unknown this side of the looking glass, except apparently in some courses on linguistics. If bear arms means, as we think, simply the carrying of arms, a modifier can limit the purpose of the carriage for the purpose of self-defense, or to make war against the king. But if bear arms means, as the petitioners and the dissent think, the carrying of arms only for military purposes, one simply cannot add, for the purpose of killing game. The right to carry arms in the militia for the purpose of killing game is worthy of the Mad Hatter. Thus, these purposive qualifying phrases positively establish that to bear arms is not limited to military use. Footnote 11. Justice Stevens places great weight on James Madison's inclusion of a conscientious objector clause in his original draft of the Second Amendment. But no person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms shall be compelled to render military service in person. Creating the Bill of Rights 12. H. Veit, K. Bowling, and C. Bickford Eds. 1991. Hereinafter Veit. He argues that this clause establishes that the drafters of the Second Amendment intended bear arms to refer only to military service. See Post at 26. It is always perilous to derive the meaning of an adopted provision from another provision deleted in the drafting process. Footnote 12. In any case, what Justice Stevens would conclude from the deleted provision does not follow. It was not meant to exempt from military service those who objected to going to war, but had no scruples about personal gunfights. Quakers opposed the use of arms, not just for militia service, but for any violent purpose whatsoever. So much so that Quaker frontiersmen were forbidden to use arms to defend their families, even though, in such circumstances, the temptation to seize a hunting rifle or knife in self-defense must sometimes have been almost overwhelming. P. Brock Pacifism in the United States, 359, 1968, C.M. Hearst, The Quakers in Peace and War, 336, 339, 1923, 3T. Clarkson, Portraiture of Quakerism, 103, 104, 3 Dadney, 1807. The Pennsylvania Militia Act of 1757 exempted from service those scrupling the use of arms, a phrase that no one contends had an idiomatic meaning. C5 Stat, at large of Paw 613. J. Mitchell and H. Flanders Eds, 1898. Emphasis added. Thus, the most natural interpretation of Madison's deleted text is that those opposed to carrying weapons for potential violent confrontation would not be compelled to render military service, in which such carrying would be required. Footnote 13. Finally, Justice Stevens suggests that keep and bear arms was some sort of term of art, presumably akin to hue and cry or cease and desist. This suggestion usefully evades the problem that there is no evidence whatsoever to support a military reading of keep arms. Justice Stevens believes that the unitary meaning of keep and bear arms is established by the Second Amendment's calling it a right, singular, rather than rights, plural. See post at 16, there is nothing to this. State constitutions of the founding period routinely grouped multiple related guarantees under a singular right and the First Amendment protects the right singular of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. C. E.G. Pa. Declaration of Rights, Paragordnex, 29, 15th, in 5 Thorpe, 3083, 3084, Ohio Constabert's Arts. Force Barge 11, 19, 1802, in a D, at 2910, 2911, footnote 14.
And even if keep and bear arms were a unitary phrase, we find no evidence that it bore a military meaning. Although the phrase was not at all common, which would be unusual for a term of art, we have found instances of its use with a clearly non-military connotation. In a 1780 debate in the House of Lords, for example, Lord Richmond described an order to disarm private citizens, not militia members, as a violation of the constitutional right of Protestant subjects to keep and bear arms for their own defense. 49. The London Magazine or Gentleman's Monthly Intelligencer 467, 1780. In response, another member of Parliament referred to the right of bearing arms for personal defense, making clear that no special military meaning for keep and bear arms was intended in the discussion. It do it 467, 468, footnote 15. C. Meaning of the operative clause. Putting all of these textual elements together, we find that they guarantee the individual right to possess and carry weapons in case of confrontation. This meaning is strongly confirmed by the historical background of the Second Amendment. We look to this because it has always been widely understood that the Second Amendment, like the First and Fourth Amendments, codified a pre-existing right. The very text of the Second Amendment implicitly recognizes the pre-existence of the right and declares only that it shall not be infringed. As we said in United States v. Cruikshank 92U, S. 542, 553, 1876, and his is not a right granted by the Constitution, neither is it in any manner dependent upon that instrument for its existence. The Second Amendment declares that it shall not be infringed. Footnote 16. Between the Restoration and the Glorious Revolution, the Stuart Kings Charles II and James II succeeded in using select militias loyal to them to suppress political dissidents, in part by disarming their opponents. C.J. Malcolm, To Keep and Bear Arms, 3153, 1994, Here and After Malcolm. L. Schwerer, The Declaration of Rights, 1689, Paja 76, 1981. Under the auspices of the 1671 Game Act, for example, the Catholic James II had ordered general disarmaments of regions home to his Protestant enemies. See Malcolm 103-106. These experiences caused Englishmen to be extremely wary of concentrated military forces run by the state and to be jealous of their arms. They accordingly obtained an assurance from William and Mary in the Declaration of Right, which was codified as the English Bill of Rights, that Protestants would never be disarmed that the subjects which are Protestants may have arms for their defense suitable to their conditions and as allowed by law. 1 W. And M. C. Zwei Ferrosiun in drei Eng. Stat. At large 441, 1689. This right has long been understood to be the predecessor to our Second Amendment. C. E. Dumbold, The Bill of Rights and What It Means Today. 1957. W. Rawl, A View of the Constitution of the United States of America. 122. 1825. Here and after Rawl. It was clearly an individual right, having nothing whatever to do with service in a militia. To be sure, it was an individual right not available to the whole population, given that it was restricted to Protestants. And like all written English rights, it was held only against the crown, not Parliament. See Schwerer, to hold and bear arms, the English perspective in Bogus 207-218, but see 3J. Story. Commentaries on the Constitution of the United States, Brar of 1858, 1833, here and after story, contending that the right to bear arms is a limitatio upon the power of Parliament as well. But it was secured to them as individuals, according to libertarian political principles, not as members of a fighting force. Schwerer Declaration of Rights at 283, see also ID at 78. G. Jelinek, The Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizens 49 and N. 7. 1901. Reprinted 1979. By the time of the founding, the right to have arms had become fundamental for English subjects. See Malcolm 122-134. Blackstone, whose works, we have said, constituted the preeminent authority on English law for the founding generation. Alden v. Maine, 527U. S. 706, 715, 1999. Cited the arms provision of the Bill of Rights as one of the fundamental rights of Englishmen. See for in Blackstone 136. 139 140, 1765. His description of it cannot possibly be thought to tie it to militia or military service. It was, he said, the natural right of resistance and self preservation, ID, at 139, and the right of having and using arms for self preservation and defense, ID, 
at 140, see also 3D at 24, 1768. Other contemporary authorities concurred. C.G. Sharp, Tracts, Concerning the Ancient and Only True Legal Means of National Defense, by a Free Militia 17-18, 27, 3D Edge in 1782, 2J. Delhomme, The Rise and Progress of the English Constitution, 886, 887, 1784, A. Stephen Zedin, 1838, W. Blizzard, Desultory Reflections on Police 5960, on 1785. Thus, the right secured in 1689 as a result of the Stuarts' abuses was by the time of the founding understood to be an individual right, protecting against both public and private violence. And of course, what the Stuarts had tried to do to their political enemies, George III had tried to do to the colonists. In the tumultuous decades of the 1760s and 1770s, the crown began to disarm the inhabitants of the most rebellious areas. That provoked polemical reactions by Americans invoking their rights as Englishmen to keep arms. A New York article of April 1769 said that, It is a natural right, which the people have reserved to themselves, confirmed by the Bill of Rights, to keep arms for their own defense. A Journal of the Times, Marba 17, New York Journal Saponta, 1 April 13, 1769, in Boston under Military Rule 79, O. Dickerson, Adur's 1936. See also, e.g., Shippen, Boston Gazette, John 30, 1769, in worse the writings of Samuel Adams, 299, H. Cushing, Adiz, 1968. They understood the right to enable individuals to defend themselves. As the most important early American edition of Blackstone's commentaries, by the law professor and former anti-federalist saint, George Tucker made clear in the notes to the description of the arms right, Americans understood the right of self-preservation as permitting a citizen to reaple force by force when the intervention of society in his behalf may be too late to prevent an injury. 1 Blackstone's Commentaries 145-146-N 42, 1803, here and after Tucker's Blackstone. See also W. Dewar, Outlines of the Constitutional Jurisprudence of the United States, 3132, 1833. There seems to us no doubt, on the basis of both text and history, that the Second Amendment conferred an individual right to keep and bear arms. Of course, the right was not unlimited, just as the First Amendment's right of free speech was not. See, e.g., United States v. Williams, 553 U. S. Do the note. Thus, we do not read the Second Amendment to protect the right of citizens to carry arms for any sort of confrontation, just as we do not read the First Amendment to protect the right of citizens to speak for any purpose. Before turning to limitations upon the individual right, however, we must determine whether the prefatory clause of the Second Amendment comports with our interpretation of the operative clause. 2. Prefatory Clause The prefatory clause reads, A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state. A. Well-regulated militia. In United States v. Miller, 307U. S. 174-179, 1939, we explain that the militia comprised all males physically capable of acting in concert for the common defense. That definition comports with founding-era sources. C.E.G. Webster The militia of a country are the able-bodied men organized into companies, regiments, and brigades, and required by law to attend military exercises on certain days only, but at other times left to pursue their usual occupations. The Federalist No. 46, pp. 329, 334 B. Wright Edder, 1961. J. Madison. Near half a million of citizens with arms in their hands. Letter to Destute de Tracy, Jan. 26, 1811, in the portable Thomas Jefferson, 520, 524, Monsieur Peterson, Edger, 1975. The militia of the state, that is to say, of every man in it able to bear arms. Petitioners take a seemingly narrower view of the militia, stating that, a militias are the state and congressionally regulated military forces described in the militia clauses, Artemir by Farabur 8, Silasers 15 to 16. Brief for petitioners, 12. Although we agree with petitioners' interpretive assumption that militia means the same thing in Article 1 and the Second Amendment, we believe that petitioners identify the wrong thing, namely, the organized militia. Unlike armies and navies, which Congress has given the power to create, to raise armies, to provide a navy, Artur I, for a Kribus 12 to 13, 
the militia is assumed by Article I already to be in existence. Congress is given the power to provide for calling forth the militia, per Refete to Colonel 15, and the power not to create, but to organize it, and not to organize a militia, which is what one would expect if the militia were to be a federal creation, but to organize the militia, connoting a body already in existence, Ibadui 6 Lover 16. This is fully consistent with the ordinary definition of the militia as all able bodied men. From that pool, Congress has plenary power to organize the units that will make up an effective fighting force. That is what Congress did in the first Militia Act, which specified that each and every free, able bodied white male citizen of the respective states resident therein who is or shall be of the age of 18 years and under the age of 45 years, except as is hereinafter accepted, shall severally and respectively be enrolled in the militia. Act of May 8, 1792, Wernstadt, 271. To be sure, Congress need not conscript every able-bodied man into the militia, because nothing in Article I suggests that in exercising its power to organize, discipline, and arm the militia, Congress must focus upon the entire body. Although the militia consists of all able-bodied men, the federally organized militia may consist of a subset of them. Finally, the adjective well-regulated implies nothing more than the imposition of proper discipline and training. See Johnson 1619. Regulate. To adjust by rule or method. Rawl 121-122. CF. Va. Declaration of Rights. Paragraph 13, 1776. In 7 Thorpe 3812, 3814. Referring to a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms. B. Security of a free state. The phrase security of a free state meant security of a free polity, not security of each of the several states as the dissent below argued. See 478F, 3D at 405 and N, 10. Joseph Story wrote in his treatise on the Constitution that the word state is used in various senses, and in its most enlarged sense, it means the people composing a particular nation or community. First Story. Pyrgur 208. See also 3ID, paragraph 1890, in reference to the Second Amendment's prefatory clause. The militia is the natural defense of a free country. It is true that the term state elsewhere in the Constitution refers to individual states, but the phrase security of a free state and close variations seem to have been terms of art in 18th century political discourse, meaning a free country or free polity. See Volok? Necessary to the Security of a Free State, 83 Notre Dame L. Revener 1, 5, 2007. C.E.G. 4 Blackstone 151, 1769. Brutus Essay III, November 15, 1787. In the Essential Anti-Federalist 251, 253. W. Allen and G. Lloyd Eds, Sued Edirm 2002. Moreover, the other instances of state in the Constitution are typically accompanied by modifiers making clear that the reference is to the several states, each state, several states, any state, that state, particular states, one state, no state. And the presence of the term foreign state in Article I and Article III shows that the word state did not have a single meaning in the Constitution. There are many reasons why the militia was thought to be necessary to the security of a free state. See Three Story, Merv 1890. First, of course, it is useful in repelling invasions and suppressing insurrections. Second, it renders large standing armies unnecessary. An argument that Alexander Hamilton made in favor of federal control over the militia. The Federalist No. 29, PP 226, 227, B. Wright Edin 1961, A. Hamilton. Third, when the able-bodied men of a nation are trained in arms and organized, they are better able to resist tyranny. Three, Relationship between prefatory clause and operative clause. We reach the question then. Does the preface fit with an operative clause that creates an individual right to keep and bear arms? It fits perfectly once one knows the history that the founding generation knew and that we have described above. That history showed that the way tyrants had eliminated a militia consisting of all the able-bodied men was not by banning the militia, but simply by taking away the people's arms enabling a select militia or standing army to suppress political opponents. This is what had occurred in England that prompted codification of the right to have arms in the English Bill of Rights. The debate with respect to the right to keep and bear arms, as with other guarantees in the Bill of Rights, was not over whether it was desirable, all agreed that it was, 
but over whether it needed to be codified in the Constitution. During the 1788 ratification debates, the fear that the federal government would disarm the people in order to impose rule through a standing army or select militia was pervasive in anti-federalist rhetoric. See? E.g. Letters from the Federal Farmer III, Octors 10, 1787, and second, the complete anti-federalist 234, 242, H. Storing Adir, 1981. John Smiley, for example, worried not only that Congress's command of the militia could be used to create a select militia, or to have no militia at all, but also, as a separate concern, that, when a select militia is formed, the people in general may be disarmed. Two Documentary History of the Ratification of the Constitution, 508-509. M. Jensen, ed. 1976. Here and after Documentary Heist. Federalists responded that because Congress was given no power to abridge the ancient right of individuals to keep and bear arms, such a force could never oppress the people. See, e.g., a Pennsylvanian 3, February 20, 1788, in the origin of the Second Amendment, 275-276, D. Young et in Sigurdi et in 2001, here and after Young, White to the Citizens of Virginia, February 22, 1788, in E.D., at 280, 281, a Citizen of America, October 10, 1787, in A.D., at 38, 40, Remarks on the Amendments to the Federal Constitution, November 7, 1788, in A.D., at 556. It was understood across the political spectrum that the right helped to secure the ideal of a citizen militia, which might be necessary to oppose an oppressive military force if the constitutional order broke down. It is therefore entirely sensible that the Second Amendment's prefatory clause announces the purpose for which the right was codified, to prevent elimination of the militia. The prefatory clause does not suggest that preserving the militia was the only reason Americans valued the ancient right. Most undoubtedly thought it even more important for self-defense and hunting. But the threat that the new federal government would destroy the citizens' militia by taking away their arms was the reason that right unlike some other English rights, was codified in a written constitution. Justice Breyer's assertion that individual self-defense is merely a subsidiary interest of the right to keep and bear arms, see post at 36, is profoundly mistaken. He bases that assertion solely upon the prologue, but that can only show that self-defense had little to do with the right's codification. It was the central component of the right itself, besides ignoring the historical reality that the Second Amendment was not intended to lay down a novel principle but rather codified a right inherited from our English ancestors, Robertson v. Baldwin, 165 U. S. 275-281-1897. Petitioner's interpretation does not even achieve the narrower purpose that prompted codification of the right. If, as they believe, the Second Amendment right is no more than the right to keep and use weapons as a member of an organized militia, see brief for petitioners. 8i if, that is, the organized militia is the sole institutional beneficiary of the Second Amendment's guarantee. It does not assure the existence of a citizen's militia as a safeguard against tyranny. For Congress retains plenary authority to organize the militia, which must include the authority to say who will belong to the organized force. Footnote 17 That is why the first Militia Act's requirement that only whites enroll caused states to amend their militia laws to exclude free blacks. See Siegel, the Federal Government's Power to Enact Color-Conscious Laws, 92, Nawa. Schwell River 477, 521, 529, 1998. Thus, if petitioners are correct, the Second Amendment protects citizens' right to use a gun in an organization from which Congress has plenary authority to exclude them. It guarantees a select militia of the sort the Stuart Kings found useful, but not the people's militia that was the concern of the founding generation. B. Our interpretation is confirmed by analogous arms-bearing rights in state constitutions that preceded and immediately followed adoption of the Second Amendment. Four states adopted analogs to the federal Second Amendment in the period between independence and the ratification of the Bill of Rights. Two of them, Pennsylvania and Vermont, clearly adopted individual rights unconnected to militia service. Pennsylvania's Declaration of Rights of 1776 said that the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state Parithid in 5 Thorpe 3082-3083, emphasis added. In 1777, Vermont adopted the identical provision, except for inconsequential differences in punctuation and capitalization. Sivet, const. 1 paragraph 15 and 6 ed at 3741.
North Carolina also codified a right to bear arms in 1776. That the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of the state. Declaration of Rights. 17. In I. Deed. At 2787. 2788. This could plausibly be read to support only a right to bear arms in a militia, but that is a peculiar way to make the point in a constitution that elsewhere repeatedly mentions the militia explicitly. See paragraph 414, 18, 35, in 5 ID, 2789, 2791, 2793. Many colonial statutes required individual arms bearing for public safety reasons, such as the 1770 Georgia law that, for the security and defense of this province from internal dangers and insurrections, required those men who qualified for militia duty individually to carry firearms to places of public worship. 19 Colonial Records of the State of Georgia, 137-139, A. Candler, Adin 1911, Pet 2, emphasis added. That broad public safety understanding was the connotation given to the North Carolina right by that state's Supreme Court in 1843. C. State v. Huntley, 3 Ired, 418, 4 and 22, 423. The 1780 Massachusetts Constitution presented another variation on the theme. The people have a right to keep and to bear arms for the common defense. Chot. First Art, 17 in 3 Thorpe, 1888, 1892. Once again, if one gives narrow meaning to the phrase common defense, this can be thought to limit the right to the bearing of arms in a state-organized military force. But once again, the state's highest court thought otherwise. Writing for the court in an 1825 libel case, Chief Justice Parker wrote, The liberty of the press was to be unrestrained, but he who used it was to be responsible in cases of its abuse, like the right to keep firearms, which does not protect him who uses them for annoyance or destruction. Commonwealth v. Blanding, 20 Mass., 304, 313, 314. The analogy makes no sense if firearms could not be used for any individual purpose at all. See also Cates, Handgun Prohibition and the Original Meaning of the Second Amendment, 82 Meek. L. Reverend 204, 244, 1983. 19th century courts never read common defense to limit the use of weapons to militia service. We therefore believe that the most likely reading of all four of these pre-Second Amendment state constitutional provisions is that they secured an individual right to bear arms for defensive purposes. Other states did not include rights to bear arms in their pre-1789 constitutions, although in Virginia, a Second Amendment analog was proposed, unsuccessfully by Thomas Jefferson. It read, No freeman shall ever be debarred the use of arms within his own lands or tenements. Footnote 18. 1. The Papers of Thomas Jefferson, 344, J. Boyd, Adair, 1950. Between 1789 and 1820, nine states adopted Second Amendment analogs. Four of them, Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, and Missouri, referred to the right of the people to bear arms in defense of themselves in the state. CNN. Oin Supra. Another three states, Mississippi, Connecticut, and Alabama, used the even more individualistic phrasing that each citizen has the right to bear arms in defense of himself and the state. See Ibid. Finally, two states, Tennessee and Maine, used the common defense language of Massachusetts. C10. Kunst. Art. X. Power 26. 1796. In 6. The Thorpe. 3414. 3424. Me. Kunst. Art. By. Paragraph 16. 1819. In 3 I.D. at 1646, 1648. That of the nine state constitutional protections for the right to bear arms, enacted immediately after 1789, at least seven unequivocally protected an individual citizen's right to self defense, is strong evidence that that is how the founding generation conceived of the right. And with one possible exception that we discuss in Part 2 D2, 19th century courts and commentators interpreted these state constitutional provisions to protect an individual right to use arms for self-defense. C.N. Signed Supra Simpson v. State, 5 year. is 6 360 10 18 The historical narrative that petitioners must endorse would thus treat the Federal Second Amendment as an odd outlier, protecting a right unknown in state constitutions or at English common law, based on little more than an overreading of the prefatory clause. C. Justice Stevens relies on the drafting history of the Second Amendment, the various proposals in the state conventions, and the debates in Congress. It is dubious to rely on such history to interpret a text that was widely understood to codify a pre-existing right, rather than to fashion a new one.
But even assuming that this legislative history is relevant, Justice Stevens flatly misreads the historical record. It is true, as Justice Stevens says, that there was concern that the federal government would abolish the institution of the state militia. See Post at 20. That concern found expression, however, not in the various Second Amendment precursors proposed in the state conventions, but in separate structural provisions that would have given the state's concurrent and seemingly non-preemptible authority to organize, discipline, and arm the militia when the federal government failed to do so. See Vite 1720, Virginia Proposal. 4J, Elliott, The Debates in the Several State Conventions on the Adoption of the Federal Constitution, 244, 245, 2D Dungeon 1836, reprinted 1941, North Carolina Proposal. See also 2 Documentary Heist, 4 Pennsylvania Minorities Proposal. The Second Amendment precursors, by contrast, referred to the individual English right already codified in two, and probably four, state constitutions. The Federalist-dominated First Congress chose to reject virtually all major structural revisions favored by the Anti-Federalists, including the proposed militia amendments. Rather, it adopted primarily the popular and uncontroversial, though in the Federalists' view unnecessary, individual rights amendments. The Second Amendment right, protecting only individuals' liberty to keep and carry arms, did nothing to assuage Anti-Federalists' concerns about federal control of the militia. See, e.g., Sentinel revived, no. Fartzinder, Philadelphia Independent Gazetteer, Septur 9, 1789, in Young 711, 712. Justice Stevens thinks it significant that the Virginia, New York, and North Carolina Second Amendment proposals were embedded within a group of principles that are distinctly military in meaning, such as statements about the danger of standing armies. Post, at 22. But so was the highly influential minority proposal in Pennsylvania, yet that proposal, with its reference to hunting, plainly referred to an individual right. See 2 Documentary Heist, 6 and 24. Other than that erroneous point, Justice Stevens has brought forward absolutely no evidence that those proposals conferred only a right to carry arms in a militia. By contrast, New Hampshire's proposal, the Pennsylvania Minorities' proposal, and Samuel Adams' proposal in Massachusetts unequivocally referred to individual rights, as did two state constitutional provisions at the time. C. Vait, 1617, New Hampshire Proposal, 6 Documentary Heist, 1452-1453, J. Kaminsky and G. Saladino Eds, 2000, Samuel Adams' Proposal. Justice Stevens' view thus relies on the proposition, unsupported by any evidence, that different people of the founding period had vastly different conceptions of the right to keep and bear arms. That simply does not comport with our long-standing view that the Bill of Rights codified venerable, widely understood liberties. D. We now address how the Second Amendment was interpreted from immediately after its ratification through the end of the 19th century. Before proceeding, however, we take issue with Justice Stevens' equating of these sources with post-enactment legislative history a comparison that betrays a fundamental misunderstanding of a court's interpretive task. See post at 28. Legislative history, of course, refers to the pre-enactment statements of those who drafted or voted for a law. It is considered persuasive by some, not because they reflect the general understanding of the disputed terms, but because the legislators who heard or read those statements presumably voted with that understanding. Ibid. Post-enactment legislative history. Ibidisir, a deprecatory contradiction in terms, refers to statements of those who drafted or voted for the law that are made after its enactment, and hence could have had no effect on the congressional vote. It most certainly does not refer to the examination of a variety of legal and other sources to determine the public understanding of a legal text in the period after its enactment or ratification. That sort of inquiry is a critical tool of constitutional interpretation. As we will show, Virtually all interpreters of the Second Amendment in the century after its enactment interpreted the amendment as we do. 1. Post-ratification commentary. Three important founding-era legal scholars interpreted the Second Amendment in published writings. All three understood it to protect an individual right unconnected with militia service. St. George Tucker's version of Blackstone's commentaries, as we explained above, conceived of the Blackstonian arms right as necessary for self-defense. He equated that right, absent the religious and class-based restrictions, with the Second Amendment. See Secretary Tucker's Blackstone 143. In Note D, entitled, View of the Constitution of the United States, 
Tucker elaborated on the Second Amendment. This may be considered as the true palladium of liberty. The right to self-defense is the first law of nature. In most governments, it has been the study of rulers to confine the right within the narrowest limits possible. Wherever standing armies are kept up, and the right of the people to keep and bear arms is, under any color or pretext whatsoever, prohibited, liberty, if not already annihilated, is on the brink of destruction. Redowns at App. 300. Ellipsis in original. He believed that the English game laws had abridged the right by prohibiting keeping a gun or other engine for the destruction of game. Ibid, see also 2QID, at 143, and Nen, 40 and 41. He later grouped the right with some of the individual rights included in the First Amendment and said that if a law be passed by Congress prohibiting any of those rights, it would be the province of the judiciary to pronounce whether any such act were constitutional or not, and if not, to acquit the accused. Wernidakos Hayes at Apores, 357. It is unlikely that Tucker was referring to a person's being accused of violating a law making it a crime to bear arms in a state militia. Footnote 19. In 1825, William Rawl, a prominent lawyer who had been a member of the Pennsylvania Assembly that ratified the Bill of Rights, published an influential treatise which analyzed the Second Amendment as follows. The first principle is a declaration that a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state, a proposition from which few will dissent. The corollary from the first position is that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The prohibition is general. No clause in the Constitution could by any rule of construction be conceived to give to Congress a power to disarm the people. Such a flagitious attempt could only be made under some general pretense by a state legislature. But if in any blind pursuit of inordinate power, either should attempt it, this amendment may be appealed to as a restraint on both. Rawl 121-122, footnote 20. Like Tucker, Rawl regarded the English game laws as violating the right codified in the Second Amendment. C.A.D. 122-123. Rawl clearly differentiated between the people's right to bear arms and their service in a militia. In a people permitted and accustomed to bear arms, we have the rudiments of a militia, which properly consists of armed citizens, divided into military bands and instructed at least in part in the use of arms for the purposes of war. E.D. At 140. Rawl further said that the Second Amendment right ought not be abused to the disturbance of the public peace, such as by assembling with other armed individuals for an unlawful purpose, statements that make no sense if the right does not extend to any individual purpose. Joseph Story published his famous commentaries on the Constitution of the United States in 1833. Justice Stevens suggests that there is not so much as a whisper in Story's explanation of the Second Amendment that favors the individual rights view. Post at 34, that is wrong. Story explained that the English Bill of Rights had also included a right to bear arms, a right that, as we have discussed, had nothing to do with militia service. Three Story para Garso und Zimpridiot. He then equated the English right with the Second Amendment. First for 1891. A similar provision to the Second Amendment in favor of Protestants, for to them it is confined, is to be found in the Bill of Rights of 1688, it being declared that the subjects, which are Protestants, may have arms for their defense suitable to their condition and as allowed by law. But under various pretenses, the effect of this provision has been greatly narrowed, and it is at present in England more nominal than real, as a defensive privilege. Footnotes omitted. This comparison to the Declaration of Right would not make sense if the Second Amendment right was the right to use a gun in a militia, which was plainly not what the English right protected. As the Tennessee Supreme Court recognized 38 years after Story wrote his commentaries, well, the passage from Story shows clearly that this right was intended and was guaranteed to, and to be exercised and enjoyed by the citizen as such, and not by him as a soldier, or in defense solely of his political rights. Andrews v. State, 50 10 165 183 1871 Story's commentaries also cite as support Tucker and Rawl, both of whom clearly viewed the right as unconnected to militia service. C3 Story Fargo 1890N. Those Pari Yuots and Cinema Ventayuno Nen. 3. In addition, in a shorter 1840 work story wrote, 
One of the ordinary modes by which tyrants accomplish their purposes without resistance is by disarming the people and making it an offense to keep arms and by substituting a regular army in the stead of a resort to the militia. A familiar exposition of the Constitution of the United States. 450, reprinted in 1986. Anti-slavery advocates routinely invoked the right to bear arms for self-defense. Joel Tiffany, for example, citing Blackstone's description of the right, wrote that, the right to keep and bear arms also implies the right to use them if necessary in self-defense. Without this right to use the guarantee would have hardly been worth the paper it consumed. A Treatise on the Unconstitutionality of American Slavery, 117-118, 1849. See also L. Spooner, The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, 16, 1845. Right enables personal defense. In his famous Senate speech about the 1856 Bleeding Kansas Conflict, Charles Sumner proclaimed, The rifle has ever been the companion of the pioneer, and under God, his tutelary protector against the red man and the beast of the forest. Never was this efficient weapon more needed in just self-defense than now in Kansas, and at least one article in our national constitution must be blotted out before the complete right to it can in any way be impeached. And yet such is the madness of the hour that in defiance of the solemn guarantee embodied in the amendments to the Constitution, that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, the people of Kansas have been arraigned for keeping and bearing them, and the senator from South Carolina has had the face to say openly, on this floor, that they should be disarmed, of course, that the fanatics of slavery, his allies and constituents, may meet no impediment. The Crime Against Kansas, May 19, 1856, in American Speeches, Political Oratory from the Revolution to the Civil War, 553, 606-607, 2006. We have found only one early 19th century commentator who clearly conditioned the right to keep and bear arms upon service in the militia, and he recognized that the prevailing view was to the contrary. The provision of the Constitution declaring the right of the people to keep and bear arms, etc., was probably intended to apply to the right of the people to bear arms for such militia-related purposes only, and not to prevent Congress or the legislatures of the different states from enacting laws to prevent the citizens from always going armed. A different construction, however, has been given to it. b. Oliver, The Rights of an American Citizen, 177, 1832, 2. Pre-Civil War Case Law. The 19th century cases that interpreted the Second Amendment universally support an connected to militia service. In Houston v. Moore 5 Wheat, 1 24, 1820, this court held that states have concurrent power over the militia, at least where not preempted by Congress. Agreeing in dissent that states could organize, discipline, and arm the militia in the absence of conflicting federal regulation. Justice Story said that the Second Amendment may not, perhaps, be thought to have any important bearing on this point. If it have, it confirms and illustrates rather than impugns the reasoning already suggested. Id. At 5153. Of course, if the amendment simply protected the right of the people of each of the several states to maintain a well-regulated militia, post at 1, Stevens J. dissenting, it would have enormous and obvious bearing on the point. But the court and story derived the state's power over the militia from the non-exclusive nature of federal power, not from the Second Amendment, whose preamble merely confirms and illustrates the importance of the militia. Even clearer was Justice Baldwin in the famous fugitive slave case of Johnson v. Tompkins, 13 F. Cass, 840, 850, 852, C.C. Pardur's 1833. Baldwin, sitting as a circuit judge, cited both the Second Amendment and the Pennsylvania Analog for his conclusion that a citizen has a right to carry arms in defense of his property or person, and to use them if either were assailed with such force, numbers, or violence as made it necessary for the protection or safety of either. Many early 19th century state cases indicated that the Second Amendment right to bear arms was an individual right unconnected to militia service, though subject to certain restrictions. A Virginia case in 1824, holding that the Constitution did not extend to free blacks, explained that numerous restrictions imposed on blacks in our statute book, many of which are inconsistent with the letter and spirit of the Constitution, both of this state and of the United States as respects the free whites demonstrate, that here, those instruments have not been considered to extend equally to both classes of our population. 
we will only instance the restriction upon the migration of free blacks into this state and upon their right to bear arms. Aldridge vs. Commonwealth. To the Viao. Cass. 447-449. Jenner Key. The claim was obviously not that blacks were prevented from carrying guns in the militia. Footnote 21. See also Waters vs. State. Foreign Gill 302-309. Mem Dollars. 1843. Because free blacks were treated as a dangerous population, laws have been passed to prevent their migration into this state, to make it unlawful for them to bear arms, to guard even their religious assemblages with peculiar watchfulness. An 1829 decision by the Supreme Court of Michigan said, The Constitution of the United States also grants to the citizen the right to keep and bear arms, but the grant of this privilege cannot be construed into the right in him who keeps a gun to destroy his neighbor. No rights are intended to be granted by the Constitution for an unlawful or unjustifiable purpose. United States v. Sheldon, in five transactions of the Supreme Court of the Territory of Michigan, 337, 346, W. Bloom, Edu 1940, here and after Bloom. It is not possible to read this as discussing anything other than an individual right unconnected to militia service. If it did have to do with militia service, the limitation upon it would not be any unlawful or unjustifiable purpose, but any non-military purpose whatsoever. In Nunver's state, Orgerudu Vorthri, 251, 1846, the Georgia Supreme Court construed the Second Amendment as protecting the natural right of self-defense and therefore struck down a ban on carrying pistols openly. Its opinion perfectly captured the way in which the operative clause of the Second Amendment furthers the purpose announced in the prefatory clause in continuity with the English right. The right of the whole people, old and young, men, women, and boys, and not militia only, to keep and bear arms of every description, and not such merely as are used by the militia, shall not be infringed, curtailed, or broken in upon in the smallest degree, and all this for the important end to be attained, the rearing up and qualifying a well-regulated militia, so vitally necessary to the security of a free state. Our opinion is that any law, state or federal, is repugnant to the Constitution, and void which contravenes this right, originally belonging to our forefathers, trampled underfoot by Charles the Firsters and his two wicked sons and successors, re-established by the Revolution of 1688, conveyed to this land of liberty by the colonists, and finally incorporated conspicuously in our own Magna Charta, likewise in State versus Chandler, 5 Lay, and 489, 490, 1850, the Louisiana Supreme Court held that citizens had a right to carry arms openly, this is the right guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States, and which is calculated to incite men to a manly and noble defense of themselves if necessary, and of their country, without any tendency to secret advantages and unmanly assassinations. Those who believe that the Second Amendment preserves only a militia-centered right place, great reliance on the Tennessee Supreme Court's 1840 decision in Amet v. State, 21st Tenor 154. The case does not stand for that broad proposition. In fact, the case does not mention the word militia at all, except in its quoting of the Second Amendment. I met held that the state constitutional guarantee of the right to bear arms did not prohibit the banning of concealed weapons. The opinion first recognized that both the state right and the federal right were descendants of the 1689 English right. But, erroneously, and contrary to virtually all other authorities, read that right to refer only to protect ion of the public liberty, and keeping in awe those in power, I.D. but 158. The court then adopted a sort of middle position, whereby citizens were permitted to carry arms openly, unconnected with any service in a formal militia, but were given the right to use them only for the military purpose of banding together to oppose tyranny. This odd reading of the right is, to be sure, not the one we adopt, but it is not petitioner's reading either. More importantly, Seven years earlier, the Tennessee Supreme Court had treated the state constitutional provision as conferring a right of all the free citizens of the state to keep and bear arms for their defense. Simpson, five-year Dury, at 360. And 21 years later, the court held that the keep portion of the state constitutional right included the right to personal self-defense. The right to keep arms involves necessarily the right to use such arms for all the ordinary purposes, and in all the ordinary modes usual in the country, and to which arms are adapted, limited by the duties of a good citizen in times of peace. Andrews 50 tenures at 178, see also Ibid. 
equating state provision with Second Amendment. 3. Post-Civil War Legislation In the aftermath of the Civil War, there was an outpouring of discussion of the Second Amendment in Congress and in public discourse, as people debated whether and how to secure constitutional rights for newly free slaves. See generally S. Halbrook, Friedman, the Fourteenth Amendment and the Right to Bear Arms, 1866-1876, 1998, here and after Halbrook, brief for Institute for Justice as amicus curiae. Since those discussions took place 75 years after the ratification of the Second Amendment, they do not provide as much insight into its original meaning as earlier sources. Yet those born and educated in the early 19th century faced a widespread effort to limit arms ownership by a large number of citizens. Their understanding of the origins and continuing significance of the amendment is instructive. Blacks were routinely disarmed by southern states after the Civil War. Those who opposed these injustices frequently stated that they infringed blacks' constitutional right to keep and bear arms. Needless to say, the claim was not that blacks were being prohibited from carrying arms in an organized state militia. A report of the Commission of the Freedmen's Bureau in 1866 stated plainly, The civil law of Kentucky prohibits the colored man from bearing arms. Their arms are taken from them by the civil authorities. Thus, the right of the people to keep and bear arms as provided in the Constitution is infringed. H. R. Exec. Duck. Number 70, 39th Kong, 1st Session, 233-236, a joint congressional report decried, In some parts of South Carolina, armed parties are, without proper authority, engaged in seizing all firearms found in the hands of the freemen. Such conduct is in clear and direct violation of their personal rights as guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States, which declares that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Boys, the freedmen of South Carolina have shown by their peaceful and orderly conduct that they can safely be trusted with firearms, and they need them to kill game for subsistence and to protect their crops from destruction by birds and animals. Jointcom. On Reconstruction, H.R. Rep. No. 30, 39th Kong, 1st Sessence P. 2, Ponge 229, 1866, proposed circular of Brigadier General R. Saxton. The view expressed in these statements was widely reported and was apparently widely held. For example, an editorial in the Loyal Georgian, Augusta, on February 3, 1866, assured blacks that all men, without distinction of color, have the right to keep and bear arms to defend their homes, families, or themselves. Halbrook 19. Congress enacted the Freedmen's Bureau Act on July 16, 1866. Section 14 stated, The right to have full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings concerning personal liberty, personal security, and the acquisition, enjoyment, and disposition of a state, real and personal, including the constitutional right to bear arms, shall be secured to and enjoyed by all the citizens, without respect to race or color or previous condition of slavery. 176-177. The understanding that the Second Amendment gave freed blacks the right to keep and bear arms was reflected in congressional discussion of the bill, with even an opponent of it saying that the founding generation were for every man bearing his arms about him and keeping them in his house, his castle, for his own defense. Kong. Globe 39th Kong, 1st Sesimar, 362, 371, 1866, Senator Davis. Similar discussion attended the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1871 and the Fourteenth Amendment. For example, Representative Butler said of the Act, Section 8 is intended to enforce the well-known constitutional provision guaranteeing the right of the citizen to keep and bear arms, and provides that whoever shall take away, by force or violence, or by threats and intimidation, the arms and weapons which any person may have for his defense, shall be deemed guilty of larceny of the same. H. R. Repno 37, 41st Kong 3D Sesimar P. 7 8, 1871. With respect to the proposed amendment, Senator Pomeroy described as one of the three indispensable safeguards of liberty under the Constitution a man's right to bear arms for the defense of himself and family and his homestead. Tokchark. Globe, 39th Kong, 1st Sess, 1182, 1866. Representative Nye thought the 14th Amendment unnecessary because as citizens of the United States blacks have equal right to protection and to keep and bear arms for self-defense. It in a return at 1073, 1866. 
It was plainly the understanding in the post-Civil War Congress that the Second Amendment protected an individual right to use arms for self-defense. Four, post-Civil War commentators. Every late 19th century legal scholar that we have read interpreted the Second Amendment to secure an individual right unconnected with militia service. The most famous was the judge and professor Thomas Cooley, who wrote a massively popular 1868 treatise on constitutional limitations. Concerning the Second Amendment, it said, Among the other defenses to personal liberty should be mentioned the right of the people to keep and bear arms. The alternative to a standing army is a well-regulated militia, but this cannot exist unless the people are trained to bearing arms. How far it is in the power of the legislature to regulate this right, we shall not undertake to say, as happily there has been very little occasion to discuss that subject by the courts. Idir, at 350. That Cooley understood the right not as connected to militia service, but as securing the militia by ensuring a populace familiar with arms, is made even clearer in his 1880 work, General Principles of Constitutional Law. The Second Amendment, he said, was adopted with some modification and enlargement from the English Bill of Rights of 1688, where it stood as a protest against arbitrary action of the overturned dynasty in disarming the people. Idrisir is at 2 and 70. In a section entitled, the right in general, he continued, It might be supposed from the phraseology of this provision that the right to keep and bear arms was only guaranteed to the militia. But this would be an interpretation not warranted by the intent. The militia, as has been elsewhere explained, consists of those persons who, under the law, are liable to the performance of military duty and are officered and enrolled for service when called upon. But the law may make provision for the enrollment of all who are fit to perform military duty, or of a small number only, or it may wholly omit to make any provision at all. And if the right were limited to those enrolled, the purpose of this guarantee might be defeated altogether by the action or neglect to act of the government it was meant to hold in check. The meaning of the provision undoubtedly is that the people, from whom the militia must be taken, shall have the right to keep and bear arms and they need no permission or regulation of law for the purpose. But this enables government to have a well-regulated militia, for to bear something more than the mere keeping. It implies the learning to handle and use them in a way that makes those who keep them ready for their efficient use. In other words, it implies the right to meet for voluntary arms, observing and doing so the laws of public order. Idot at 271. All other post-Civil War 19th century sources we have found concurred with Cooley. One example from each decade will convey the general flavor. The purpose of the Second Amendment is to secure a well-armed militia. But a militia would be useless unless the citizens were enabled to exercise themselves in the use of warlike weapons. To preserve this privilege, and to secure to the people the ability to oppose themselves in military force against the usurpations of government as well as against enemies from without, that government is forbidden by any law or proceeding to invade or destroy the right to keep and bear arms. The clause is analogous to the one securing the freedom of speech and of the press. Freedom, not license, is secured. The fair use, not the libelous abuse, is protected. J. Pomeroy. An Introduction to the Constitutional Law of the United States 152-153. 1868. Here and after Pomeroy. As the Constitution of the United States, and the constitutions of several of the states, in terms more or less comprehensive, declare the right of the people to keep and bear arms, it has been a subject of grave discussion, in some of the state courts, whether a statute prohibiting persons, when not on a journey or as travelers, from wearing or carrying concealed weapons, be constitutional. There has been a great difference of opinion on the question. 2. J. Kent, Commentaries on American Law, 340 N. 2. O. Holmes Adir, 12th Adir, 1873, here and after Kent. Some general knowledge of firearms is important to the public welfare, because it would be impossible, in case of war, to organize promptly an efficient force of volunteers unless the people had some familiarity with weapons of war. The Constitution secures the right of the people to keep and bear arms. No doubt, a citizen who keeps a gun or pistol under judicious precautions practices in safe places the use of it and in due time teaches his sons to do the same, exercises his individual right. No doubt, a person whose residence or duties involve peculiar peril may keep a pistol for prudent self-defense. b. Abbott, Judge and Jury, A Popular Explanation of the Leading Topics in the Law of the Land, 333, 1880, 
here and after Abbott, the right to bear arms has always been the distinctive privilege of free men. Aside from any necessity of self-protection to the person, it represents among all nations power coupled with the exercise of a certain jurisdiction. It was not necessary that the right to bear arms should be granted in the Constitution, for it had always existed, J. Ordrano, Constitutional Legislation in the United States, 241-242, 1891. E. We now ask whether any of our precedents forecloses the conclusions we have reached about the meaning of the Second Amendment. United States v. Cruikshank, 92 U. S. 542, in the course of vacating the convictions of members of a white mob for depriving blacks of their right to keep and bear arms, held that the Second Amendment does not by its own force apply to anyone other than the federal government. The opinion explained that the right is not a right granted by the Constitution, or in any manner dependent upon that instrument for its existence. The Second Amendment means no more than that it shall not be infringed by Congress. 92 U. S. at 553. States, we said, were free to restrict or protect the right under their police powers. The limited discussion of the Second Amendment in Cruikshank supports, if anything, the individual rights interpretation. There was no claim in Cruikshank that the victims had been deprived of their right to carry arms in a militia. Indeed, the governor had disbanded the local militia unit the year before the mob's attack, C.C. Lane, The Day Freedom Died, 62, 2008. We described the right protected by the Second Amendment as bearing arms for a lawful purpose, footnote 22, and said that the people must look for their protection against any violation by their fellow citizens of the rights it recognizes to the state's police power. 92 U. S. at 553. That discussion makes little sense if it is only a right to bear arms in a state militia. Footnote 23. Presser v. Illinois, 116U, S. 252, 1886, held that the right to keep and bear arms was not violated by a law that forbade bodies of men to associate together as military organizations or to drill or parade with arms in cities and towns unless authorized by law. Adrian's at 264-265. This does not refute the individual rights interpretation of the amendment. No one supporting that interpretation has contended that states may not ban such groups. Justice Stevens presses Presser into service to support his view that the right to bear arms is limited to service in the militia by joining Presser's brief discussion of the Second Amendment with a later portion of the opinion making the seemingly relevant to the Second Amendment point that the plaintiff was not a member of the state militia. Unfortunately for Justice Stevens' argument, that later portion deals with the 14th Amendment. It was the 14th Amendment to which the plaintiff's non-membership in the militia was relevant. Thus, Justice Stevens' statement that Presser suggested that nothing in the Constitution protected the use of arms outside the context of a militia, post, at 40, is simply wrong. Presser said nothing about the Second Amendment's meaning or scope beyond the fact that it does not prevent the prohibition of private paramilitary organizations. Justice Stevens places overwhelming reliance upon this court's decision in United States v. Miller, 307 U. S. Hosur 74, 9039. Hundreds of judges, we are told, have relied on the view of the amendment we endorsed there. Post it too, and as then if the textual and historical arguments on both sides of the issue were evenly balanced, Respect for the well-settled views of all of our predecessors on this court, and for the rule of law itself, would prevent most jurists from endorsing such a dramatic upheaval in the law, post at four. And what is, according to Justice Stevens, the holding of Miller that demands such obeisance? That the Second Amendment protects the right to keep and bear arms for certain military purposes, but that it does not curtail the legislature's power to regulate the non-military use and ownership of weapons. Post at 2. Nothing so clearly demonstrates the weakness of Justice Stevens's case. Miller did not hold that, and cannot possibly be read to have held that. The judgment in the case upheld against a Second Amendment challenge, two men's federal convictions for transporting an unregistered short-barreled shotgun in interstate commerce in violation of the National Firearms Act, 48 Stat, 1236. It is entirely clear that the court's basis for saying that the Second Amendment did not apply was not that the defendants were bearing arms, not for military purposes, but for non-military use, post, at two. Rather, it was that the type of weapon at issue was not eligible for Second Amendment protection. 
In the absence of any evidence tending to show that the possession or use of a short-barreled shotgun at this time has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, we cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear such an instrument. 307U. S at 178. Emphasis added. Certainly, the court continued. It is not within judicial notice that this weapon is any part of the ordinary military equipment or that its use could contribute to the common defense. EBID. Beyond that, the opinion provided no explanation of the content of the right. This holding is not only consistent with, but positively suggests, that the Second Amendment confers an individual right to keep and bear arms, though only arms that have some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia. Had the court believed that the Second Amendment protects only those serving in the militia, it would have been odd to examine the character of the weapon, rather than simply note that the two crooks were not militiamen. Justice Stevens can say again and again that Miller did not turn on the difference between muskets and sawed-off shotguns. It turned, rather, on the basic difference between the military and non-military use and possession of guns, post, at 4243. But the words of the opinion prove otherwise. The most Justice Stevens can plausibly claim for Miller is that it declined to decide the nature of the Second Amendment right, despite the Solicitor General's argument, made in the alternative, that the right was collective. See Brief for United States, O.T. Mi 1938, number 696, P.P. Quarsfank. Miller stands only for the proposition that the Second Amendment right, whatever its nature, extends only to certain types of weapons. It is particularly wrong-headed to read Miller for more than what it said, because the case did not even purport to be a thorough examination of the Second Amendment. Justice Stevens claims, post at 42, that the opinion reached its conclusion, after reviewing many of the same sources that are discussed at greater length by the court today. Not many, which was not entirely the court's fault. The respondent made no appearance in the case, neither filing a brief nor appearing at oral argument, the court heard from no one but the government. Reason enough, one would think, not to make that case the beginning and the end of this court's consideration of the Second Amendment. C. Fry, The Peculiar Story of United States v. Miller, 3N, ECUJL, and Liberty, 48, 65, 68, 2008. The government's brief spent two pages discussing English legal sources, concluding that at least the carrying of weapons without lawful occasion or excuse was always a crime, and that, because of the class-based restrictions and the prohibition on terrorizing people with dangerous or unusual weapons, the early English law did not guarantee an unrestricted right to bear arms. Brief for United States, OT, 1938, number 696 at 911. It then went on to rely primarily on the discussion of the English right to bear arms in Imet versus State, 20 War and 10 on 154, for the proposition that the only uses of arms protected by the Second Amendment are those that relate to the militia not self-defense. See Brief for United States, OT. 1938, number 696 at 1218. The final section of the brief recognized that some courts have said that the right to bear arms includes the right of the individual to have them for the protection of his person and property, and launched an alternative argument that weapons which are commonly used by criminals, such as sawed-off shotguns, are not protected. See at 1821. The government's Miller brief thus provided scant discussion of the history of the Second Amendment, and the court was presented with no counter-discussion. As for the text of the court's opinion itself, that discusses none of the history of the Second Amendment. It assumes from the prologue that the amendment was designed to preserve the militia, 307U, S, at 178, which we do not dispute, and then reviews some historical materials dealing with the nature of the militia, and in particular with the nature of the arms their members were expected to possess, ID, at 178, 182. Not a word, not a word about the history of the Second Amendment. This is the mighty rock upon which the dissent rests its case. Footnote 24. We may as well consider at this point, for we will have to consider eventually, what types of weapons Miller permits. Read in isolation, Miller's phrase, part of ordinary military equipment could mean that only those weapons useful in warfare are protected. That would be a startling reading of the opinion, since it would mean that the National Firearms Act's restrictions on machine guns, not challenged in Miller, might be unconstitutional, machine guns being useful in warfare in 1939. We think that Miller's ordinary military equipment language must be read in tandem with what comes after. 
Ordinarily, when called for militia service, able-bodied men were expected to appear bearing arms supplied by themselves and of the kind in common use at the time. 307. U. S. At 179, the traditional militia was formed from a pool of men bringing arms, in common use at the time, for lawful purposes like self-defense. In the colonial and revolutionary war era, small arms weapons used by militiamen and weapons used in defense of person and home were one and the same. State versus Kessler, 289 or 3 ma 59, 368, 614 p Sautin, 94, 98, 1980. Citing G. Neumann, Swords and Blades of the American Revolution, 615, 252, 254, 1973. Indeed, that is precisely the way in which the Second Amendment's operative clause furthers the purpose announced in its preface. We therefore read Miller to say only that the Second Amendment does not protect those weapons, not typically possessed by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes, such as short-barreled shotguns. That accords with the historical understanding of the scope of the right, see Part 3, Infra. Footnote 25. We conclude that nothing in our precedents forecloses our adoption of the original understanding of the Second Amendment. It should be unsurprising that such a significant matter has been for so long judicially unresolved. For most of our history, the Bill of Rights was not thought applicable to the states, and the federal government did not significantly regulate the possession of firearms by law-abiding citizens. Other provisions of the Bill of Rights have similarly remained unilluminated for lengthy periods. This court first held a law to violate the First Amendment's guarantee of freedom of speech in 1931. Almost 150 years after the amendment was ratified, C. Near v. Minnesota X. Rel. Olson, 283U, S. 697, 1931, and it was not until after World War II that we held a law invalid under the Establishment Clause, C. Illinois, X. R. E. L. McCollum Veers Board of Ed. of School Dist. Number 71, Champagne C. Dard, 3233U, S. Dunja Tres, now he's 48. 3. Even a question as basic as the scope of prescribable libel was not addressed by this court until 1964, nearly two centuries after the founding. See New York Times Code for Sullivan, 376 U. S. 254, 1964. It is demonstrably not true that, as Justice Stevens claims, post, at 41 to 42, for most of our history, the invalidity of Second Amendment-based objections to firearms regulations has been well settled and uncontroversial. For most of our history, the question did not present itself. Like most rights, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited. From Blackstone through the 19th century cases, commentators and courts routinely explained that the right was not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, and for whatever purpose. See, e.g., Sheldon, in 5 Bloom 346, Rawl 123, Pomeroy 152, 153, Abbott, 333. For example, the majority of the 19th century courts to consider the question held that prohibitions on carrying concealed weapons were lawful under the Second Amendment or state analogs. See e.g. State v. Chandler, 5 lay, Anne at 489-490, Nunn v. State, 1 Gay at 251, see generally 2 Kent, 340, N. 2. The American Students, Blackstone, 84, N. 11. G. Chase, Adine, 1884. Although we do not undertake an exhaustive historical analysis today of the full scope of the Second Amendment, nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. Footnote 26. We also recognize another important limitation on the right to keep and carry arms. Miller said, as we have explained, that the sorts of weapons protected were those in common use at the time. 307 U. S. at 179. We think that limitation is fairly supported by the historical tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons. See, set before Blackstone, 148, 149, 1769. 3 B. Wilson, Works of the Honorable James Wilson, 79, 1804. J. Dunlap, The New York Justice, 8, 1815. C. Humphreys, A Compendium of the Common Law in Force in Kentucky, 482, 1822. 1 W. Russell, A Treatise on Crimes and Indictable Misdemeanors, 271, 272, 1831. H. Stephen, Summary of the Criminal Law, 48, 1840. E. Lewis, An Abridgment of the Criminal Law of the United States, 64. 
1847, F. Wharton, A Treatise on the Criminal Law of the United States, 726, 1852. See also State v. Langford, 10N. C. 381, 383, 384, 1824. O'Neill v. State, 16LA, 65, 67, 1849. English v. State, 35, text 473, 476, 1871. State v. Lanier, 71N. C. It may be objected that if weapons that are most useful in military service, M16 rifles, and the like may be banned, then the Second Amendment right is completely detached from the prefatory clause. But, as we have said, the conception of the militia at the time of the Second Amendment's ratification was the body of all citizens capable of military service who would bring the sorts of lawful weapons that they possessed at home to militia duty. It may well be true today that a militia, to be as effective as militias in the 18th century, would require sophisticated arms that are highly unusual in society at large. Indeed, it may be true that no amount of small arms could be useful against modern-day bombers and tanks. But the fact that modern developments have limited the degree of fit between the prefatory clause and the protected right cannot change our interpretation of the right. If it we turn finally to the law at issue here. As we have said, the law totally bans handgun possession in the home. It also requires that any lawful firearm in the home be disassembled or bound by a trigger lock at all times, rendering it inoperable. As the quotations earlier in this opinion demonstrate, the inherent right of self-defense has been central to the Second Amendment right. The handgun ban amounts to a prohibition of an entire class of arms that is overwhelmingly chosen by American society for that lawful purpose. The prohibition extends, moreover, to the home, where the need for defense of self, family, and property is most acute. Under any of the standards of scrutiny that we have applied to enumerated constitutional rights, in banning from the home the most preferred firearm in the nation to keep and use for protection of one's home and family, 478F. 3D at 400 would fail constitutional muster. Few laws in the history of our nation have come close to the severe restriction of the district's handgun ban. And some of those few have been struck down. In Nunver's state, the Georgia Supreme Court struck down a prohibition on carrying pistols openly, even though it upheld a prohibition on carrying concealed weapons. See one gay a 251 in Andrews v. State, the Tennessee Supreme Court likewise held that a statute that forbade openly carrying a pistol, publicly or privately, without regard to time or place or circumstances, 50 tenors at 187 violated the state constitutional provision, which the court equated with the Second Amendment. That was so even though the statute did not Restrict the carrying of long guns. Ebedi. See also State v. Reed. Wort Alice 6 and 12, 6 15, 6 1 7, 1840. A statute which, under the pretense of regulating, amounts to a destruction of the right, or which requires arms to be so borne as to render them wholly useless for the purpose of defense, would be clearly unconstitutional. It is no answer to say, as petitioners do, that it is permissible to ban the possession of handguns so long as the possession of other firearms, i.e., long guns, is allowed. It is enough to note, as we have observed, that the American people have considered the handgun to be the quintessential self-defense weapon. There are many reasons that a citizen may prefer a handgun for home defense. It is easier to store in a location that is readily accessible in an emergency. It cannot easily be redirected or wrestled away by an attacker. It is easier to use for those without the upper body strength. To lift and aim a long gun, it can be pointed at a burglar with one hand while the other hand dials the police. Whatever. The reason, handguns are the most popular weapon chosen by Americans for self-defense in the home, and a complete prohibition of their use is invalid. We must also address the district's requirement, as applied to respondents' handgun, that firearms in the home be coyed, rendered and kept inoperable at all times. This makes it impossible for citizens to use them for the core lawful purpose of self-defense, and is hence unconstitutional. The district argues that we should interpret this element of the statute to contain an exception for self-defense. See Brief for Petitioners 5657. But we think that is precluded by the unequivocal text and by the presence of certain other enumerated exceptions. Except for law enforcement personnel, each registrant shall keep any firearm in his possession unloaded and disassembled or bound by a trigger, lock, or similar device unless such firearm is kept at his place of business, or while being used for lawful recreational purposes within the District of Columbia. 
DC Code, Paragraph 7, 2507, Year 2. The non existence of a self defense exception is also suggested by the DC Court of Appeals statement that the statute forbids residents to use firearms to stop intruders. See McIntosh v. Washington, 395A, Sudi 744, 755 756, 1978. And wait, apart from his challenge to the handgun ban and the car cure, trigger lock requirement respondent asked the district court to enjoin petitioners from enforcing the separate licensing requirement in such a manner as to forbid the carrying of a firearm within one's home or possessed land without a license. Apudert 59A The Court of Appeals did not invalidate the licensing requirement, but held only that the district may not prevent a handgun from being moved throughout one's house. 478 F3rd at 400. It then ordered the district court to enter summary judgment consistent with respondent's prayer for relief. Idi at 401 before. This court petitioners have stated that if the handgun ban is struck down and respondent registers a handgun, he could obtain a license, assuming he is not otherwise disqualified, by which they apparently mean if he is not a felon and is not insane. Brief for Petitioners 58. Respondent conceded at oral argument that he does not have a problem with licensing and that the district's law is permissible so long as it is not enforced in an arbitrary and capricious manner. Doctor of Oral Arg. 74 to 75. We therefore assume that Petitioner's issuance of a license will satisfy Respondent's prayer for relief and do not address the licensing requirement. Justice Breyer has devoted most of his separate dissent to the handgun ban. He says that, even assuming the Second Amendment is a personal guarantee of the right to bear arms, the district's prohibition is valid. He first tries to establish this by founding-era historical precedent, pointing to various restrictive laws in the colonial period. These demonstrate, in his view, that the district's law imposes a burden upon gun owners that seems proportionately no greater than restrictions in existence at the time the Second Amendment was adopted. Post, at 682. Of the laws he cites, only one offers even marginal support for his assertion. A 1783 Massachusetts law forbade the residents of Boston to take into or receive into any dwelling house, stable, barn, outhouse, warehouse, store, shop, or other building loaded firearms and permitted the seizure of any loaded firearms that shall be found there. Act of Mar 1, 1783, Chateau 3, 1783, Mass, Acts P, 218. That statute's text and its prologue, which makes clear that the purpose of the prohibition was to eliminate the danger to firefighters posed by the depositing of loaded arms in buildings, give reason to doubt that colonial Boston authorities would have enforced that general prohibition against someone who temporarily loaded a firearm to confront an intruder, despite the law's application in that case. In any case, we would not stake our interpretation of the Second Amendment upon a single law in effect in a single city that contradicts the overwhelming weight of other evidence regarding the right to keep and bear arms for defense of the home. The other laws Justice Breyer cites are gunpowder storage laws that he concedes did not clearly prohibit loaded weapons, but required only that excess gunpowder be kept in a special container or on the top floor of the home. Post at 686. Nothing about those fire safety laws undermines our analysis. They do not remotely burden the right of self-defense as much as an absolute ban on handguns. Nor, correspondingly, does our analysis suggest the invalidity of laws regulating the storage of firearms to prevent accidents. Justice Breyer points to other founding-era laws that he says restricted the firing of guns within the city limits, to at least some degree, in Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. Post at 683, citing Churchill gun regulation, the police power, and the right to keep arms in early America, 25 Law and Hist, Rev. 139, 162, 2007. Those laws provide no support for the severe restriction in the present case. The New York law levied a fine of 20 shillings on anyone who fired a gun in certain places, including houses, on New Year's Eve and the first two days of January, and was aimed at preventing the great damages frequently done on those days by persons going house to house with guns and other firearms and being often intoxicated with liquor. Chew 1501, 5 Colonial Laws of New York, 244-246, 1894. It 
is inconceivable that this law would have been enforced against a person exercising his right to self-defense on new. Years day against such drunken hooligans. The Pennsylvania law to which Justice Breyer refers levied a fine of five shillings on one who fired a gun or set off fireworks in Philadelphia without first obtaining a license from the governor. See Act of Aug. 26, 1721. Kosh CCX LV. Paraf Karfer in 3 Stat. At large of Pia. 253, 254. 1896. Given Justice Wilson's explanation that the right to self-defense with arms was protected by the Pennsylvania Constitution, it is unlikely that this law, which in any event amounted to at most a licensing regime, would have been enforced against a person who used firearms for self-defense. Justice Breyer cites a Rhode Island law that simply levied a five-shilling fine on those who fired guns in streets and taverns, a law obviously inapplicable to this case. See an act for preventing mischief being done in the town of Newport or in any other town in this government. 1731 Rhode Island's in laws P242 Fiordo. And finally, Justice Breyer points to a massive similar to the Pennsylvania law prohibiting discharging any gun or pistol charged with shot or ball in the town of Boston. Act E. Of May 28, 1746, Curex, Acts and Laws of Mass, Bay P208. It is again implausible that this would have been enforced against a citizen acting in self defense, particularly given its preambulatory reference to the indiscreet firing of guns. EBID preamble, emphasis added. A broader point about the laws that Justice Breyer cites, all of them punish the discharge or loading of guns, with a small fine and forfeiture of the weapon, or in a few, cases a very brief stay in the local jail, not with significant criminal penalties. They are akin to modern penalties for minor public safety infractions like speeding or jaywalking. And although such public safety laws may not contain exceptions for self-defense, it is inconceivable that the threat of a jaywalking ticket would deter someone from disregarding a do-not-walk sign in order to flee an attacker, or that the government would enforce those laws under such circumstances. Likewise, we do not think that a law imposing a five-shilling fine and forfeiture of the gun would have prevented a person in the founding era from using a gun to protect himself or his family from violence, or that if he did, so the law would be enforced against him. The district law, by contrast, far from imposing a minor fine, threatens citizens with a year in prison, five years for a second violation, for even obtaining a gun in the first place. CDC Code. Paragraph 7207 and 06. Justice Breyer moves on to make a broad jurisprudential point. He criticizes us for declining to establish a level of scrutiny for evaluating Second Amendment restrictions. He proposes, explicitly at least, none of the traditionally expressed levels strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, rational basis, but rather a judge-empowering interest-balancing inquiry that asks whether the statute burdens a protected interest in a way or to an extent that is out of proportion to the statute's salutary effects upon other important governmental interests. Post at 689-690. After an exhaustive discussion of the arguments for and against gun control, Justice Breyer arrives at his interest-balanced answer. Because handgun violence is a problem, because the law is limited to an urban area, and because there were somewhat similar restrictions in the founding period, a false proposition that we have already discussed, the interest balancing inquiry results in the constitutionality of the handgun ban. QED, we know of no other enumerated constitutional right whose core protection has been subjected to a freestanding interest balancing approach. The very enumeration of the right takes out of the hands of government, even the third branch of government, the power to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether the right is really worth insisting upon. A constitutional guarantee subject to future judges? Assessments of its usefulness is no constitutional guarantee at all. Constitutional rights are enshrined with the scope they were understood to have when the people adopted them, whether or not future legislatures or, yes, even future. Judges think that scope too broad. We would not apply an interest-balancing approach to the prohibition of a peaceful neo-Nazi march through Skokie. See National Socialist, Party of America vs. Skokie, 432 U.S. 43, 1977, per curiam. The First Amendment contains the freedom of speech guarantee that the people ratified, which included exceptions for obscenity, libel and disclosure of state secrets, but not for the expression of extremely unpopular and wrong-headed 
views. The Second Amendment is no different. Like the first, it is the very product of an interest balancing by the people, which Justice Breyer would now conduct for them anew. And whatever else it leaves to future evaluation, it surely elevates above all other interests the right of law-abiding responsible citizens to use arms in defense of hearth and home. Justice Breyer chides us for leaving so many applications of the right to keep and bear arms in doubt, and for not providing extensive historical justification for those regulations of the right that we describe as permissible. See, post, at 720-721. But since this case represents this court's first in-depth examination of the Second Amendment, one should not expect it to clarify the entire field any more than Reynolds v. United States, 98 U.S. 145, 1879, our first in-depth free exercise clause case, left that area in a state of utter certainty, and there will be time enough to expound upon the historical justifications for the exceptions we have, mentioned if and when those exceptions come before us. In sum, we hold that the district's ban on handgun possession in the home violates the Second Amendment, as does its prohibition against rendering any lawful firearm in the home operable for the purpose of immediate self-defense. Assuming that Heller is not disqualified from the exercise of Second Amendment rights, the district must permit him to register his handgun and must issue him a license to carry it in the home. We are aware of the problem of handgun violence in this country, and we take seriously the concerns raised by the many Amici who believe that prohibition of handgun ownership is a solution. The Constitution leaves the District of Columbia a variety of tools for combating that problem, including some measures regulating handguns, see Supra at 626-627 and number 26, but the enshrinement of constitutional Rights necessarily take certain policy choices off the table. These include the absolute prohibition of handguns held and used for self-defense in the home. Undoubtedly, some think that the Second Amendment is outmoded in a society where our standing army is the pride of our nation, where well-trained police forces provide personal security, and where gun violence is a serious problem. That is perhaps debatable, but what is not debatable is that it is not the role of this court to pronounce the Second Amendment extinct. We affirm the judgment of the Court of Appeals. It is so ordered. Justice Stevens, with whom Justice Souter, Justice Ginsburg, and Justice Breyer join dissenting. The question presented by this case is not whether the Second Amendment protects a collective right or an individual right. Surely it protects a right that can be enforced by individuals. But a conclusion that the Second Amendment protects an individual right does not tell us anything about the scope of that right. Guns are used to hunt for self-defense, to commit crimes, for sporting activities, and to perform military duties. The Second Amendment plainly does not protect the right to use a gun to rob a bank. It is equally clear that it does encompass the right to use weapons for certain military purposes, whether it also protects the right to possess and use guns for non-military purposes like hunting and personal self. Defense is the question presented by this case. The text of the amendment its history and our decision in United States v. Miller 307 U.S. 174, 1939, provide a clear answer to that question. The Second Amendment was adopted to protect the right of the people of each of the several states to maintain a well-regulated militia. It was a response to concerns raised during the ratification of the Constitution that the power of Congress to disarm the state militias and create a national Standing army posed an intolerable threat to the sovereignty of the several states. Neither the text of the amendment nor the arguments advanced by its proponents evidence the slightest interest in limiting any legislature's authority to regulate private civilian uses of firearms. Specifically there is no indication that the framers of the amendment intended to enshrine the common law right of self-defense in the Constitution. In 1934, Congress enacted the National Firearms Act, the first major federal firearms law, sustaining an indictment. Under the act, this court held that in the absence of any evidence tending to show that possession or use of a shotgun, having a barrel of less than 18 inches in length at this time has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, we cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear. Such an instrument, Miller 307 U.S. at 178, the view of the amendment we took in Miller that it protects the right to keep and bear arms for certain military purposes, but that it does not curtail the legislature's power to regulate the non-military use and ownership of weapons 
is both the most natural reading of the amendment's text and the interpretation most faithful to the history of its adoption. Since our decision in Miller, hundreds of judges have relied on the view of the amendment we endorsed there. Two, we ourselves affirmed it in 1980. See Lewis v. United States, 445 U.S. 55, 65, 66, and 8, 1980. No new evidence has surfaced since 1980 supporting the view that the amendment was intended to curtail the power of Congress to regulate civilian use or misuse of weapons. Indeed, a review of the drafting history of the amendment demonstrates that its framers rejected proposals that would have broadened its coverage to include such uses. The opinion the court announces today fails to identify any new evidence supporting the view that the amendment was intended to limit the power of Congress to regulate civilian uses of weapons. Unable to point to any such evidence, the court stakes its holding on a strained and unpersuasive reading of the amendment's text. Significantly different provisions in the 1689 English Bill of Rights and in various 19th century state constitutions. Post-enactment commentary that was available to the court when it decided Miller. And ultimately, a feeble attempt to distinguish Miller that places more emphasis on the court's decisional process than on the reasoning and the opinion itself, even if the textual and historical arguments on both sides of the issue were evenly balanced. Respect for the well-settled views of all of our predecessors on this court and for the rule of law itself, see Mitchell v. W. T. Grant Co., 416, U.S. 600, 636, 1974, Stewart, J. Dissenting, would prevent most jurists from endorsing such a dramatic upheaval in the Law 4. As Justice Cardozo observed years ago, the labor of judges would be increased almost to the breaking point if every past decision could be reopened in every case, and one could not lay one's own course of bricks on the secure foundation of the courses laid by others who had gone before him. The Nature of the Judicial Process 149, 1921. In this dissent, I shall first explain why our decision in Miller was faithful to the text of the Second Amendment and the purposes revealed in its drafting history. I shall then comment on the post-ratification history of the amendment, which makes abundantly clear that the amendment should not be interpreted as limiting the authority of Congress to regulate the use or possession of firearms for purely civilian purposes. I, the text of the Second Amendment is brief. It provides a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh -huh. Three portions of that text merit special focus. The introductory language defining the amendment's purpose, the class of persons encompassed within its reach, and the unitary nature of the right that it protects. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The preamble to the Second Amendment makes three important points. It identifies the preservation of the militia as the amendment's purpose. It explains that the militia is necessary to the security of a free state, and it recognizes that the militia must be well regulated. In all three respects, it is comparable to provisions in several state declarations of rights that were adopted roughly contemporaneously with the Declaration of Independence. Those state provisions highlight the importance members of the founding generation attached to the maintenance of state militias. They also underscore the profound fear shared by many in that era of the dangers posed by standing armies. While the need for state militias has not been a matter of significant public interest for almost two centuries, that fact should not obscure the contemporary concerns that animated the framers, the parallels between the Second Amendment and these state declarations, and the Second Amendment's omission of any statement of purpose related to the right to use firearms for hunting or personal self-defense is especially striking in light of the fact that the declarations of rights of Pennsylvania and Vermont did expressly protect such civilian uses at the time. Article the third of Pennsylvania's 1776 Declaration of Rights announced that the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state. Fur Schwartz 266, emphasis added. Paragraph 43 of the Declaration ensured that the Inhabitants of this state shall have the liberty to fowl and hunt in seasonable times on the lands they hold and on all other lands therein not enclosed. Thrums at 274 and Article Sife of the 1777 Vermont Declaration of Rights Guaranteed and that the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state. Yiddish Brown at 324. Emphasis added. 
The contrast between those two declarations and the second amendment reinforces the clear statement of purpose announced in the amendment's preamble. It confirms that the framers' single-minded focus in crafting the constitutional guarantee to keep and bear arms was on military uses of firearms, which they viewed in the context of service in state militias. The preamble thus both sets forth the object of the amendment and informs the meaning of the remainder of its text. Such text should not be treated as mere surplusage, for it cannot be presumed that any clause in the Constitution is intended to be without effect. Marbury v. Madison, 1 Cranch 1-37, 174, e 03s. The court today tries to denigrate the importance of this clause of the amendment by beginning its analysis with the amendment's operative provision and returning to the preamble merely to ensure that our reading of the operative clause is consistent with the announced purpose. Ante, at 578. That is not how this court ordinarily reads such texts, and it is not how the preamble would have been viewed at the time the amendment was adopted. While the court makes the novel suggestion that it need only find some logical connection between the preamble and the operative provision, it does acknowledge that a prefatory clause may resolve an ambiguity in the text. Ante, at 577.7. Without identifying any language in the text that even mentions civilian uses of firearms, the court proceeds to find its preferred reading in what is at best an ambiguous text, and then concludes that its reading is not foreclosed by the preamble. Perhaps the court's approach to the text is acceptable advocacy, but it is surely an unusual approach for judges to follow. The right of the people. The centerpiece of the court's textual argument is its insistence that the words the people as used in the second amendment must have the same meaning and protect the same class of individuals as when they are used in the first and fourth amendments. According to the court in all three provisions as well as the Constitution's preamble, paragraph 2 of Article 1 and the Tenth Amendment, the term unambiguously refers to all members of the political community, not an unspecified subset, ante at 580. But the court itself reads the Second Amendment to protect a subset significantly narrower than the class of persons protected by the First and Fourth Amendments when it finally drills down. On the substantive meaning of the Second Amendment, the court limits the protected class to law-abiding, responsible citizens, ante at 635 but the class of persons protected by the First and Fourth Amendments is not so limited, for even felons, and presumably irresponsible citizens as well, may invoke the protections of those constitutional provisions. The court offers no way to harmonize its conflicting pronouncements. The court also overlooks the significance of the way the framers use the phrase the people in these constitutional provisions. In the First Amendment, no words define the class of individuals entitled to speak, to publish, or to worship. In that amendment, it is only the right peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances that is described as a right of the people. These rights contemplate collective action. While the right peaceably to assemble protects the individual rights of those persons participating in the assembly, its concern is with action engaged in by members of a group rather than any single individual. Likewise, although the act of petitioning the government is a right that can be exercised by individuals, it is primarily collective in nature. For if they are to be effective, petitions must involve groups of individuals acting in concert. Similarly, the words the people in the Second Amendment refer back to the object announced in the amendment's preamble. They remind us that it is the collective action of individuals having a duty to serve in the militia that the text directly protects, and perhaps more importantly, that the ultimate purpose of the amendment was to protect the state's share of the divided sovereignty created by the Constitution. As used in the Fourth Amendment, the people describes the class of persons protected from unreasonable searches and seizures by government officials. It is true that the Fourth Amendment describes a right that need not be exercised in any collective sense, but that observation does not settle the meaning of the phrase, the people, when used in the Second Amendment, for as we have seen, the phrase means something quite different in the petition and assembly clauses of the First Amendment, although the abstract definition of the phrase the people could carry the same. Meaning in the Second Amendment as in the Fourth Amendment, the preamble of the Second Amendment suggests that the uses of the phrase in the First and Second Amendments are the same in referring to a collective activity. By way of contrast, 
the Fourth Amendment describes a right against governmental interference rather than an affirmative right to engage in protected conduct and so refers to a right to protect a purely individual interest. As used in the Second Amendment, the words the people do not enlarge the right to keep and bear arms to encompass use or ownership of weapons outside the context of service in a well-regulated militia. And to keep and bear arms, although the court's discussion of these words treats them as two phrases, as if they read to keep and to bear, they describe a unitary right to possess arms if needed for military purposes and to use them in conjunction with military activities. As a threshold matter, it is worth pausing to note an oddity in the court's interpretation of to keep and bear arms. Unlike the Court of Appeals, the court does not read that phrase to create a right to possess arms for lawful private purposes. Parker v. District of Columbia, 478 F 3D 370, 382, Godsey 2007. Instead, the court limits the amendment's protection to the right to possess and carry weapons in case of confrontation. Anti at 592. No party or amicus urged this interpretation. The court appears to have fashioned it out of whole cloth. But although this novel limitation lacks support in the text of the amendment, the amendment's text does justify a different limitation. The right to keep and bear arms protects only a right to possess and use firearms in connection with service in a state-organized militia. The term bear arms is a familiar idiom. When used unadorned by any additional words, its meaning is to serve. As a soldier, do military service fight. Warren Oxford English. Dictionary 634, 2 Didor 1989. It is derived from the Latin arma ferre, which translated literally means to bear. Ferre wore equipment arma. Brief for professors of linguistics in English as Amici Curiae 19. One 18th century dictionary defined arms as weapons of offense or Armor of Defense, Warnes Johnson, A Dictionary of the English Language, 1755, and another contemporaneous source, explained that, by arms we understand those instruments, of offense generally made use of in war, such as firearms, swords, etc. By weapons we more particularly mean instruments of other kinds, exclusive of firearms, made use, of as offensive, on special occasions. One J. Trusler, the distinction between words esteemed synonymous in the English language 37, 3 to 1794. Had the framers wished to expand the meaning of the phrase bear arms to encompass civilian possession and use, they could have done so by the addition of phrases such as for the defense of themselves, as was done in the Pennsylvania and Vermont declarations of rights. The unmodified use of bear arms, by contrast, refers most naturally to a military purpose, as evidenced by its use in literally dozens of contemporary texts. The absence of any reference to civilian uses of weapons tailors the text of the amendment to the purpose identified in its preamble. But when discussing these words, the court simply ignores the preamble. The court argues that a qualifying phrase that contradicts the word or phrase it modifies is unknown this side of the looking glass, ante at 589. But this fundamentally fails to grasp the point. The standalone phrase bear, arms most naturally conveys a military meaning unless the addition of a qualifying phrase signals that a different meaning is intended. When, as in this case, there is no such qualifier, the most natural meaning is the military one. And in the absence of any qualifier, it is all the more appropriate to look to the preamble to confirm the natural meaning of the text 11. The court's objection is particularly puzzling in light of its own contention that the addition of the modifier against changes the meaning of bear arms. Compare ante at 584, defining bear arms to mean carrying a e e weapon for a particular purpose confrontation, with ante. At 586, the phrase bear arms also had at the time of the founding an idiomatic meaning that was significantly different from its natural meaning, to serve as a soldier, do military service, fight or to wage war but it unequivocally bore that idiomatic meaning only when followed by the preposition against, emphasis deleted, citations and some internal quotation marks omitted. The amendment's use of the term keep in no way contradicts the military meaning conveyed by the phrase bear, arms and the amendment's preamble. To the contrary, a number of state militia laws in effect at the time of the Second Amendment's drafting used the term keep to describe the requirement that militia members store their arms at their homes, 
ready to be used for service when necessary. The Virginia military law, for example, ordered that every one of the said officers, non-commissioned officers and privates, shall constantly keep the aforesaid arms, accoutrements, and ammunition, ready to be produced whenever, called for by his commanding officer. Act for Regulating and Disciplining the Militia, 1785. Verit Acts Chiachi 1, Parava 3, Ford Sur 2, Emphasis Added. The keep and bear arms thus perfectly describes the responsibilities of a framing era militia. Member. This reading is confirmed by the fact that the clause protects only one right, rather than two. It does not describe a right to keep arms and a separate right to bear arms. Rather, the single right that it does describe is both a duty and a right to have arms available and ready for military service and to use them for military purposes when necessary. A different language surely would have been used to protect non-military use and possession of weapons from regulation if such an intent had played any role in the drafting of the amendment. When each word in the text is given full effect, the amendment is most naturally read to secure to the people a right to use and possess arms in conjunction with service in a well-regulated militia, so far as appears no more than that was contemplated by its drafters or is encompassed within its terms. Even if the meaning of the text were genuinely susceptible to more than one interpretation, the burden would remain on those advocating a departure from the purpose identified in the preamble and from settled law to come forward with persuasive new arguments or evidence. The textual analysis offered by respondent and embraced by the court falls far short of sustaining that heavy burden. And the court's emphatic reliance on the claim that the Second Amendment codified a pre-existing right, anti, at 592, is of course beside the point because the right to keep and bear arms for service in a state militia was also a pre-existing right. Indeed, not a word in the constitutional text even arguably supports the court's overwrought and novel description of the Second Amendment as elevating above all other interests the right of law-abiding responsible citizens to use arms in defense of hearth and home, ante, at 635. 2. The proper allocation of military power in the new nation was an issue of central concern for the framers. The compromises they ultimately reached, reflected in Article I's Militia Clauses and the Second Amendment, represent quintessential examples of the framers splitting the atom of sovereignty. 15. Two themes relevant to our current interpretive task ran through the debates on the original Constitution. On the one hand, there was a widespread fear that a national standing army posed an intolerable threat to individual liberty and to the sovereignty of the separate states. Per peach verse. Department of Defense, 496 U.S. 334, 340, 1990. Governor Edmund Randolph, reporting on the Constitutional Convention to the Virginia Ratification Convention, explained, With respect to a standing army, I believe there was not a member in the Federal Convention who did not feel indignation at such an institution. 3J Elliott, Debates in the Several State Conventions on the Adoption of the Federal Constitution 401, 2 to Dewar, 1863, hereinafter Elliott. On the other hand, the framers recognized the dangers inherent in relying on inadequately trained militia members as the primary means of providing for the common defense, Perpish 496, U.S. at 340. During the Revolutionary War, his force, though armed, was largely untrained, and its deficiencies were the subject of bitter complaint. Wiener, the Militia, Clause of the Constitution, 54 Harvard Morell, Reverend 181, 182, 1940. In order to respond to those twin concerns, a compromise was reached. Congress would be authorized to raise and support a National Army 18 and Navy, and also to organize, arm, discipline, and provide for the calling forth of the militia. U.S. Const. Art E. Paragraph 8, Citizen 1216. The President, at the same time, was empowered as the Commander-in-Chief of a, the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states, when called into the actual service of the United States. Art and Descent, Paragraph 2. But with respect to the militia, a significant reservation was made to the states. Although Congress would have the power to call forth and organize, arm, and discipline the militia, as well as to govern such part of them as may be employed in the service of the Yao. United States, the states respectively would retain the 
right to appoint the officers, and to train the militia in accordance with the discipline prescribed by Congress. Artem Rai, Parafoi tu Seward Seis Bainchi, but the original Constitution's retention of the militia, and its creation of divided authority over that body, did not prove sufficient to allay fears about the dangers posed by a standing army. For it was perceived by some that Article I contained a significant gap. While it empowered Congress to organize, arm, and discipline the militia, it did not prevent Congress from providing for the militia's disarmament. As George Mason argued during the debates in Virginia on the ratification of the original Constitution, the militia may be here destroyed by that method, which has been practiced in other parts of the world before, that is, by rendering them useless, by disarming them. Under various pretenses, Congress may neglect to provide for arming and disciplining the militia, and the state governments cannot do it, for Congress has the exclusive right to arm them. 3 Elliot 379. This sentiment was echoed at a number of state ratification conventions. Indeed, it was one of the primary objections to the original Constitution voiced by its opponents. The Anti-Federalists were ultimately unsuccessful in persuading state ratification conventions to condition their approval of the Constitution upon the eventual inclusion of any particular amendment. But a number of states did propose to the first Federal Congress amendments reflecting a desire to ensure that the institution of the militia would remain protected under the new government. The proposed amendments sent by the states of Virginia, North Carolina, and New York focused on the importance of preserving the state, militias, and reiterated the dangers posed by standing armies. New Hampshire sent a proposal that differed significantly from the others. While also invoking the dangers of a standing army, it suggested that the Constitution should more broadly protect the use and possession of weapons, without tying such a guarantee expressly to the maintenance of the militia. The states of Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts sent no relevant proposed amendments to Congress, but in each of those states a minority of the delegates advocated related amendments, while the Maryland minority proposals were exclusively concerned with standing. Armies and conscientious objectors, the unsuccessful proposals in both Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, would have protected a more broadly worded right, less clearly tied to service in a state militia. Faced with all of these options, it is telling that James Madison chose to craft the Second Amendment as he did. The relevant proposals sent by the Virginia Ratifying Convention read as follows. Seventeenth, that the people have a right to keep and bear arms, that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state, that standing armies in time of peace are dangerous to liberty and therefore ought to be avoided as far as the circumstances and protection of the community will admit, and that in all cases, the military should be under strict subordination to and be governed by the civil power. Eudetrius, at 659. Nineteenth, that any person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms ought to be exempted upon payment of an equivalent to employ another to bear arms in his stead. Ibid, North Carolina adopted Virginia's proposals and sent them to Congress as its own, although it did not actually ratify the original Constitution until Congress had sent the proposed Bill of Rights to the States for Ratification, 2 Schwartz 932, Sansri 3, see the Complete Bill of Rights, Sa 2 183, N. Kogan et Rouse, 997, hereinafter Kogan. New York produced a proposal with nearly identical language. It read that the people have a right to keep and bear arms, that a well-regulated militia, including the body of the People capable of bearing arms is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state. That standing armies, in time of peace, are dangerous to liberty, and ought not to be kept up, except in cases of necessity, and that at all times the military should be kept under strict subordination to the civil power. 2. Schwartz 9 and 12. Notably, each of these proposals used the phrase keep and bear arms, which was eventually adopted by Madison and each proposal embedded the phrase within a group of principles that are distinctly military in meaning. By contrast, New Hampshire's proposal, although it followed another proposed amendment that echoed the familiar concern about standing armies, described the protection involved in more clearly personal terms. Its proposal read, Twelfth, Congress shall never disarm any citizen unless such as are or have been in actual rebellion. Id, at 758-761. 
The proposals considered in the other three states, although ultimately rejected by their respective ratification conventions, are also relevant to our historical inquiry. First, the Maryland proposal, endorsed by a minority of the delegates and later circulated in pamphlet form read, four, that no standing army shall be kept up in time of peace, unless with the consent of two-thirds of the members present of each branch of Congress. O, oh, ten, that no person conscientiously scrupulous of bearing arms in any case shall be compelled personally to serve as a soldier. It will learn at 729, 735. The rejected Pennsylvania proposal, which was later incorporated into a critique of the Constitution titled The Address and Reasons of Dissent of the Minority of the Convention of the State of Pennsylvania to Their Constituents, 1787, signed by a minority of the state's delegates, those who had voted against ratification of the Constitution, I.D. Wyos, at 628-662 read, 7. That the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and their own state, or the United States, or for the purpose of killing game, and no law, shall be passed for disarming the people or any of them, unless for crimes committed, or real danger of public, injury from individuals, and as standing armies in the time of peace are dangerous to liberty, they ought not to be kept up, and that the military shall be kept under strict subordination to and be governed by the civil powers. Id at 665. Finally, after the delegates at the Massachusetts Ratification Convention had compiled a list of proposed amendments and alterations, a motion was made to add to the list the following language, that the said Constitution be never construed to authorize Congress to prevent the people of the United States, who are peaceable citizens from keeping their own arms. Kogan 181. This motion, however, failed to achieve the necessary support, and the proposal was excluded from the list of amendments the state sent to Congress. 2. Schwartz, 674, 675. Madison, charged with the task of assembling the proposals for amendments sent by the ratifying states, was the principal draftsman of the Second Amendment. He had, before him, or at the very least would have been aware of, all of these proposed formulations. In addition, Madison had been a member some years earlier of the committee tasked with drafting the Virginia Declaration of Rights. That committee considered a proposal by Thomas Jefferson that would have included within the Virginia Declaration the following language. No freeman shall ever be debarred the use of arms within his own lands or tenements. One Papers of Thomas Jefferson 363 J. Boyd, Edmund, 1950. But the committee rejected that language, adopting instead the provision, drafted by George Mason, 24, with all of these sources upon which to draw, it is strikingly significant that Madison's first draft omitted any mention of non-military use or possession of weapons. Rather, his original draft repeated the essence of the two proposed amendments sent by Virginia, combining the substance of the two provisions succinctly into one which read, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, a well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country. But no person religiously, scrupulous of bearing arms, shall be compelled to render military service in person. Kogan 169. Madison's decision to model the Second Amendment on the I, distinctly military Virginia proposal is therefore revealing, since it is clear that he considered and rejected formulations that would have unambiguously protected civilian uses of firearms. When Madison prepared his first draft and when that draft was debated and modified, it is reasonable to assume that all participants in the drafting process were fully aware of the other formulations that would have protected civilian use and possession of weapons and that their choice to craft the amendment as they did represented a rejection of those alternative formulations. Madison's initial inclusion of an exemption for conscientious objectors sheds revelatory light on the purpose of the amendment. It confirms an intent to describe a duty, as well as a right, and it unequivocally identifies the military character of both. The objections voiced to the conscientious objector clause only confirm the central meaning of the text. Although records of the debate in the Senate, which is where the conscientious objector clause was removed, do not survive, the arguments raised in the House illuminate the perceived problems with the clause. Specifically, there was concern that Congress can declare who are those religiously scrupulous and prevent them from bearing arms. 25. The ultimate removal of the clause, therefore, only serves to confirm the purpose of the amendment to protect against congressional disarmament, by whatever means, 
of the state's militias. The court also contends that because Quakers opposed the use of arms not just for militia service, but for any violent purpose whatsoever. Ante at 590, the inclusion of a conscientious objector clause in the original draft of the amendment does not support the conclusion that the phrase bear arms was military in meaning, but that claim cannot be squared with the record. In the proposal cited, Supra, at 656, both Virginia and North Carolina included the following language, that any person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms ought to be exempted upon payment of an equivalent to employ another to bear arms in his stead, emphasis added. There is no plausible argument that the use of bear arms in those provisions was not unequivocally and exclusively military. The state simply does not compel its citizens to carry arms for the purpose of private confrontation, ante at 584, or for self-defense. The history of the adoption of the amendment thus describes an overriding concern about the potential threat to state sovereignty that a federal standing army would pose, and a desire to protect the state's militias as the means by which to guard against that danger. But state militias could not effectively check the prospect of a federal standing army, so long as Congress retained the power to disarm them, and so a guarantee against such disarmament was needed. We explained in Miller, with obvious purpose to assure the I continuation and render possible the effectiveness of such forces, the declaration and guarantee of the Second Amendment were made. It must be interpreted and applied with that end in view. 307 U.S. at 178, the evidence plainly refutes the claim that the amendment was motivated by the framers' fears that Congress might act to regulate any civilian uses of weapons. And even if the historical record were genuinely ambiguous, the burden would remain on the parties advocating a change in the law to introduce facts or arguments newly ascertained. Vasquez, 474 U.S. at 266, the court is unable to identify any such facts or arguments. 3. Although it gives short shrift to the drafting history of the Second Amendment, the court dwells at length on four. Other sources, the 17th century English Bill of Rights, Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England, Post-Enactment Commentary on the Second Amendment, and Post-Civil, War Legislative History. All of these sources shed only indirect light on the question before us, and in any event offer little support for the court's conclusion. The court's reliance on Article 7 of the 1689 English. Bill of Rights, which, like most of the evidence offered by the court today, was considered in Miller 30 as misguided, both because Article 7 was enacted in response to different concerns from those that motivated the framers of the Second Amendment, and because the guarantees of the two provisions were by no means coextensive. Moreover, the English text contained no preamble or other provision identifying a narrow, militia-related purpose. The English Bill of Rights responded to abuses by the Stuart monarchs. Among the grievances set forth in the Bill of Rights was that the king had violated the law by causing several good subjects being Protestants to be disarmed at the same time when papists were both armed and employed, contrary to law. Elsewhere, the Declaration of Rights, was 1629, Aperfrion, p. 225, 1921. Article 7 of the Bill of Rights was a response to that selective disarmament. It guaranteed that the subjects which are Protestants may have arms for their defense, suitable to their condition and as allowed, by law. Idi key at 297. This grant did not establish a general right of all persons, or even of all Protestants, to possess weapons. Rather, the right was qualified in two distinct ways. First, it was restricted to those of adequate social and economic status, suitable to their condition. Second, it was only available subject to regulation by Parliament as allowed by law. The court may well be correct that the English Bill of Rights protected the right of some English subjects to use, some arms for personal self-defense, free from restrictions by the Crown, but not Parliament. But that right adopted in a different historical and political context and framed in markedly different language tells us little about the meaning of the Second Amendment. Blackstone's Commentaries The court's reliance on Blackstone's commentaries on the Laws of England is unpersuasive for the same reason as its reliance on the English Bill of Rights. Blackstone's invocation of the natural right of resistance and self-preservation, ante at 594, and those the right of having and using arms for self-preservation and defense, Bidowert referred specifically to Article 7 in the English Bill of 
writes, The excerpt from Blackstone offered by the court, therefore, is like Article 7 itself, of limited use in interpreting the very differently worded and differently historically situated Second Amendment. What is important about Blackstone is the instruction he provided on reading the sort of text before us today. Blackstone described an interpretive approach that gave far more weight to preambles than the court allows, counseling, that are the fairest and most rational method to interpret the will of the legislator is by exploring his intentions at the time when the law was made, by signs the most natural and probable. Blackstone explained, If words happen to be still, dubious, we may establish their meaning from the context, with which it may be of singular use to compare a word or a sentence, whenever they are ambiguous, equivocal, or intricate. Thus the prume or preamble is often called in to help the construction of an act of parliament. Whereas commentaries on the laws of England, 5960, 1765, in light of the court's invocation of Blackstone as the preeminent authority on English law for the founding generation, ante, at 593-594, quoting Alden Maine, 527 U.S. 706, 7 of 15, 1999, its disregard for his guidance on matters of interpretation is striking. Post-enactment commentary, the court also excerpts, without any real analysis, commentary by a number of additional scholars, some near in time to the framing and others post-dating it by close to a century. Those scholars are for the most part of limited relevance in construing the guarantee of the Second Amendment. Their views are not altogether clear. They tended to collapse the Second Amendment with Article 7 of the English Bill of Rights, and they appear to have been unfamiliar with the drafting history of the Second Amendment. The most significant of these commentators was Joseph. Story, contrary to the Court's assertions, however, Story, actually supports the view that the amendment was designed to protect the right of each of the states to maintain a well-regulated militia. When Story used the term palladium in discussions of the Second Amendment, he merely echoed the concerns that animated the framers of the amendment and led to its adoption. An excerpt from his... 1833, Commentaries on the Constitution of the United, states the same passage cited by the court in Miller 34, merits reproducing at some length. The importance of the Second Amendment will scarcely be doubted by any persons who have duly reflected upon the subject. The militia is the natural defense of a free country against sudden foreign invasions, domestic insurrections, and domestic usurpations of power by rulers. It is against sound policy for a free people to keep up large military establishments and standing armies in time of peace, both from the enormous expenses with which they are attended and the facile means which they afford to ambitious and unprincipled rulers to subvert the government or trample upon the rights of the people, the right of the citizens. To keep and bear arms has justly been considered as the palladium of the liberties of a republic since it offers a strong moral check against the usurpation and arbitrary power of rulers, and will generally, even if these are successful in the first instance, enable the people to resist and triumph over them. And yet, though this truth would seem so clear, and the importance of a well-regulated militia would seem so undeniable, it cannot be disguised that among the American people there is a growing indifference to any system of militia discipline, and a strong disposition, from a sense of its burdens, to be rid of all regulations, how it is practicable to keep the people duly armed without some organization, it is difficult to see. There is certainly no small danger that indifference may lead to disgust and disgust to contempt and thus gradually undermine all the protection intended by the clause of our National Bill of Rights. 2J Story, Commentaries on the Constitution of the United States Purgopher 1897, Peep Rees 620, 621, 4th Editor 1873. Footnote omitted. Story thus began by tying the significance of the amendment directly to the paramount importance of the militia. He then invoked the fear that drove the framers of the Second Amendment specifically, the threat to liberty posed by a standing army. An important check on that danger, he suggested, was a well-regulated militia ID at 621, 4, which he assumed that arms would have to be kept and, when necessary, borne. There is not so much as a whisper. In the passage above that story, believe that the right secured by the amendment bore any relation to private use or possession of weapons for activities like hunting or personal self-defense. After extolling the virtues of the militia as a bulwark against tyranny, Story went on to decry the growing indifference to any system 
Ibid, when he wrote, how it is practicable to keep the people duly armed. Without some organization it is difficult to see. Ibid, he underscored the degree to which he viewed the arming of the people and the militia as indissolubly linked. Story warned that the growing indifference he perceived would gradually undermine all the protection intended by this clause of our National Bill of Rights, Ibid, in his view, the importance of the amendment was directly related to the continuing vitality of an institution in the process of apparently becoming obsolete. In an attempt to downplay the absence of any reference to non-military uses of weapons in Story's commentary, the court relies on the fact that Story characterized Article 7 of the English Declaration of Rights as a we similar provision, ante at 608. The two provisions were indeed similar, in that both protected some uses of firearms. But Story's characterization in no way suggests that he believed that the provisions had the same scope. To the contrary, Story's exclusive focus on the militia in his discussion of the Second Amendment confirms his understanding of the right protected by the Second Amendment as limited to military uses of arms. Story's writings as a justice of this court, to the extent that they shed light on this question, only confirm that Justice Story did not view the amendment as conferring upon individuals any self-defense right disconnected from service in a state militia. Justice Story dissented from the court's decision in Houston v. Moore 5 Wheat, 1 1820, which held that a state court had a concurrent jurisdiction with the federal courts to try a militia man who had disobeyed the call of the president and to enforce the laws of Congress against such delinquent Idir at 32. Justice, Story believed that Congress's power to provide for the organizing, arming, and disciplining of the militia was when Congress acted plenary. But he explained that in the absence of congressional action, I am certainly not prepared to deny the legitimacy of such an exercise of state authority. It, at 52. As to the Second Amendment, he wrote that it may not perhaps be thought to have any important bearing on this point. If it have, it confirms and illustrates rather than impugns the reasoning already suggested. Ades at 52-53. The court contends that had Justice Story understood the amendment to have a militia purpose, the amendment would have had enormous and obvious bearing on the point. Ante at 6 on 10. But the court has it quite backwards. If Story had believed that the purpose of the amendment was to permit civilians to keep firearms for activities, like personal self-defense, what confirmation and illustratin? Houston 5 Wheat. Ferret 53. Could the amendment possibly have provided for the point that states retained the sewer power to organize, arm, and discipline their own militias? Post-Civil War Legislative History. The court suggests that by the post-Civil War period, the Second Amendment was understood to secure a right to firearm use and ownership for purely private purposes like personal self-defense. While it is true that some of the legislative history on which the court relies supports that contention, see Ante, at 614-616, such sources are entitled to limited, if any, weight. All of the statements the court cites were made long after the framing of the amendment and cannot possibly supply any insight into the intent of the framers, and all were made during pitched political debates, so that they are better characterized as advocacy than good-faith attempts at constitutional interpretation. What is more, much of the evidence the court offers is decidedly less clear than its discussion allows. The court notes, Blacks were routinely disarmed by southern states. After the Civil War, those who opposed these injustices frequently stated that they infringed blacks' constitutional right to keep and bear arms, ante at 614. The court hastily concludes that, needless to say, the claim was not, that blacks were being prohibited from carrying arms in an Organized state militia, EBID. But some of the claims of the sort the court cites may have been just that. In some, southern states, Reconstruction-era Republican governments created state militias in which both blacks and whites were permitted to serve. Because of the decision to allow blacks to serve alongside whites meant that most southerners refused to join the new militia. The bodies were dubbed Negro Militia, it's Cornell, a well-regulated militia. 177. 2006. The arming of the Negro militias met with especially fierce resistance in South Carolina. The sight of organized armed freedmen incensed opponents of Reconstruction and led to an intensified campaign of Klan terror. Leading members of the Negro militia were beaten or lynched and their weapons stolen. Idor, 
at 176-177, one particularly chilling account of Reconstruction era. Clan violence directed at a black militia member is recounted in the memoir of Lewis F. Post, a carpetbagger in South. Carolina, 10 Journal of Negro History, 10, 1925. Post describes the murder by local Klan members of Jim Williams, the captain of a Negro militia company, who had grown at 59 this way, a cavalcade of 60 cowardly white men completely, disguised with face masks and body gowns, rode up one night in March 1871 to the house of Captain Williams. In the wood, they hanged and shot him. And on his body, they then pinned a slip of paper inscribed, as I remember it, with these grim words. Jim, Williams gone to his last muster. Dom at 61. In light of this evidence, it is quite possible that at least some of the statements on which the court relies actually did mean to refer to the disarmament of black militia members, i.v., the brilliance of the debates that resulted in the second. Amendment faded into oblivion during the ensuing years, for the concerns about Article I's militia clauses that generated such pitched debate during the ratification process and led to the adoption of the Second Amendment were short-lived. In 1792, the year after the amendment was ratified, Congress passed a statute that purported to establish an uniform militia throughout the United States. First Stat 271, the statute commanded every able-bodied white male citizen between the ages of 18 and 45 to be enrolled therein and to provide himself with a good musket or firelock and other specified weaponry. Ibid, the statute is significant for it confirmed the way those in the founding generation viewed firearm ownership as a duty linked to military service. The statute they enacted, however, was virtually ignored for more than a century and was finally repealed in 1901. See Perpich, 496 U.S. at 341. The post-ratification history of the Second Amendment is strikingly similar. The amendment played little role in any legislative debate about the civilian use of firearms for most of the 19th century, and it made few appearances in the decisions of this court. Two 19th century cases, however, bear mentioning. In United States v. Cruikshank, 92 U.S. 542, 1876, the court sustained a challenge to respondents' convictions. Under the Enforcement Act of 1870 for conspiring to deprive any individual of any right or privilege granted or secured to him by the Constitution or laws of the United States, those at 5 of 48. The court wrote as to counts 2 and 10 of respondents' indictment. The right there specified is that of bearing arms for race, a lawful purpose. This is not a right granted by the Constitution. Neither is it in any manner dependent on that instrument for its existence. The Second Amendment declares that it shall not be infringed, but this, as has been seen, means no more than that it shall not be infringed by Congress. This is one of the amendments that has no other effect than to restrict the powers of the national government. It detrues at 5 and 53. The majority's assertion that the court in Cruikshank described the right protected by the Second Amendment as as bearing arms for a lawful purpose, ante at 620, quoting Cruikshank, 92 U.S. at 553, is not accurate. The Cruikshank court explained that the defective indictment contained such language, but the court did not itself describe the right or endorse the indictment's description of the right. Moreover, it is entirely possible that the basis for the indictment's counts 2 and 10, which charged respondents with depriving the victims of rights secured by the Second Amendment, was the prosecutor's belief that the victims, members of a group of citizens, mostly black but also white, who were rounded up by the sheriff, sworn in as a posse to defend the local courthouse and attacked by a white mob bore sufficient resemblance to members of a state militia that they were brought within the reach of the Second Amendment. See generally C. Lane, The Day Freedom Died, The Colfax Massacre, The Supreme Court, and The Betrayal of Reconstruction, 2008. Only one other 19th century case in this court presser, Forest, Illinois, 116 U.S., 252, 1886, engaged in any significant discussion of the Second Amendment. The petitioner in Presser was convicted of violating a state statute that prohibited organizations other than the Illinois National Guard from associating together as military companies or parading with arms. Presser challenged his conviction, asserting, as relevant, that the statute violated both the Second and the Fourteenth Amendments. With respect to the Second Amendment, the court wrote, 
we think it clear that the sections under consideration, which only forbid bodies of men to associate together as military organizations, or to drill or parade, with arms in cities and towns unless authorized by law, do not infringe the right of the people to keep and bear arms. But a conclusive answer to the contention that this amendment prohibits the legislation in question lies in the fact that the amendment is a limitation only upon the power of Congress and the national government, and not upon that of the states. It adjures at 264-265, and in discussing the 14th Amendment, the court explained, The plaintiff in error was not a member of the organized volunteer militia of the state of Illinois, nor did D. Inastoisior, he belonged to the troops of the United States, or to any organization under the militia law of the United States. On the contrary, the fact that he belonged to the organized militia or the troops of the United States was an ingredient in the offense for which he was convicted and sentenced. The question is, therefore, had he a right as a citizen of the United States in disobedience of the state law to associate with others as a military company and to drill and parade with arms in the towns and cities of the state? If the plaintiff in error has any such privilege, he must be able to point to the provision of the Constitution or Statutes of the United States by which it is conferred. It is owns at 266. Presser, therefore, both affirmed Cruikshank's holding that the Second Amendment posed no obstacle to regulation by state governments and suggested that in any event, nothing in the Constitution protected the use of arms outside the context of a militia authorized by law and organized by the state or federal government. In 1901, the President revitalized the militia by creating the National Guard of the Several States, per Peach 496, U.S. at 341, and NNR 9 to 10. Meanwhile, the dominant understanding of the Second Amendment's inapplicability to private gun ownership continued well into the 20th century. The first two federal laws directly restricting civilian use and possession of firearms, the 1927 Act prohibiting mail, delivery of pistols, revolvers, and other firearms capable of being concealed on the person, GH 75, 44, Statter 1059, and the 1934 Act prohibiting the possession of sawed-off shotguns and machine guns were enacted over minor Second Amendment objections dismissed by the vast majority of the legislators who participated in the debates. Thirty-seven members of Congress clashed over the wisdom and efficacy of such laws as crime control measures. But since the statutes did not infringe upon the military use or possession of weapons for most legislators, they did not even raise the specter of possible conflict with the Second Amendment. Thus, for most of our history, the invalidity of Second Amendment-based objections to firearms regulations has been well settled and uncontroversial. Indeed, the Second Amendment was not even mentioned in either full house of Congress during the legislative proceedings that led to the passage of the 1934 Act. Yet enforcement of that law produced the judicial decision that confirmed the status of the amendment as limited in reach to military usage. After reviewing many of the same sources that are discussed at greater length by the court today, the Miller Court unanimously concluded that the Second Amendment did not apply to the possession of a firearm that did not have some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia. 307 U.S. at 178. The key to that decision did not, as the court belatedly suggests, ante, at 622-625, turn on the difference between muskets and sawed-off shotguns, it turned rather on the basic difference between the military and non-military use, and possession of guns. Indeed, if the Second Amendment were not limited in its coverage to military uses of weapons, why should the court in Miller have suggested that some weapons but not others were eligible for Second Amendment? Protection? If use for self-defense were the relevant standard, why did the court not inquire into the suitability of a particular weapon for self-defense purposes. Perhaps in recognition of the weakness of its attempt to distinguish Miller, the court argues in the alternative that Miller should be discounted because of its decisional history. It is true that the appellees in Miller did not file a brief or make an appearance, although the court below had held that the relevant provision of the National Firearms Act violated the Second Amendment, albeit without any reasoned opinion. But as our decision in Marbury v. Madison were scranch, 137, in which only one side appeared and presented arguments, demonstrates the absence of adversarial presentation alone is not a basis for refusing to accord stare decisis effect to a decision of this court. See Block Marbury, 
Redux in Arguing Marbury vs. Madison 59, 63, M. Tushnet, Edger 2005. Of course, if it can be demonstrated that new evidence or arguments were genuinely not available to an earlier court, that fact should be given special weight as we consider whether to overrule a prior case. But the court does not make that claim, because it cannot. Although it is true that the drafting history of the amendment was not discussed in the government's brief, see Ante, at 623-624, it is certainly not the drafting history that the court's decision today turns on, and those sources upon which the court today relies most heavily were available to the Miller court. The government cited the English Bill of Rights and quoted a lengthy passage from Amet v. State, 2110 and 154, 1840, detailing the history leading to the English guarantee, brief, for United States and United States v. Miller, OT 1938, number 696, P. Peter 12-13. It also cited Blackstone ID at 9, number 2, Cooley Idikakin at 12, 15, and Story Idikachin at 15. The court is reduced to critiquing the number of pages the government devoted to exploring the English legal sources, only two, in a brief 21 pages in length. Would the court be satisfied? With 410, the court is simply wrong when it intones that Miller contained not a word about the amendment's history. Ante at 624. The court plainly looked to history to construe the term militia, and on the best reading of Miller, the entire guarantee of the Second Amendment. After noting the original Constitution's grant of power to Congress and to the states over the militia, the court explained, with obvious purpose to assure the continuation and render possible the effectiveness of such forces, the declaration and guarantee of the Second Amendment were made. It must be interpreted and applied with that end in view. The militia which the states were expected to maintain and train is set in contrast with troops which they were forbidden to keep without the consent of Congress. The sentiment of the time strongly disfavored standing, armies. The common view was that adequate defense of country and laws could be secured through the militia, civilians primarily, soldiers on occasion. The signification attributed to the term militia appears from the debates in the convention, the history and legislation of colonies and states, and the writings of approved commentators. Miller, 307 U.S. at... 178-179. The majority cannot seriously believe that the Miller court did not consider any relevant evidence. The majority simply does not approve of the conclusion the Miller court reached. On that evidence, standing alone, that is insufficient reason to disregard a unanimous opinion of this court, upon which substantial reliance has been placed by legislators and citizens for nearly 70 years. Bors sets at sea. The court concludes its opinion by declaring that it is not the proper role of this court to change the meaning of rights, enshrined in the Constitution, ante at 636, but the right the court announces was not enshrined in the second. Amendment by the framers, it is the product of today's law-changing decision. The majority's exegesis has utterly failed to establish that as a matter of text or history, the right of law-abiding responsible citizens to use arms in defense of hearth and home is elevated above all other interests by the Second Amendment. Ante, at 635. Until today, it has been understood that legislatures may regulate the civilian use and misuse of firearms so long as they do not interfere with the preservation of a well-regulated militia. The court's announcement of a new constitutional right to own and use firearms for private purposes upsets that settled understanding, but leaves for future cases the formidable task of defining the scope of permissible regulations. Today, judicial craftsmen have confidently asserted that a policy choice that denies a law-abiding responsible citizen the right to keep and use weapons in the home for self-defense is off the table. Ante at 636, given the presumption that most citizens are law-abiding and the reality that the need to defend oneself may suddenly arise in a host of locations outside the home. I fear that the district's policy choice may well be just the first of an unknown number of dominoes to be knocked off. The table. I do not know whether today's decision will increase the labor of federal judges to the breaking point envisioned by Justice Cardozo, but it will surely give rise to a far more active judicial role in making vitally important national policy decisions than was envisioned at any time in the 18th, 19th, or 20th centuries. The court properly disclaims any interest in evaluating the wisdom of the specific policy choice challenged in this 
case, but it fails to pay heed to a far more important policy. Choice the choice made by the framers themselves. The court would have us believe that over 200 years ago, the framers made a choice to limit the tools available to elected officials wishing to regulate civilian uses of weapons and to authorize this court to use the common law process of case-by-case -case judicial lawmaking to define the contours of acceptable gun control policy. Absent compelling evidence that is nowhere to be found in the court's opinion, I could not possibly conclude that the framers made such a choice. IV. We turn finally to the law at issue here. As we have said, the law totally bans handgun possession in the home. It also requires that any lawful firearm in the home be disassembled or bound by a trigger lock at all times, rendering it inoperable. As the quotations earlier in this opinion demonstrate, the inherent right of self-defense has been central to the Second Amendment right. The handgun ban amounts to a prohibition of an entire class of arms that is overwhelmingly chosen by American society for that lawful purpose. The prohibition extends, moreover, to the home, where the need for defense of self, family, and property is most acute. Under any of the standards of scrutiny that we have applied to enumerated constitutional rights, in banning from the home the most preferred firearm in the nation to keep and use for protection of one's home and family, 478F, 3D at 400 would fail constitutional muster. Few laws in the history of our nation have come close to the severe restriction of the district's handgun ban, and some of those few have been struck down. In Nunver's state, the Georgia Supreme Court struck down a prohibition on carrying pistols openly, even though it upheld a prohibition on carrying concealed weapons. See one gay at 251 in Andrews v. State, the Tennessee Supreme Court likewise held that a statute that forbade openly carrying a pistol, publicly or privately, without regard to time or place or circumstances, 5010 in, at 187, violated the state constitutional provision, which the court equated with the Second Amendment. That was so, even though the statute did not restrict the carrying of long guns, ebidi. See also State v. Reed, Word Alice 612, 616, 617, 1840. A statute which, under the pretense of regulating, amounts to a destruction of the right, or which requires arms to be so borne as to render them wholly useless for the purpose of defense, would be clearly unconstitutional. It is no answer to say, as petitioners do, that it is permissible to ban the possession of handguns so long as the possession of other firearms, i.e., long guns, is allowed. It is enough to note, as we have observed, that the American people have considered the handgun to be the quintessential self-defense weapon. There are many reasons that a citizen may prefer a handgun for home defense. It is easier to store in a location that is readily accessible in an emergency. It cannot easily be redirected or wrestled away by an attacker. It is easier to use for those without the upper body strength. To lift and aim a long gun, it can be pointed at a burglar with one hand while the other hand dials the police. Whatever. The reason, handguns are the most popular weapon chosen by Americans for self-defense in the home, and a complete prohibition of their use is invalid. We must also address the district's requirement, as applied to respondents' handgun, that firearms in the home be coy, rendered and kept inoperable at all times. This makes it impossible for citizens to use them for the core lawful purpose of self-defense, and is hence unconstitutional. The district argues that we should interpret this element of the statute to contain an exception for self-defense. See Brief for Petitioners 5657. But we think that is precluded by the unequivocal text and by the presence of certain other enumerated exceptions. Except for law enforcement personnel. Each registrant shall keep any firearm in his possession unloaded and disassembled or bound by a trigger, lock or similar device unless such firearm is kept at his place of business, or while being used for lawful recreational purposes within the District of Columbia. D.C. Code, Paragraph 7, 2507, Year 2. The non-existence of a self-defense exception is also suggested by the D.C. Court of Appeals' statement that the statute forbids residents to use firearms to stop intruders, see McIntosh v. Washington, 395 A. Sioux D., 744, 755, 756, 1978. Wait. Apart from his challenge to the handgun ban and the trigger lock requirement respondent asked the district court to enjoin petitioners from enforcing the separate licensing requirement 
in such a manner as to forbid the carrying of a firearm within one's home or possessed land without a license. Apudert 59a. The Court of Appeals did not invalidate the licensing requirement, but held only that the district may not prevent a handgun from being moved throughout one's house. 478 F3rd at 400. It then ordered, the district court to enter summary judgment consistent with respondent's prayer for relief. Idi at 401 before, this court petitioners have stated that if the handgun ban is struck down and respondent registers a handgun, he could obtain a license, assuming he is not otherwise disqualified, by which they apparently mean if he is not a felon and is not insane. Brief for Petitioners 58. Respondent conceded at oral argument that he does not have a problem with licensing and that the district's law is permissible, so long as it is not enforced in an arbitrary and capricious manner. Doctor of Oral Arg. 74 to 75. We therefore assume that petitioner's issuance of a license will satisfy respondent's prayer for relief and do not address the licensing requirement. Justice Breyer has devoted most of his separate dissent to the handgun ban. He says that even assuming the Second Amendment is a personal guarantee of the right to bear arms, the district's prohibition is valid. He first tries to establish this by founding era historical precedent, pointing to various restrictive laws in the colonial period. These demonstrate in his view that the district's law imposes a burden upon gun owners that seems proportionately no greater than restrictions in existence at the time the Second Amendment was adopted. Post at 682. Of the laws he cites, only one offers even marginal support for his assertion. A 1783 Massachusetts law forbade the residents of Boston to take into or receive into any dwelling house, stable, barn, outhouse, warehouse, store, shop, or other building loaded firearms, and permitted the seizure of any loaded firearms that shall be found there. Act of Mar 1, 1783, Chateau 3, 1783 Mass, Acts P, 218. That statute's text and its prologue, which makes clear that the purpose of the prohibition was to eliminate the danger to firefighters posed by the depositing of loaded arms in buildings, give reason to doubt that colonial Boston authorities would have enforced that general prohibition against someone who temporarily loaded a firearm to confront an intruder, despite the law's application in that case. In any case, we would not stake our interpretation of the Second Amendment upon a single Law in effect in a single city that contradicts the overwhelming weight of other evidence regarding the right to keep and bear arms for defense of the home. The other laws Justice Breyer cites are gunpowder storage laws that he concedes did not clearly prohibit loaded weapons but required only that excess gunpowder be kept in a special container or on the top floor of the home. Post at 686. Nothing about those fire safety laws undermines our analysis. They do not remotely burden the right of self-defense as much as an absolute ban on handguns. Nor, correspondingly, does our analysis suggest the invalidity of laws regulating the storage of firearms to prevent accidents. Justice Breyer points to other founding-era laws that he says restricted the firing of guns within the city limits, to at least some degree, in Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. Post at 683, citing Churchill gun regulation, the police power, and the right to keep arms in early America, 25 Law and Hist, Rev. 139, 162, 2007. Those laws provide no support for the severe restriction in the present case. The New York law levied a fine of 20 shillings on anyone who fired a gun in certain places, including houses, on New Year's Eve and the first two days of January, and was aimed at preventing the great damages, frequently done on those days by persons going house to house with guns and other firearms and being often intoxicated with liquor. Cheer 1501, 5 Colonial Laws of New York, 244 246, 1894. It is inconceivable that this law would have been enforced against a person exercising his right to self defense on New Year's Day against such drunken hooligans. The Pennsylvania law to which Justice Breyer refers levied a fine of five shillings on one who fired a gun or set off fireworks in Philadelphia without first obtaining a license from the governor. See Act of Aug, 26, 1721. Kosh CCXLV, Par of Carfer in 3 Stat, at large of Pia, 253-254, 1896. Given Justice Wilson's explanation, 
that the right to self-defense with arms was protected by the Pennsylvania Constitution, it is unlikely that this law, which in any event amounted to at most a licensing regime, would have been enforced against a person who used firearms for self-defense. Justice Breyer cites a Rhode Island law that simply levied a five-shilling fine on those who fired guns in streets and taverns, a law obviously inapplicable to this case, see an act for preventing mischief being done in the town of Newport or in any other town in this government. 1731 Rhode Island Section Laws P242 Fyodor. And finally, Justice Breyer points to a massive to the Pennsylvania law prohibiting discharging any gun or pistol charged with shot or ball in the town of Boston. Acti of May 28, 1746, Curex, Acts and Laws of Mass, Bay P. 208. It is again implausible that this would have been enforced against a citizen acting in self-defense, particularly given its preambulatory reference to the indiscreet firing of guns. EBID preamble, emphasis added. A broader point about the laws that Justice Breyer cites, all of them punish the discharge or loading of guns, with a small fine and forfeiture of the weapon, or in a few, cases a very brief stay in the local jail, not with significant criminal penalties. They are akin to modern penalties for minor public safety infractions like speeding or jaywalking. And although such public safety laws may not contain exceptions for self-defense, it is inconceivable that the threat of a jaywalking ticket would deter someone from disregarding a do-not-walk sign in order to flee an attacker, or that the government would enforce those laws under such circumstances. Likewise, we do not think that a law imposing a five-shilling fine and forfeiture of the gun would have prevented a person in the founding era from using a gun to protect himself or his family from violence, or that if he did, so the law would be enforced against him. The district law, by contrast, far from imposing a minor fine, threatens citizens with a year in prison, five years for a second violation, for even obtaining a gun in the first place. CDC Code. Paragraph 7206. Justice Breyer moves on to make a broad jurisprudential point. He criticizes us for declining to establish a level of scrutiny for evaluating Second Amendment restrictions. He proposes, explicitly at least, none of the traditionally expressed levels, strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, rational basis, but rather a judge-empowering interest-balancing inquiry that asks whether the statute burdens a protected interest in a way or to an extent that is out of proportion to the statute's salutary effects upon other important governmental interests. Post at 689690. After an exhaustive Discussion of the arguments for and against gun control, Justice Breyer arrives at his interest-balanced answer. Because handgun violence is a problem, because the law is limited to an urban area, and because there were somewhat similar restrictions in the founding period, a false proposition that we have already discussed, the interest-balancing inquiry results in the constitutionality of the handgun ban. QED, we know of no other enumerated constitutional right whose core protection has been subjected to a freestanding, interest-balancing approach. The very enumeration of the right takes out of the hands of government, even the third branch of government, the power to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether the right is really worth insisting upon. A constitutional guarantee subject to future judges? Assessments of its usefulness is no constitutional guarantee at all. Constitutional rights are enshrined with the scope they were understood to have when the people adopted them, whether or not future legislatures or, yes, even future, judges think that scope too broad. We would not apply an interest-balancing approach to the prohibition of a peaceful neo-Nazi march through Skokie. See National Socialist, Party of America vs. Skokie, 432 U.S. 43, 1977, per curiam. The First Amendment contains the freedom of speech guarantee that the people ratified, which included exceptions for obscenity, libel and disclosure of state secrets, but not for the expression of extremely unpopular and wrong-headed views. The Second Amendment is no different. Like the first, it is the very product of an interest balancing by the people which Justice Breyer would now conduct for them anew. And whatever else it leaves to future evaluation, it surely elevates above all other interests the right of law-abiding responsible citizens to use arms in defense of hearth and home, Justice Breyer chides us for leaving so many applications of the right to keep and bear arms in doubt, and for not providing extensive historical justification for those regulations of the right that we describe as permissible. See, 
post at 720-721. But since this case represents this court's first in-depth examination of the Second Amendment, one should not expect it to clarify the entire field any more than Reynolds v. United States, 98 U.S. 145, 1879, our first in-depth free exercise clause case, left that area in a state of utter certainty, and there will be time enough to expound upon the historical justifications for the exceptions we have, mentioned if and when those exceptions come before us. In sum, we hold that the district's ban on handgun possession in the home violates the Second Amendment, as does its prohibition against rendering any lawful firearm in the home operable for the purpose of immediate self-defense. Assuming that Heller is not disqualified from the exercise of Second Amendment rights, the district must permit him to register his handgun and must issue him a license to carry it in the home. We are aware of the problem of handgun violence in this country, and we take seriously the concerns raised by the many Amici who believe that prohibition of handgun ownership is a solution. The Constitution leaves the District of Columbia a variety of tools for combating that problem, including some measures regulating handguns, see Supra at 626-627 and number 26, but the enshrinement of constitutional rights necessarily takes certain policy choices off the table. These include the absolute prohibition of handguns held and used for self-defense in the home. Undoubtedly, some think that the Second Amendment is outmoded in a society where our standing army is the pride of our nation, where well-trained police forces provide personal security, and where gun violence is a serious problem. That is perhaps debatable, but what is not debatable is that it is not the role of this court to pronounce the Second Amendment extinct. We affirm the judgment of the Court of Appeals. It is so ordered. Justice Stevens, with whom Justice Souter, Justice Ginsburg, and Justice Breyer join dissenting. The question presented by this case is not whether the Second Amendment protects a collective right or an individual right. Surely it protects a right that can be enforced by individuals. But a conclusion that the Second Amendment protects an individual right does not tell us anything about the scope of that right. Guns are used to hunt for self-defense, to commit crimes, for sporting activities, and to perform military duties. The Second Amendment plainly does not protect the right to use a gun to rob a bank. It is equally clear that it does encompass the right to use weapons for certain military purposes, whether it also protects the right to possess and use guns for non-military purposes like hunting and personal self. Defense is the question presented by this case. The text of the amendment, its history, and our decision in United States v. Miller 307 U.S. 174, 1939, provide a clear answer to that question. The Second Amendment was adopted to protect the right of the people of each of the several states to maintain a well-regulated militia. It was a response to concerns raised during the ratification of the Constitution that the power of Congress to disarm the state militias and create a national standing army posed an intolerable threat to the sovereignty of the several states. Neither the text of the amendment nor the arguments advanced by its proponents evidence the slightest interest in limiting any legislature's authority to regulate private civilian uses of firearms. Specifically there is no indication that the framers of the amendment intended to enshrine the common law right of self-defense in the Constitution. In 1934, Congress enacted the National Firearms Act, the first major federal firearms law, sustaining an indictment. Under the act, this court held that in the absence of any evidence tending to show that possession or use of a shotgun, having a barrel of less than 18 inches in length at this time has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, we cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear. Such an instrument, Miller 307 U.S. at 178, the view of the amendment we took in Miller, that it protects the right to keep and bear arms for certain military purposes but that it does not curtail the legislature's power to regulate the non-military use and ownership of weapons is both the most natural reading of the amendment's text and the interpretation most faithful to the history of its adoption. Since our decision in Miller, hundreds of judges have relied on the view of the amendment we endorsed there. Two, we ourselves affirmed it in 1980. See Lewis vs. United States, 445 U.S. 55, 65, 66, and 8, 1980. No new evidence has surfaced since 1980 supporting the view that the amendment was intended to curtail the power of Congress to regulate civilian use or misuse of weapons. Indeed, 
a review of the drafting history of the amendment demonstrates that its framers rejected proposals that would have broadened its coverage to include such uses. The opinion the court announces today fails to identify any new evidence supporting the view that the amendment was intended to limit the power of Congress to regulate civilian uses of weapons. Unable to point to any such evidence, the court stakes its holding on a strained and unpersuasive reading of the amendment's text. Significantly different provisions in the 1689 English Bill of Rights and in various 19th century state constitutions, post enactment commentary that was available to the court when it decided Miller, and ultimately, a feeble attempt to distinguish Miller that places more emphasis on the court's decisional process than on the reasoning in the opinion itself. Even if the textual and historical arguments on both sides of the issue were evenly balanced, respect for the well-settled views of all of our predecessors on this court, and for the rule of law itself, see Mitchell v. W. T. Grant Co., 416, U.S. 600, 636, 1974, Stewart, J., dissenting, would prevent most jurists from endorsing such a dramatic upheaval in the law for. As Justice Cardozo observed years ago, the labor of judges would be increased almost to the breaking point if every past decision could be reopened in every case, and one could not lay one's own course of bricks on the secure foundation of the courses laid by others who had gone before him. The Nature of the Judicial Process 149, 1921 In this dissent I shall first explain why our decision in Miller was faithful to the text of the Second Amendment, and the purposes revealed in its drafting history. I shall then comment on the post-ratification history of the amendment, which makes abundantly clear that the amendment should not be interpreted as limiting the authority of Congress to regulate the use or possession of firearms for purely civilian purposes. I. The text of the Second Amendment is brief. It provides a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. Three portions of that text merit special focus. The introductory language defining the amendment's purpose, the class of persons encompassed within its reach, and the unitary nature of the right that it protects. A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state. The preamble to the Second Amendment makes three important points. It identifies the preservation of the militia as the amendment's purpose. It explains that the militia is necessary to the security of a free state, and it recognizes that the militia must be well regulated. In all three respects, it is comparable to provisions in several state declarations of rights that were adopted roughly contemporaneously with the Declaration of Independence. Those state provisions highlight the importance members of the founding generation attached to the maintenance of state militias. They also underscore the profound fear shared by many in that era of the dangers posed by standing armies. While the need for state militias has not been a matter of significant public interest for almost two centuries, that fact should not obscure the contemporary concerns that animated the framers, the parallels between the Second Amendment and these state declarations, and the Second Amendment's omission of any statement of purpose related to the right to use firearms for hunting or personal self-defense is especially striking in light of the fact that the declarations of rights of Pennsylvania and Vermont did expressly protect such civilian uses at the time. Article 3 of Pennsylvania's 1776 Declaration of Rights announced that the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state. Fur Schwartz 266, emphasis added. Paragraph 43 of the Declaration ensured that the Inhabitants of this state shall have the liberty to fowl and hunt in seasonable times on the lands they hold and on all other lands therein not enclosed, i.d. at 274, and article, Sife of the 1777 Vermont Declaration of Rights Guaranteed, and that the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state. Yiddish Brown at 324, emphasis added. The contrast between those two declarations and the second Amendment reinforces the clear statement of purpose announced in the amendment's preamble. It confirms that the framers' single-minded focus in crafting the constitutional guarantee to keep and bear arms was on military uses of firearms, which they viewed in the context of service in state militias. The preamble thus both sets forth the object of the amendment and informs the meaning of the remainder of its text. Such text should not be treated as mere surplusage. 
for it cannot be presumed that any clause in the Constitution is intended to be without effect. Marbury v. Madison, 1 Cranch 137, 174, Elates and O3s. The court today tries to denigrate the importance of this clause of the amendment by beginning its analysis with the amendment's operative provision and returning to the preamble merely to ensure that our reading of the operative clause is consistent with the announced purpose. Ante, at 578. That is not how this court ordinarily reads such texts, and it is not how the preamble would have been viewed at the time the amendment was adopted. While the court makes the novel suggestion that it need only find some logical connection between the preamble and the operative provision, it does acknowledge that a prefatory clause may resolve an ambiguity in the text. Ante at 577. 7. Without identifying any language in the text that even mentions civilian uses of firearms, the court proceeds to find its preferred reading in what is at best an ambiguous text, and then concludes that its reading is not foreclosed by the preamble. Perhaps the court's approach to the text is acceptable advocacy, but it is surely an unusual approach for judges to follow. It's the right of the people. The centerpiece of the court's textual argument is its insistence that the words, the people, as used in the second, amendment must have the same meaning and protect the same class of individuals as when they are used in the first and fourth amendments. According to the court, in all three provisions as well as the Constitution's preamble, paragraph 2 of Article 1 and the Tenth Amendment, the term unambiguously refers to all members of the political community, not an unspecified subset, ante at 580. But the court itself reads the Second Amendment to protect a subset significantly narrower than the class of persons protected by the First and Fourth Amendments when it finally drills down. On the substantive meaning of the Second Amendment, the court limits the protected class to law-abiding, responsible citizens, ante, at 635. But the class of persons protected by the First and Fourth Amendments is not so limited, for even felons, and presumably irresponsible citizens as well, may invoke the protections of those constitutional provisions. The court offers no way to harmonize its conflicting pronouncements. The court also overlooks the significance of the way the framers use the phrase the people in these constitutional provisions. In the First Amendment, no words define the class of individuals entitled to speak, to publish, or to worship. In that amendment, it is only the right peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances that is described as a right of the people. Uh -huh. These rights contemplate collective action. While the right peaceably to assemble protects the individual rights of those persons participating in the assembly, its concern is with action engaged in by members of a group rather than any single individual. Likewise, although the act of petitioning the government is a right that can be exercised by individuals, it is primarily collective in nature. For if they are to be Effective, petitions must involve groups of individuals acting in concert. Similarly, the words the people in the Second Amendment refer back to the object announced in the amendment's preamble. They remind us that it is the collective action of individuals having a duty to serve in the militia that the text directly protects, and perhaps more importantly, that the ultimate purpose of the amendment was to protect the state's share of the divided sovereignty created by the Constitution. As used in the Fourth Amendment, the people describes the class of persons protected from unreasonable searches and seizures by government officials. It is true that the Fourth Amendment describes a right that need not be exercised in any collective sense, but that observation does not settle the meaning of the phrase the people when used in the Second Amendment, for as we have seen the phrase means something quite different in the petition and assembly clauses of the First Amendment, although the abstract Definition of the phrase the people could carry the same. Meaning in the Second Amendment as in the Fourth Amendment, the preamble of the Second Amendment suggests that the uses of the phrase in the First and Second Amendments are the same in referring to a collective activity. By way of contrast, the Fourth Amendment describes a right against governmental interference rather than an affirmative right to engage in protected conduct and so refers to a right to protect a purely individual interest. As used in the Second Amendment, the words the people do not enlarge the right to keep and bear arms to encompass use or ownership of weapons outside the context of service in a well-regulated militia. To keep and bear arms. Although the court's discussion of these words treats 
them as two phrases, as if they read to keep and to bear. They describe a unitary right, to possess arms if needed for military purposes and to use them in conjunction with military activities. As a threshold matter, it is worth pausing to note an oddity in the court's interpretation of to keep and bear arms. Unlike the Court of Appeals, the court does not read that phrase to create a right to possess arms for lawful private purposes. Parker v's District of Columbia, 478 F 3D 370, 382, Godsey 2007. Instead, the court limits the amendment's protection to the right to possess and carry weapons in case of confrontation. Anti at 592. No party or amicus urged this interpretation. The court appears to have fashioned it out of whole cloth. But although this novel limitation lacks support in the text of the amendment, the amendment's text does justify a different limitation. The right to keep and bear arms protects only a right to possess and use firearms in connection with service in a state-organized militia. The term bear arms is a familiar idiom. When used unadorned by any additional words, its meaning is to serve. As a soldier, do military service fight. Warren Oxford English. Dictionary 634, 2 Dider 1989. It is derived from the Latin arma ferre, which translated literally means to bear. Ferre wore equipment arma. Brief for professors of linguistics in English as Amici Curiae 19. One 18th century dictionary defined arms as weapons of offense or armor of defense, Warren S. Johnson, a dictionary of the English language, 1755, and another contemporaneous source, explained that by arms, we understand those instruments of offense generally made use of in war, such as firearms, swords, etc. By weapons, we more particularly mean instruments of other kinds, exclusive of firearms, made use of as offensive on special occasions. 1J Trussler, The Distinction Between Words, esteemed synonymous in the English language 37, 3 to Edmure 1794. Had the framers wished to expand the meaning of the phrase bear arms to encompass civilian possession and use, they could have done so by the addition of phrases such as for the defense of themselves, as was done in the Pennsylvania and Vermont declarations of rights. The unmodified use of bear arms, by contrast, refers most naturally to a military purpose, as evidenced by its use in literally dozens of contemporary texts. The absence of any reference to civilian uses of weapons tailors the text of the amendment to the purpose identified in its preamble. But when discussing these words, the court simply ignores the preamble. The court argues that a qualifying phrase that contradicts the word or phrase it modifies is unknown this side of the looking glass, ante at 589. But this fundamentally fails to grasp the point. The standalone phrase bear arms most naturally conveys a military meaning unless the addition of a qualifying phrase signals that a different meaning is intended. When, as in this case, there is no such qualifier, the most natural meaning is the military one. And in the absence of any qualifier, it is all the more appropriate to look to the preamble to confirm the natural meaning of the text 11. The court's objection is particularly puzzling in light of its own contention that the addition of the modifier against changes the meaning of bear arms. Compare ante at 584, defining bear arms to mean carrying a C weapon for a particular purpose confrontation with ante. At 586, the phrase bear arms also had at the time of the founding an idiomatic meaning that was significantly different from its natural meaning, to serve as a soldier, do military service, fight, or to wage war but it unequivocally bore. That idiomatic meaning only when followed by the preposition against, emphasis deleted, citations and some internal quotation marks omitted. The amendment's use of the term keep in no way contradicts the military meaning conveyed by the phrase bear, arms and the amendment's preamble. To the contrary, a number of state militia laws in effect at the time of the Second Amendment's drafting use the term keep to describe. The requirement that militia members store their arms at their homes ready to be used for service when necessary. The Virginia military law, for example, ordered that every one of the said officers, non-commissioned officers and privates, shall constantly keep the aforesaid arms, accoutrements, and ammunition, ready to be produced whenever, called for by his commanding officer. Act for Regulating and Disciplining the Militia, 1785. Verit Acts Chiachi 1, Parava 3, Fordsur 2, 
emphasis added. The keep and bear arms thus perfectly describes the responsibilities of a framing era militia. Member. This reading is confirmed by the fact that the clause protects only one right, rather than two. It does not describe a right to keep arms and a separate right to bear arms. Rather, the single right that it does describe is both a duty and a right to have arms available and ready for military service and to use them for military purposes when necessary. A different language surely would have been used to protect non-military use and possession of weapons from regulation if such an intent had played any role in the drafting of the amendment. When each word in the text is given full effect, the amendment is most naturally read to secure to the people a right to use and possess arms in conjunction with service in a well-regulated militia, so far as appears no more than that was contemplated by its drafters or is encompassed within its terms. Even if the meaning of the text were genuinely susceptible to more than one interpretation, the burden would remain on those advocating a departure from the purpose identified in the preamble and from settled law to come forward with persuasive new arguments or evidence. The textual analysis offered by respondent and embraced by the court falls far short of sustaining that heavy burden. And the court's emphatic reliance on the claim that the Second Amendment codified a pre-existing right, anti, at 592, is of course beside the point because the right to keep and bear arms for service in a state militia was also a pre-existing right. Indeed, not a word in the constitutional text even arguably supports the court's overwrought and novel description of the Second Amendment as elevating above all other interests the right of law-abiding responsible citizens to use arms in defense of hearth and home, ante, at 635. 2. The proper allocation of military power in the new nation was an issue of central concern for the framers. The compromises they ultimately reached, reflected in Article I's Militia Clauses and the Second Amendment, represent quintessential examples of the framers splitting the atom of sovereignty. 15. Two themes relevant to our current interpretive task ran through the debates on the original Constitution. On the one hand, there was a widespread fear that a national standing army posed an intolerable threat to individual liberty and to the sovereignty of the separate states. Per peach verse. Department of Defense, 496 U.S. 334, 340, 1990. 16 Governor Edmund Randolph, reporting on the Constitutional Convention to the Virginia Ratification Convention, explained, With respect to a standing army, I believe there was not a member in the Federal Convention who did not feel indignation at such an institution. 3 J. Eliot, Debates in the Several State Conventions on the Adoption of the Federal Constitution, 401, 2 D.D.S. 1863, here and after Eliot. On the other hand, the framers recognized the dangers inherent in relying on inadequately trained militia members as the primary means of providing for the common defense, Perpish 496, U.S. at 340. During the Revolutionary War, Nakis force, though armed, was largely untrained, and its deficiencies were the subject of bitter complaint. Wiener, the Militia, Clause of the Constitution, 54 Harvard Morell, Reverend 181, 182, 1940. In order to respond to those twin concerns, a compromise was reached. Congress would be authorized to raise and support a National Army 18 and Navy, and also to organize, arm, discipline, and provide for the calling forth of the militia. U.S. Const. Art E. Paragraph 8, Citizen 1216. The President, at the same time, was empowered as the Commander in Chief of a the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. Art and Descent, Paragraph 2. But with respect to the militia, a significant reservation was made to the states. Although Congress would have the power to call forth and organize, arm, and discipline the militia as well as to govern, such part of them as may be employed in the service of the Yao, United States the states respectively would retain the right to appoint the officers and to train the militia in accordance with the discipline prescribed by Congress. Artem Barai, Parafoito Selemerdzisses, 20. But the original Constitution's retention of the militia and its creation of divided authority over that body did not prove sufficient to allay fears about the dangers posed by a standing army. For it was perceived by some that Article I contained a significant gap while it empowered Congress to 
organize, arm, and discipline the militia, it did not prevent Congress from providing for the militia's disarmament. As George Mason argued during the debates in Virginia on the ratification of the original Constitution, the militia may be here destroyed by that method, which has been practiced in other parts of the world before, that is, by rendering them useless, by disarming them. Under various pretenses, Congress may neglect to provide for arming and disciplining the militia, and the state governments cannot do it, for Congress has the exclusive right to arm them. 3 Elliot 379. This sentiment was echoed at a number of state ratification conventions. Indeed, it was one of the primary objections to the original Constitution voiced by its opponents. The Anti-Federalists were ultimately unsuccessful in persuading state ratification conventions to condition their approval of the Constitution upon the eventual inclusion of any particular amendment. But a number of states did propose to the first Federal Congress amendments reflecting a desire to ensure that the institution of the militia would remain protected under the new government. The proposed amendments sent by the states of Virginia, North Carolina, and New York focused on the importance of preserving the state militias and reiterated the dangers posed by standing armies. New Hampshire sent a proposal that differed significantly from the others. While also invoking the dangers of a standing army, it suggested that the Constitution should more broadly protect the use and possession of weapons, without tying such a guarantee expressly to the maintenance of the militia. The states of Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts sent no relevant proposed amendments to Congress, but in each of those states a minority of the delegates advocated related amendments, while the Maryland minority proposals were exclusively concerned with standing. Armies and conscientious objectors, the unsuccessful proposals in both Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, would have protected a more broadly worded right, less clearly tied to service in a state militia. Faced with all of these options, it is telling that James Madison chose to craft the Second Amendment as he did. The relevant proposals sent by the Virginia Ratifying Convention read as follows. Seventeenth, that the people have a right to keep and bear arms, that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state, that standing armies in time of peace are dangerous to liberty and therefore ought to be avoided as far as the circumstances and protection of the community will admit, and that in all cases the military should be under strict subordination to and be governed by the civil power, Eudetrius, at 659. Nineteenth, that any person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms ought to be exempted upon payment of an equivalent to employ another to bear arms in his stead. Ibid, North Carolina adopted Virginia's proposals and sent them to Congress as its own, although it did not actually ratify the original Constitution until Congress had sent the proposed Bill of Rights to the States for Ratification, 2 Schwartz 932, Sonsri 3. See the complete Bill of Rights, Sa 2 183, N. Kogan et al. 997, here and after Kogan. New York produced a proposal with nearly identical language. It read that the people have a right to keep and bear arms, that a well regulated militia, including the body of the people capable of bearing arms, is the proper natural and safe defense of a free state, that standing armies in time of peace are dangerous to liberty and ought not to be kept up except in cases of necessity, and that at all times the military should be kept under strict subordination to the civil power. 2. Schwartz 9 and 12. Notably, each of these proposals used the phrase keep and bear arms, which was eventually adopted by Madison, and each proposal embedded the phrase within a group of principles that are distinctly military in meaning. By contrast, New Hampshire's proposal, although it followed another proposed amendment that echoed the familiar Concern about standing armies described the protection involved in more clearly personal terms. Its proposal read, Twelfth, Congress shall never disarm any citizen unless such as are or have been in actual rebellion. Id, at 758-761. The proposals considered in the other three states, although ultimately rejected by their respective ratification conventions, are also relevant to our historical inquiry. First, the Maryland proposal, endorsed by a minority of the Delegates and later circulated in pamphlet form read, 4. That no standing army shall be kept up in time of peace, unless with the consent of two-thirds of the members present of each branch of Congress. O. Oh, 10. That no person conscientiously scrupulous of 
bearing arms in any case, shall be compelled personally to serve as a soldier. It will earn at 729, 735. The rejected Pennsylvania proposal, which was later incorporated into a critique of the Constitution, titled The Address and Reasons of Dissent of the Minority of the Convention of the State of Pennsylvania to Their Constituents, 1787, signed by a minority of the state's delegates, those who had voted against ratification of the Constitution, I.D. Wiles, at 628-662, read, 7. That the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and their own state, or the United States, or for the purpose of killing game, and no law, shall be passed for disarming the people or any of them, unless for crimes committed, or real danger of public, injury from individuals, and as standing armies in the time of peace are dangerous to liberty, they ought not to be kept up, and that the military shall be kept under, strict subordination to, and be governed by the civil powers. Id, at 665. Finally, after the delegates at the Massachusetts Ratification Convention had compiled a list of proposed amendments and alterations, a motion was made to add to the list the following language, that the said Constitution be never construed to authorize Congress to prevent the people of the United States, who are peaceable citizens from keeping their own arms. Kogan 181. This motion, however, failed to achieve the necessary support, and the proposal was excluded from the list of amendments the state sent to Congress. 2. Schwartz, 674, 675. Madison, charged with the task of assembling the proposals for amendments sent by the ratifying states, was the principal draftsman of the Second Amendment. He had, before him, or at the very least would have been aware of, all of these proposed formulations. In addition, Madison had been a member some years earlier of the committee tasked with drafting the Virginia Declaration of Rights. That committee considered a proposal by Thomas Jefferson that would have included within the Virginia Declaration the following language. No freeman shall ever be debarred the use of arms within his own lands or tenements. One Papers of Thomas Jefferson 363 J. Boyd, Edmund, 1950. But the committee rejected that language, adopting instead the provision, drafted by George Mason, 24, with all of these sources upon which to draw, it is strikingly significant that Madison's first draft omitted any mention of non-military use or possession of weapons. Rather, his original draft repeated the essence of the two proposed amendments sent by Virginia, combining the substance of the two provisions succinctly into one which read, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, a well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country. But no person religiously, scrupulous of bearing arms, shall be compelled to render military service in person. Kogan 169. Madison's decision to model the Second Amendment on the I, distinctly military Virginia proposal is therefore revealing, since it is clear that he considered and rejected formulations that would have unambiguously protected civilian uses of firearms. When Madison prepared his first draft, and when that draft was debated and modified, it is reasonable to assume that all participants in the drafting process were fully aware of the other formulations that would have protected civilian use and possession of weapons, and that their choice to craft the amendment as they did represented a rejection of those alternative formulations. Madison's initial inclusion of an exemption for conscientious objectors sheds revelatory light on the purpose of the amendment. It confirms an intent to describe a duty, as well as a right, and it unequivocally identifies the military character of both. The objections voiced to the conscientious objector clause only confirm the central meaning of the text. Although records of the debate in the Senate, which is where the conscientious objector clause was removed, do not survive, the arguments raised in the House illuminate the perceived problems with the clause. Specifically, there was concern that Congress can declare who are those religiously scrupulous, and prevent them from bearing. Arms. 25. The ultimate removal of the clause, therefore, only serves to confirm the purpose of the amendment to protect against congressional disarmament, by whatever means, of the state's militias. The court also contends that because Quakers opposed the use of arms not just for militia service, but for any violent purpose whatsoever. Ante at 590, the inclusion of a conscientious objector clause in the original draft of the amendment does not support the conclusion that the phrase bear arms was military in meaning, but that claim cannot be squared with the record. In the proposal cited, supra, 
At 656, both Virginia and North Carolina included the following language, that any person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms ought to be exempted upon payment of an equivalent to employ another to bear arms in his stead, emphasis added. There is no plausible argument that the use of bear arms in those provisions was not unequivocally and exclusively military. The state simply does not compel its citizens to carry arms for the purpose of private confrontation, ante at 584, or for self-defense. The history of the adoption of the amendment thus describes an overriding concern about the potential threat to state sovereignty that a federal standing army would pose, and a desire to protect the state's militias as the means by which to guard against that danger. But state militias could not effectively check the prospect of a federal standing army, so long as Congress retained the power to disarm them, and so a guarantee against such disarmament was needed. We explained in Miller, with obvious purpose to assure the I continuation and render possible the effectiveness of such forces, the declaration and guarantee of the Second Amendment were made. It must be interpreted and applied with that end in view. 307 U.S. at 178, the evidence plainly refutes the claim that the amendment was motivated by the framers' fears that Congress might act to regulate any civilian uses of weapons. And even if the historical record were genuinely ambiguous, the burden would remain on the parties advocating a change in the law to introduce facts or arguments newly ascertained. Vasquez, 474 U.S. at 266, the court is unable to identify any such facts or arguments. 3. Although it gives short shrift to the drafting history of the Second Amendment, the court dwells at length on four. Other sources, the 17th century English Bill of Rights, Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England, Post-Enactment Commentary on the Second Amendment, and Post-Civil, War Legislative History. All of these sources shed only indirect light on the question before us, and in any event offer little support for the court's conclusion. The court's reliance on Article 7 of the 1689 English. Bill of Rights, which, like most of the evidence offered by the court today, was considered in Miller 30 as misguided, both because Article 7 was enacted in response to different concerns from those that motivated the framers of the Second Amendment, and because the guarantees of the two provisions were by no means coextensive. Moreover, the English text contained no preamble or other provision identifying a narrow, militia-related purpose. The English Bill of Rights responded to abuses by the Stuart monarchs. Among the grievances set forth in the Bill of Rights was that the king had violated the law by causing several good subjects being Protestants to be disarmed at the same time when papists were both armed and employed, contrary to law. Elsewhere, the Declaration of Rights was 629, Aperfrion, p. 225, 1921. Article 7 of the Bill of Rights was a response to that selective disarmament. It guaranteed that the subjects which are Protestants may have arms for their defense, suitable to their condition and as allowed, by law. Idi key at 297. This grant did not establish a general right of all persons, or even of all Protestants, to possess weapons. Rather, the right was qualified in two distinct ways. First, it was restricted to those of adequate social and economic status, suitable to their condition. Second, it was only available subject to regulation by Parliament as allowed by law. The court may well be correct that the English Bill of Rights protected the right of some English subjects to use, some arms for personal self-defense, free from restrictions by the Crown, but not Parliament. But that right adopted in a different historical and political context and framed in markedly different language tells us little about the meaning of the Second Amendment. Blackstone's Commentaries The court's reliance on Blackstone's commentaries on the Laws of England is unpersuasive for the same reason as its reliance on the English Bill of Rights. Blackstone's invocation of the natural right of resistance and self-preservation, ante at 594, and those the right of having and using arms for self-preservation and defense, Bidowert referred specifically to Article 7 in the English Bill of Rights. The excerpt from Blackstone offered by the court, therefore, is like Article 7 itself, of limited use in interpreting the very differently worded and differently historically situated Second Amendment. What is important about Blackstone is the instruction he provided on reading the sort of text before us today. Blackstone described an interpretive approach that gave far more weight to preambles than the court allows. Counseling 
that at the fairest and most rational method to interpret the will of the legislator is by exploring his intentions at the time when the law was made, by signs the most natural and probable. Blackstone explained, If words happen to be still, dubious, we may establish their meaning from the context, with which it may be of singular use to compare a word, or a sentence, whenever they are ambiguous, equivocal, or intricate. Thus the prume or preamble is often called in to help the construction of an act of Parliament, whereas commentaries on the laws of England, 5960, 1765, in light of the Court's invocation of Blackstone as the preeminent authority on English law for the founding generation, ante, at 593-594, quoting Alden Ver's Main, 527 U.S. 706, 7 of 15, 1999. Its disregard for his guidance on matters of interpretation is striking. Post-enactment commentary, the court also excerpts, without any real analysis, commentary by a number of additional scholars, some near in time to the framing and others post-dating it by close to a century. Those scholars are for the most part of limited relevance in construing the guarantee of the Second Amendment. Their views are not altogether clear. They tended to collapse the Second Amendment with Article 7 of the English Bill of Rights, and they appear to have been unfamiliar with the drafting history of the Second Amendment. The most significant of these commentators was Joseph. Story, contrary to the Court's assertions, however, Story, actually supports the view that the amendment was designed to protect the right of each of the states to maintain a well-regulated militia. When Story used the term palladium in discussions of the Second Amendment, he merely echoed the concerns that animated the framers of the amendment and led to its adoption. An excerpt from his 1833, Commentaries on the Constitution of the United, states the same passage cited by the court in Miller 34, merits reproducing at some length. The importance of the Second Amendment will scarcely be doubted by any persons who have duly reflected upon the subject. The militia is the natural defense of a free country against sudden foreign invasions, domestic insurrections, and domestic usurpations of power by rulers. It is against sound policy for a free people to keep up large military establishments and standing armies in time of peace, both from the enormous expenses with which they are attended and the facile means which they afford to ambitious and unprincipled rulers to subvert the government or trample upon the rights of the people, the right of the citizens. To keep and bear arms has justly been considered as the palladium of the liberties of a republic since it offers a strong moral check against the usurpation and arbitrary power of rulers and will generally, even if these are successful in the first instance, enable the people to resist and triumph over them. And yet, though this truth would seem so clear and the importance of a well-regulated militia would seem so undeniable, it cannot be disguised that among the American people there is a growing indifference to any system of militia discipline and a strong disposition from a sense of its burdens to be rid of all regulations, how it is practicable to keep the people duly armed without some organization, it is difficult to see. There is certainly no small danger that indifference may lead to disgust and disgust to contempt and thus gradually undermine all the protection intended by the clause of our National Bill of Rights. 2J Story, Commentaries on the Constitution of the United States Purgopher 1897, P. Bree 620, 621, 4th or 1873. Footnote omitted. Story thus began by tying the significance of the amendment directly to the paramount importance of the militia. He then invoked the fear that drove the framers of the Second Amendment specifically, the threat to liberty posed by a standing army. An important check on that danger, he suggested, was a well-regulated militia ID at 621, 4, which he assumed that arms would have to be kept and, when necessary, borne. There is not so much as a whisper. In the passage above that story, believe that the right secured by the amendment bore any relation to private use or possession of weapons for activities like hunting or personal self-defense. After extolling the virtues of the militia as a bulwark against tyranny, story went on to decry the growing indifference to any system. Ibid, when he wrote, how it is practicable to keep the people duly armed. Without some organization, it is difficult to see. Ibid, he underscored the degree to which he viewed the arming of the people and the militia as indissolubly linked. Story warned that the growing indifference he perceived would gradually undermine all the protection intended by this clause of our National Bill of Rights, Ibid, in his view, the importance 
of the amendment was directly related to the continuing vitality of an institution in the process of apparently becoming obsolete. In an attempt to downplay the absence of any reference to non-military uses of weapons in Story's commentary, the court relies on the fact that Story characterized Article 7 of the English Declaration of Rights as a we similar provision, ante at 608. The two provisions were indeed similar, in that both protected some uses of firearms. But Story's characterization in no way suggests that he believed that the provisions had the same scope. To the contrary, Story's exclusive focus on the militia in his discussion of the Second Amendment confirms his understanding of the right protected by the Second Amendment as limited to military uses of arms. Story's writings as a justice of this court, to the extent that they shed light on this question, only confirm that Justice Story did not view the amendment as conferring upon individuals any self-defense right disconnected from service in a state militia. Justice Story dissented from the court's decision in Houston v. Moore 5 Wheat, 1 24, 1820, which held that a state court had a concurrent jurisdiction with the federal courts to try a militia man who had disobeyed the call of the president and to enforce the laws of Congress against such delinquent Idir at 32. Justice, Story believed that Congress's power to provide for the organizing, arming, and disciplining of the militia was when Congress acted plenary, but he explained that in the absence of congressional action, I am certainly not prepared to deny the legitimacy of such an exercise of state authority. It, at 52. As to the Second Amendment, he wrote that it may not perhaps be thought to have any important bearing on this point. If it have, it confirms and illustrates rather than impugns the reasoning already suggested. Ades at 52-53. The court contends that had Justice Story understood the amendment to have a militia purpose, the amendment would have had enormous and obvious bearing on the point. Ante at 6 on 10. But the court has it quite backwards. If Story had believed that the purpose of the amendment was to permit civilians to keep firearms for activities, like personal self-defense, what confirmation and illustratin. Houston, five wheat. At 53, could the amendment possibly have provided for the point that states retain the power to organize, arm, and discipline their own militias? Post-Civil War legislative history. The court suggests that by the post-Civil War period, the Second Amendment was understood to secure a right to firearm use and ownership for purely private purposes like personal self-defense. While it is true that some of the legislative history on which the court relies supports that contention, Ciante, at 614-616, such sources are entitled to limited, if any, weight. All of the statements the court cites were made long after the framing of the amendment and cannot possibly supply any insight into the intent of the framers. And all were made during pitched political debates, so that they are better characterized as advocacy than good-faith attempts at constitutional interpretation. What is more, much of the evidence the court offers is decidedly less clear than its discussion allows. The court notes, blacks were routinely disarmed by southern states after the Civil War. Those who opposed these injustices frequently stated that they infringed blacks' constitutional right to keep and bear arms. Ante, at 614. The court hastily concludes that, needless to say, the claim was not that blacks were being prohibited from carrying arms in an organized state militia, E by D. But some of the claims of the sort the court cites may have been just that. In some southern states, Reconstruction-era Republican governments created state militias in which both blacks and whites were permitted to serve. Because with the decision to allow blacks to serve alongside whites meant that most southerners refused to join the new militia, the bodies were dubbed Negro Militias. Nanine. Cornell. A well-regulated militia, 177, 2006. The arming of the Negro militias met with especially fierce resistance in South Carolina. The sight of organized, armed freedmen incensed opponents of Reconstruction and led to an intensified campaign of Klan terror. Leading members of the Negro militia were beaten or lynched, and their weapons stolen. Idoniscors, at 176, 177. One particularly chilling account of Reconstruction-era Klan violence directed at a black militia member is recounted in the memoir of Louis F. Post, a carpetbagger in South Carolina, 10 Journal of Negro History, 10, 1925. Post describes the murder by local Klan members of Jim Williams, the captain of a Negro militia company, EDU at 59 this way. 
A cavalcade of sixty cowardly white men, completely disguised with face masks and body gowns, rode up one night in March, 1871, to the house of Captain Williams. In the wood, they hanged and shot him, and on his body they then pinned a slip of paper inscribed, as I remember it, with these grim words, Jim Williams gone to his last muster. Id. At 61. In light of this evidence, it is quite possible that at least some of the statements on which the court relies actually did mean to refer to the disarmament of black militia members. V. The brilliance of the debates that resulted in the Second Amendment faded into oblivion during the ensuing years. For the concerns about Article I's militia clauses that generated such pitched debate during the ratification process and led to the adoption of the Second Amendment were short-lived. In 1792, the year after the amendment was ratified, Congress passed a statute that purported to establish an uniform militia throughout the United States. Hornstat, 271. The statute commanded every able-bodied white male citizen between the ages of 18 and 45 to be enrolled therein and to provide himself with a good musket or firelock and other specified weaponry. Ibid. The statute is significant, for it confirmed the way those in the founding generation viewed firearm ownership as a duty linked to military service. The statute they enacted, however, was virtually ignored for more than a century and was finally repealed in 1901. See Per Peach, 496 U.S. at 341. The post-ratification history of the Second Amendment is strikingly similar. The amendment played little role in any legislative debate about the civilian use of firearms for most of the 19th century, and it made few appearances in the decisions of this court. Two 19th century cases, however, bear mentioning. In United States v. Cruikshank, 92U, S. 542, 1876, the court sustained a challenge to respondents' convictions under the Enforcement Act of 1870 for conspiring to deprive any individual of any right or privilege granted or secured to him by the Constitution or laws of the United States. Dar at 5 and 48. The court wrote as to counts 2 and 10 of respondents' indictment. The right there specified is that of bearing arms for a lawful purpose. This is not a right granted by the Constitution. Neither is it in any manner dependent on that instrument for its existence. The Second Amendment declares that it shall not be infringed, but this, as has been seen, means no more than that it shall not be infringed by Congress. This is one of the amendments that has no other effect than to restrict the powers of the national government. Idurate cars at 5 and 53. The majority's assertion that the court in Cruikshank described the right protected by the Second Amendment as sorcerer, bearing arms for a lawful purpose. Anti at 620, quoting Cruikshank 92 U.S. at 553, is not accurate. The Cruikshank court explained that the defective indictment contained such language, but the court did not itself describe the right or endorse the indictment's description of the right. Moreover, it is entirely possible that the basis for the indictments counts 2 and 10, which charged respondents with depriving the victims of rights secured by the Second Amendment, was the prosecutor's belief that the victims' members of a group of citizens, mostly black but also white, who were rounded up by the sheriff, sworn in as a posse to defend the local courthouse and attacked by a white mob, bore sufficient resemblance to members of a state militia that they were brought within the reach of the Second Amendment. See generally C. Lane, The Day Freedom Died, The Colfax Massacre, The Supreme Court, and The Betrayal of Reconstruction, 2008. Only one other 19th century case in this court, Presser v. Illinois 116U, S. 52, 1886, engaged in any significant discussion of the Second Amendment. The petitioner and presser was convicted of violating a state statute that prohibited organizations other than the Illinois National Guard from associating together as military companies or parading with arms. Presser challenged his conviction, asserting as relevant that the statute violated both the Second and the Fourteenth Amendments. With respect to the Second Amendment, the court wrote, We think it clear that the sections under consideration, which only forbid bodies of men to associate together as military organizations, or to drill or parade with arms in cities and towns, unless authorized by law, do not infringe the right of the people to keep and bear arms. But a conclusive answer to the contention that this amendment prohibits the legislation in question lies in the fact that the amendment is a limitation only upon the power of Congress and the national government 
and not upon that of the states. Idimer, at 264-265. And in discussing the Fourteenth Amendment, the court explained, The plaintiff in error was not a member of the organized volunteer militia of the state of Illinois, nor did he belong to the troops of the United States or to any organization under the militia law of the United States. On the contrary, the fact that he did not belong to the organized militia or the troops of the United States was an ingredient in the offense for which he was convicted and sentenced. The question is, therefore, had he a right as a citizen of the United States, in disobedience of the state law, to associate with others as a military company and to drill and parade with arms in the towns and cities of the state? If the plaintiff in error has any such privilege, he must be able to point to the provision of the Constitution or statutes of the United States by which it is conferred. Idiobarka 266. Presser, therefore, both affirmed Cruikshank's holding that the Second Amendment posed no obstacle to regulation by state governments and suggested that in any event, nothing in the Constitution protected the use of arms outside the context of a militia authorized by law and organized by the state or federal government. In 1901, the president revitalized the militia by creating the National Guard of the several states. Perpich, 496U. Listen at 341. And in an 9 to 10. Meanwhile, the dominant understanding of the Second Amendment's inapplicability to private gun ownership continued well into the 20th century. The first two federal laws directly restricting civilian use and possession of firearms, the 1927 Act prohibiting mail delivery of pistols, revolvers, and other firearms capable of being concealed on the person, Ch. 7544 Stat. 1059, and the 1934 Act, prohibiting the possession of sawed-off shotguns and machine guns, were enacted over minor Second Amendment objections dismissed by the vast majority of the legislators who participated in the debates. Members of Congress clashed over the wisdom and efficacy of such laws as crime control measures. But since the statutes did not infringe upon the military use or possession of weapons, for most legislators, they did not even raise the specter of possible conflict with the Second Amendment. Thus, for most of our history, the invalidity of Second Amendment-based objections to firearms regulations has been well settled and uncontroversial. Indeed, the Second Amendment was not even mentioned in either full House of Congress during the legislative proceedings that led to the passage of the 1934 Act. Yet enforcement of that law produced the judicial decision that confirmed the status of the amendment as limited in reach to military usage. After reviewing many of the same sources that are discussed at greater length by the court today, the Miller Court unanimously concluded that the Second Amendment did not apply to the possession of a firearm that did not have some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia. 307U. This is about 178. The key to that decision did not, as the court belatedly suggests anti, at 622-625, turn on the difference between muskets and sawed-off shotguns, it turned, rather, on the basic difference between the military and non-military use and possession of guns. Indeed, if the Second Amendment were not limited in its coverage to military uses of weapons, why should the court in Miller have suggested that some weapons but not others were eligible for Second Amendment protection? If use for self-defense were the relevant standard, why did the court not inquire into the suitability of a particular weapon for self-defense purposes? Perhaps in recognition of the weakness of its attempt to distinguish Miller, the court argues in the alternative that Miller should be discounted because of its decisional history. It is true that the appellees in Miller did not file a brief or make an appearance, although the court below had held that the relevant provision of the National Firearms Act violated the Second Amendment, albeit without any reasoned opinion. But, as our decision in Marbury v. Madison, 1st Cranch 137, in which only one side appeared and presented arguments, demonstrates, the absence of adversarial presentation alone is not a basis for refusing to accord stare decisis effect to a decision of this court. See Block Marbury Redux in Arguing Marbury v. Madison 59, 63, M. Tushnet, ed. 2005. Of course, if it can be demonstrated that new evidence or arguments were genuinely not available to an earlier court, that fact should be given special weight as we consider whether to overrule a prior case. But the court does not make that claim, because it cannot. Although it is true that the drafting history of the amendment was not discussed in the government's brief, Siante, at 623-624, it is certainly not the drafting history that the court's decision today turns on, and those sources upon which the court today relies most heavily were available to the Miller Court. The government cited the English Bill of Rights and quoted a lengthy passage from Amet Ver's State, 
21st Tenero 154, 1840, detailing the history leading to the English guarantee, brief for United States and United States v. Miller, O.T., 1938, No. 696, P.P.M. 1213, it also cited Blackstone ID 4 at 9N, 2 Cooley, I'd, at 1215 and Story IDs at 15. The court is reduced to critiquing the number of pages the government devoted to exploring the English legal sources, only two in a brief 21 pages in length. Would the court be satisfied with four? Ten? The court is simply wrong when it intones that Miller contained not a word about the amendment's history, ante, at 624. The court plainly looked to history to construe the term militia, and on the best reading of Miller, the entire guarantee of the Second Amendment. After noting the original Constitution's grant of power to Congress and to the states over the militia, the court explained, With obvious purpose to assure the continuation and render possible the effectiveness of such forces, the declaration and guarantee of the Second Amendment were made. It must be interpreted and applied with that end in view. The militia, which the states were expected to maintain and train, is set in contrast with troops which they were forbidden to keep without the consent of Congress. The sentiment of the time strongly disfavored standing armies. The common view was that adequate defense of country and laws could be secured through the militia civilians primarily, soldiers on occasion. The signification attributed to the term militia appears from the debates in the convention, the history and legislation of colonies and states, and the writings of approved commentators. Miller, 307 U.S., at 178, 179. The majority cannot seriously believe that the Miller court did not consider any relevant evidence. The majority simply does not approve of the conclusion the Miller court reached on that evidence. Standing alone, that is insufficient reason to disregard a unanimous opinion of this court, upon which substantial reliance has been placed by legislators and citizens for nearly 70 years. Steve. The court concludes its opinion by declaring that it is not the proper role of this court to change the meaning of rights enshrined in the Constitution. Ante at 636. But the right the court announces was not enshrined in the Second Amendment by the framers. It is the product of today's law changing decision. The majority's exegesis has utterly failed to establish that as a matter of text or history, the right of law-abiding, responsible citizens to use arms in defense of hearth and home is elevate above all other interests by the Second Amendment. Ante at 635. Until today, it has been understood that legislatures may regulate the civilian use and misuse of firearms so long as they do not interfere with the preservation of a well-regulated militia. The court's announcement of a new constitutional right to own and use firearms for private purposes upsets that settled understanding, but leaves for future cases the formidable task of defining the scope of permissible regulations. Today, judicial craftsmen have confidently asserted that a policy choice that denies a law-abiding, responsible citizens the right to keep and use weapons in the home for self-defense is off the table. Ante at 636. Given the presumption that most citizens are law-abiding, and the reality that the need to defend oneself may suddenly arise in a host of locations outside the home, I fear that the district's policy choice may well be just the first of an unknown number of dominoes to be knocked off. The table. I do not know whether today's decision will increase the labor of federal judges to the breaking point envisioned by Justice Cardozo, but it will surely give rise to a far more active judicial role in making vitally important national policy decisions than was envisioned at any time in the 18th, 19th, or 20th centuries. The court properly disclaims any interest in evaluating the wisdom of the specific policy choice challenged in this case, but it fails to pay heed to a far more important policy choice, the choice made by the framers themselves. The court would have us believe that over 200 years ago, the framers made a choice to limit the tools available to elected officials wishing to regulate civilian uses of weapons, and to authorize this court to use the common law process of case-by-case -case judicial lawmaking to define the contours of acceptable gun control policy. Absent compelling evidence that is nowhere to be found in the court's opinion, I could not possibly conclude that the framers made such a choice. For these reasons, I respectfully dissent. Justice Breyer, with whom Justice Stevens, Justice Souter, and Justice Ginsburg join, dissenting. We must decide whether a District of Columbia law that prohibits the possession of handguns in the home violates the Second Amendment. The court, relying upon its view that the Second Amendment seeks to protect a right of personal self-defense, holds that this law violates that amendment. In my view, it does not.
I... The majority's conclusion is wrong for two independent reasons. The first reason is that set forth by Justice Stevens, namely, that the Second Amendment protects militia-related, not self-defense-related interests. These two interests are sometimes intertwined. To assure 18th-century citizens that they could keep arms for militia purposes would necessarily have allowed them to keep arms that they could have used for self-defense as well. But self-defense alone, detached from any militia-related objective, is not the amendment's concern. The second independent reason is that the protection the amendment provides is not absolute. The amendment permits government to regulate the interests that it serves. Thus, irrespective of what those interests are, whether they do or do not include an independent interest in self-defense, the majority's view cannot be correct unless it can show that the district's regulation is unreasonable or inappropriate in Second Amendment terms. This the majority cannot do. In respect to the first independent reason, I agree with Justice Stevens and I join his opinion. In this opinion, I shall focus upon the second reason. I shall show that the district's law is consistent with the Second Amendment even if that amendment is interpreted as protecting a wholly separate interest in individual self-defense. That is so because the district's regulation, which focuses upon the presence of handguns in high-crime urban areas, represents a permissible legislative response to a serious, indeed life-threatening problem. Thus I here assume that one objective, but as the majority concedes, anti at 599, not the primary objective, of those who wrote the Second Amendment was to help assure citizens that they would have arms available for purposes of self-defense. Even so, a legislature could reasonably conclude that the law will advance goals of great public importance, namely, saving lives, preventing injury, and reducing crime. The law is tailored to the urban crime problem in that it is local in scope, and thus affects only a geographic area both limited in size and entirely urban. The law concerns handguns, which are specially linked to urban gun deaths and injuries, and which are the overwhelmingly favorite weapon of armed criminals. And at the same time, the law imposes a burden upon gun owners that seems proportionately no greater than restrictions in existence at the time the Second Amendment was adopted. In these circumstances, the district's law falls within the zone that the Second Amendment leaves open to regulation by legislatures. The Second Amendment says, A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. In interpreting and applying this amendment, I take as a starting point the following four propositions, based on our precedent and today's opinions, to which I believe the entire court subscribes. 1. The amendment protects an individual righty eye. E. One that is separately possessed and may be separately enforced by each person on whom it is conferred. C. E. G. Ante at 595, opinion of the court. Ante at 636, Stevens, J. Dissenting. 2. As evidenced by its preamble, the amendment was adopted with obvious purpose to assure the continuation and render possible the effectiveness of militia forces. United States v. Miller, 307 U.S. 174, 178, 1939. See Ante at 599, opinion of the court. Ante at 637, Stevens J. Dissenting. 3. The amendment must be interpreted and applied with that end in view. Miller Supra at 178. 4. The right protected by the Second Amendment is not absolute, but instead is subject to government regulation. See Robertson v. Baldwin, 165 U.S. 275, 281, 282, 1897, Ante at 595, 626, 627, Opinion of the Court. My approach to this case, while involving the first three points, primarily concerns the fourth. I shall, as I said, assume with the majority that the amendment, in addition to furthering a militia-related purpose, also furthers an interest in possessing guns for purposes of self-defense, at least to some degree. And I shall then ask whether the amendment nevertheless permits the district handgun restriction at issue here. Although I adopt for present purposes the majority's position that the Second Amendment embodies a general concern about self-defense, I shall not assume that the amendment contains a specific, untouchable right to keep guns in the house to shoot burglars. The majority, which presents evidence in favor of the former proposition, does not, because it cannot, convincingly show that the Second Amendment seeks to maintain the latter in pristine, unregulated form. 
To the contrary, colonial history itself offers important examples of the kinds of gun regulation that citizens would then have thought compatible with the right to keep and bear arms, whether embodied in federal or state constitutions or the background common law. And those examples include substantial regulation of firearms in urban areas, including regulations that imposed obstacles to the use of firearms for the protection of the home. Boston, Philadelphia, and New York City, the three largest cities in America during that period, all restricted the firing of guns within city limits to at least some degree. See Churchill, Gun Regulation, The Police Power, and the Right to Keep Arms in Early America, 25 Law and Hist. Reverend 139, 162, 2007, Depth of Commerce, Bureau of Census, C. Gibson, Population of the 100 Largest Cities and Other Urban Places in the United States, 1790 to 1990, 1998, Table 2, online at http, www census.gov, population, www, documentation, TWPA027, tab 2.txt, all internet materials as visited June 19, 2008, and available in Clerk of Court's case file. Boston in 1746 had a law prohibiting the discharge of any gun or pistol charged with shot or ball in the town on penalty of 40 shillings, a law that was later revived in 1778. See Act of May 28th, 1746, G.H. X. Acts and Laws of Mass. Bay Pi 208, an act for reviving and continuing sundry laws that are expired and near expiring 1778 Mass. Sess. Laws. Chaw. V.P.P. 193, 194. Philadelphia prohibited, on penalty of five shillings, or two days in jail if the fine were not paid, firing a gun or setting off fireworks in Philadelphia without a governor's special license. C. Act of Aug. 26, 1721, paragraph 4, in 3rd Stat. At large of PA, 253-254, J. Mitchell and H. Flanders Commerce, 1896, and New York City banned, on penalty of a 20-shilling fine, the firing of guns, even in houses, for the three days surrounding New Year's Day. Five Colonial Laws of New York, Shiach. 1501, pp. 244-246, 1894. See also an act to suppress the disorderly practice of firing guns and see, on the times therein mentioned, 1774, in 8th stat, at large of PA 410-412, 1902, similar law for all inhabited parts of Pennsylvania. See also an act for preventing mischief being done in the town of Newport, or in any other town in this government, 1731 Rhode Island Session Laws PP 240-241, prohibiting on penalty of five shillings for a first offense and more for subsequent offenses the firing of any gun or pistol in the s streets of any of the towns of this government or in any tavern of the same after dark on any night whatsoever furthermore several towns and cities including philadelphia new york and boston regulated for fire safety reasons the storage of gunpowder a necessary component of an operational firearm see cornell and didino a well-regulated right, 73 Ford. Clare Venner 427, Thinian de Fimiento 12, 2004. Boston's law in particular impacted the use of firearms in the home very much as the district's law does today. Boston's gunpowder law imposed a $10 fine upon any person who shall take into any dwelling house, stable, barn, outhouse, warehouse, store, shop, or other building within the town of Boston any firearm loaded with or having gunpowder. An act in addition to the several acts already made for the prudent storage of gunpowder within the town of Boston, East H. 3, 1783 Mass, Acts PP 218-219. See also once. Johnson, A Dictionary of the English Language 751, 4th Edirm 1773, defining firearms as arms which owe their efficacy to fire, guns. Even assuming, as the majority does, Cianti, at 631-632, that this law included an implicit self-defense exception, it would nevertheless have prevented a homeowner from keeping in his home a gun that he could immediately pick up and use against an intruder. Rather, the homeowner would have had to get the gunpowder and load it into the gun, an operation that would have taken a fair amount of time to perform. See Hicks, United States Military Shoulder Arms, 1795-1935, Worst Journal of AM. Military Hist, Foundation 23, 30, 1937. 
experienced soldier could with specially prepared cartridges, as opposed to plain gunpowder and ball, load and fire musket three to four times per minute. ID, set 2630, describing the loading process. See also Grance, The Craft of the Early American Gunsmith, 6 Metropolitan Museum of Art Bulletin, 54, 60, 1947, noting that rifles were slower to load and fire than muskets. Moreover, the law would, as a practical matter, have prohibited the carrying of loaded firearms anywhere in the city, unless the carrier had no plans to enter any building or was willing to unload or discard his weapons before going inside. And Massachusetts residents must have believed this kind of law compatible with the provision in the Massachusetts Constitution that granted the people a right to keep and to bear arms for the common defense, a provision that the majority says was interpreted as securing an individual right to bear arms for defensive purposes. Art, 17, 1780, in through the federal and state constitutions, colonial charters, and other organic laws, 1888, 1892, F. Thorpe Edwards, 1909, herein after Thorpe. Ante, at 602, opinion of the court. The New York City law, which required that gunpowder in the home be stored in certain sorts of containers, and laws in certain Pennsylvania towns, which required that gunpowder be stored on the highest story of the home, could well have presented similar obstacles to in-home use of firearms. See Act of April 13, 1784, J. 28, 1784, N. Y. Laws P. 627, an act for erecting the town of Carlisle in the county of Cumberland into a borough, ch. Cotterie, Dree Sedante Doispa. Laws P. 49, an act for erecting the town of Reading in the county of Berks into a borough, ch. Fus V. Bargrachelitius Ante Trispa. Laws P. 211. Although it is unclear whether these laws, like the Boston law, would have prohibited the storage of gunpowder inside a firearm, they would at the very least have made it difficult to reload the gun to fire a second shot, unless the homeowner happened to be in the portion of the house where the extra gunpowder was required to be kept. C7 United States Encyclopedia of History, 1297, P. Ozer in 1967, until 1835, all small arms were single-shot weapons, requiring reloading by hand after every shot. And Pennsylvania, like Massachusetts, had at the time one of the self-defense guaranteeing state constitutional provisions on which the majority relies. See Ante, at 601, citing Pesha Declaration of Rights, paragraph 3, 1776, and 5 Thorpe, 3083. The majority criticizes my citation of these colonial laws. See Ante at 631-634. But as much as it tries, it cannot ignore their existence. I suppose it is possible that, as the majority suggests, see Ante at 631-633, they all in practice contained self-defense exceptions, but none of them expressly provided one, and the majority's assumption that such exceptions existed relies largely on the preambles to these acts, an interpretive methodology that it elsewhere roundly derides. Compare Ante at 631-632, interpreting 18th century statutes in light of their preambles, with Ante at 578 and N. Threes, contending that the operative language of an 18th century enactment may extend beyond its preamble. And in any event, as I have shown, the gunpowder storage laws would have burdened armed self-defense even if they did not completely prohibit it. This historical evidence demonstrates that a self-defense assumption is the beginning, rather than the end, of any constitutional inquiry. That the district law impacts self-defense merely raises questions about the law's constitutionality. But to answer the questions that are raised, that is to see whether the statute is unconstitutional, requires us to focus on practicalities, the statute's rationale, the problems that called it into being, its relation to those objectives, in a word, the details. There are no purely logical or conceptual answers to such questions, all of which to say that to raise a self-defense question is not to answer it. 3. I therefore begin by asking a process-based question. How is a court to determine whether a particular firearm regulation, here, the district's restriction on handguns, is consistent with the Second Amendment? What kind of constitutional standard should the court use? How high a protective hurdle does the amendment erect? The question matters. The majority is wrong when it says that the district's law is unconstitutional, under any of the standards of scrutiny that we have applied to enumerated constitutional rights. Ante, at 628. How could that be? 
It certainly would not be unconstitutional under, for example, a rational basis standard, which requires a court to uphold regulation so long as it bears a rational relationship to a legitimate governmental purpose. Heller v. Doe, 509 U.S. 312, 320, 1993. The law at issue here, which in part seeks to prevent gun-related accidents, at least bears a rational relationship to that legitimate life-saving objective. And nothing in the three 19th century state cases to which the majority turns for support mandates the conclusion that the present district law must fall. See Andrews v. State, 50 Tenna, 165, 177, 186 to 187, 192, 1871, striking down as violating a state constitutional provision adopted in 1870, a statewide ban on carrying a broad class of weapons, insofar as it applied to revolvers. Nunn v. State, 1 Gay, 243, 246, 250, 251, 1846, striking down similarly broad ban on openly carrying weapons, based on erroneous view that the Federal Second Amendment applied to the states. State v. Reed, 1st Allah 612, 614, 615, 622, 1840, upholding a concealed weapon ban against a state constitutional challenge. These cases were decided well, 80, 55, and 49 years respectively, after the framing. They neither claim nor provide any special insight into the intent of the framers. They involve laws much less narrowly tailored than the one before us and state cases in any event are not determinative of federal constitutional questions. C.E.G. Garcia v. San Antonio Metropolitan Transit Authority, 469, U.S. 528, 549, 1985, citing Martin v. Hunter's Lessee, Wurwiet, 304, 1816. Respondent proposes that the court adopt a strict scrutiny test, which would require reviewing with care each gun law to determine whether it is narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling governmental interest. Abrams v. Johnson, 521 U. S. 7482, 1997, see brief for respondent 5462. But the majority implicitly and appropriately rejects that suggestion by broadly approving a set of laws prohibitions on concealed weapons, forfeiture by criminals of the Second Amendment right, prohibitions on firearms in certain locales, and governmental regulation of commercial firearm sales, whose constitutionality under a strict scrutiny standard would be far from clear. See Ante at 626-627. Indeed, adoption of a true strict scrutiny standard for evaluating gun regulations would be impossible. That is because almost every gun control regulation will seek to advance, as the one here does, a primary concern of every government, a concern for the safety and indeed the lives of its citizens. United States v. Salerno, 481 U. S. Soda 39, 755 of 937. The court has deemed that interest, as well as the government's general interest in preventing crime, to be compelling CID at 750, 754. And the court has, in a wide variety of constitutional contexts, found such public safety concerns sufficiently forceful to justify restrictions on individual liberties. C.E. G. Brandenburg v. Ohio, 395 U. S. 4044-4047-1969, per curium. First Amendment free speech rights? Sherbert v. Verner, 374 U. S. 398-403-1963, First Amendment religious rights. Brigham City v. Stewart, 547 U. S. 98-403-404-2006, Fourth Amendment protection of the home. New York v. Quarles, 467 U. S. 649, 655, 1984. Fifth Amendment rights under Miranda v. Arizona, 384 U. S. 436, 1966. Salerno Supra, at 755, Eighth Amendment bail rights. Thus, any attempt in theory to apply strict scrutiny to gun regulations will in practice turn into an interest-balancing inquiry, with the interests protected by the Second Amendment on one side and the governmental public safety concerns on the other. The only question being whether the regulation at issue impermissibly burdens the former in the course of advancing the latter. I would simply adopt such an interest-balancing inquiry explicitly. The fact that important interests lie on both sides of the constitutional equation suggests that review of gun control regulation is not a context in which a court should effectively presume either constitutionality, as in rational basis review, or unconstitutionality, as in strict scrutiny. Rather, 
where a law significantly implicates competing constitutionally protected interests in complex ways. The court generally asks whether the statute burdens a protected interest in a way or to an extent that is out of proportion to the statute's salutary effects upon other important governmental interests. See Nixon v. Shrink Missouri Government PAC, 528U, S. 377, 402, 2000, Breyer J. Concurring. Any answer would take account both of the statute's effects upon the competing interests and the existence of any clearly superior, less restrictive alternative. See Ibid. Contrary to the majority's unsupported suggestion that this sort of proportionality approach is unprecedented, see Ante at 634, the court has applied it in various constitutional contexts, including election law cases, speech cases, and due process cases. See 528U. S at 403, citing examples where the court has taken such an approach. See also A. G. Thompson v. Western States Medical Center, 535U. S. 357, 388, 2002. Breyer, J. Dissenting, Commercial Speech. Burdick v. Takushi, 504U. S. 428, 433, 1992. Election Regulation. Matthews v. Eldridge, 424 U. S. 319, 339, 349, 1976. Procedural Due Process. Pickering Virus Board of Ed. Of Township High School Dist. 205, Will Seedy, 391 U. S. 3, 568, 1968. Government Employee Speech. In applying this kind of standard, the court normally defers to a legislature's empirical judgment in matters where a legislature is likely to have greater expertise and greater institutional fact-finding capacity. See Turner Broadcasting System, Inc. v. FCC 520U. S. Forms ED 195-196, 1997. See also Nixon Supra at 403, Breyer J. Concurring. Nonetheless, a court, not a legislature, must make the ultimate constitutional conclusion exercising its independent judicial judgment in light of the whole record to determine whether a law exceeds constitutional boundaries. Randall v. Sorrell, 548 U. S. 230, 249, 2006. Opinion of Breyer J. Citing Bose Corpter v. Consumers Union of United States in Keir, 466 U.S. 485, 499, 1984. The above-described approach seems preferable to a more rigid approach here for a further reason. Experience as much as logic has led the court to decide that in one area of constitutional law or another, the interests are likely to prove stronger on one side of a typical constitutional case than on the other. C.E. G. United States v. Virginia, 518U. S. 15. 531, 534, 1996. Applying heightened scrutiny to gender-based classifications based upon experience with prior cases. Williamson v. Lee Optical of Okla, Inc., 348 U. S. 483, 488, 1955. Applying rational basis scrutiny to economic legislation based upon experience with prior cases. Here we have little prior experience. Courts that do have experience in these matters have uniformly taken an approach that treats empirically based legislative judgment with a degree of deference. C. Winkler, Scrutinizing the Second Amendment, 105 Mish. L. Reverend says his 83. 687, 716, 718, 2007. Describing hundreds of gun law decisions issued in the last half century by Supreme Courts in 42 states, which courts with surprisingly little variation have adopted a standard more deferential than strict scrutiny. While these state cases obviously are not controlling, they are instructive. C.F. A. Jean Bartkus v. Illinois, 359 U. S. Flint 1, 134, 1959 looking to the experience of state courts as informative of a constitutional question, and they thus provide some comfort regarding the practical wisdom of following the approach that I believe our constitutional precedent would in any event suggest. I've... The present suit involves challenges to three separate district firearm restrictions. The first requires a license from the district's chief of police in order to carry a pistol. I... E. A handgun anywhere in the district. CDC Code, Paragraph 22, 4504A, 2001. See also, per our 22 4501A, 224506. Because the district assures us that respondent could obtain such a license so long as he meets the statutory eligibility criteria, and because respondent concedes that those criteria are facially constitutional, I, like the majority, 
see no need to address the constitutionality of the licensing requirement. See ante at 636.31, the second district restriction requires that the lawful owner of a firearm keep his weapon unloaded and disassembled or bound by a trigger lock or similar device, unless it is kept at his place of business or being used for lawful recreational purposes. See paragraph 7.27.02. The only dispute regarding this provision appears to be whether the Constitution requires an exception that would allow someone to render a firearm operational when necessary for self-defense, i.e., that the firearm may be operated under circumstances where the common law would normally permit a self-defense justification in defense against a criminal charge. See Parker v. District of Columbia, 478 F, 3D 370, 401, 2007, case below, ante, at 6.30, opinion of the court. Brief for Respondent 52.54. The district concedes that such an exception exists. See brief for petitioners. 56.57. This court has final authority, albeit not often used, to definitively interpret district law, which is, after all, simply a species of federal law. C. E. G. Whalenver, United States, 445 U. S. 684, 687, 688, 1980. See also Griffin ver United States, 336 U. S. 704, 760, 78, 949. And because I see nothing in the district law that would preclude the existence of a background common law self-defense exception, I would avoid the constitutional question by interpreting the statute to include it. See Ashwander v. TVA, 297 U. S. 1936, Brandeis Ja concurring. I am puzzled by the majority's unwillingness to adopt a similar approach. It readily reads unspoken self-defense exceptions into every colonial law, but it refuses to accept the district's concession that this law has one. Compare Ante at 631-633 with Ante at 630. The one district case it cites to support that refusal, McIntosh v. Washington, 395A, 2D744-755-756-1978. Merely concludes that the district legislature had a rational basis for applying the trigger lock law in homes, but not in places of business. Nowhere does that case say that the statute precludes a self defense exception of the sort that I have just described. And even if it did, we are not bound by a lower court's interpretation of federal law. The third district restriction prohibits, in most cases, the registration of a handgun within the district. See by Ref Septa. Duty finds it to do as you do a Keter. Because registration is a prerequisite to firearm possession, see paragraph 72502.01a, the effect of this provision is generally to prevent people in the district from possessing handguns. In determining whether this regulation violates the Second Amendment, I shall ask how the statute seeks to further the governmental interests that it serves, how the statute burdens the interests that the Second Amendment seeks to protect, and whether there are practical less burdensome ways of furthering those interests. The ultimate question is whether the statute imposes burdens that, when viewed in light of the statute's legitimate objectives, are disproportionate. C. Nixon, 528 U. S. at 402. Breyer J. Concurring. No one doubts the constitutional importance of the statute's basic objective, saving lives. C. E. G. Salerno 421 U. S. at 755. But there is considerable debate about whether the district's statute helps to achieve that objective. I begin by reviewing the statute's tendency to secure that objective from the perspective of 1. The legislature, namely, the Council of the District of Columbia, here and after Council, that enacted the statute in 1976, and 2. A court that seeks to evaluate the Council's decision today. E. First, consider the facts as the legislature saw them when it adopted the district statute. As stated by the local council committee that recommended its adoption, the major substantive goal of the district's handgun restriction is to reduce the potentiality for gun-related crimes and gun-related deaths from occurring within the District of Columbia. Firearms Control Regulations Act of 1975, Council Act No. 1142, Hearing and Disposition Before the House Committee on the District of Columbia, 94th Kong, Kudses and Otters on H. Con. Restsaisen of A4, sir. Now 94 to 24, Pyre 25, 1976, here and after D.C. Repetors. Reproducing, inter alia, the Council Committee Report. The committee concluded, on the basis of extensive public hearings and lengthy research, 
that with the easy availability of firearms in the United States has been a major factor contributing to the drastic increase in gun-related violence and crime over the past 40 years. Idiosur at 24, 25. It reported to the Council startling statistics. ID. Done at 26, regarding gun-related crime, accidents, and deaths, focusing particularly on the relation between handguns and crime and the proliferation of handguns within the district. CED at 2526. The committee informed the council that guns were responsible for 69 deaths in this country each day, for a total of approximately 25,000 gun deaths each year, along with an additional 200,000 gun-related injuries. Stores at 25. 3,000 of these deaths, the report stated, were accidental. Ibid. A quarter of the victims in those accidental deaths were children under the age of 14. Ibidi. And according to the committee, for every intruder stopped by a homeowner with a firearm, there are four gun-related accidents within the home. Ibid. In respect to local crime, the committee observed that there were 285 murders in the district during 1974, a record number. Dar at 26. The committee also stated that, contrary to popular opinion on the subject, firearms are more frequently involved in deaths and violence among relatives and friends than in premeditated criminal activities. Ibidi. Citing an article from the American Journal of Psychiatry, the committee reported that, most murders are committed by previously law-abiding citizens in situations where spontaneous violence is generated by anger, passion, or intoxication, and where the killer and victim are acquainted. Ibid. 25% of these murders, the committee informed the council, occur within families. Ibidems. The committee report furthermore presented statistics strongly correlating handguns with crime. Of the 285 murders in the district in 1974, 155 were committed with handguns. Ibid. This did not appear to be an aberration, as the report revealed that handguns had been used in roughly 54% of all murders and 87% of murders of law enforcement officers nationwide over the preceding several years. Ibid. Nor were handguns only linked to murders, as statistics showed that they were used in roughly 60% of robberies and 26% of assaults. Ibid. A crime committed with a pistol, the committee reported, is seven times more likely to be lethal than a crime committed with any other weapon. Dequeers at 25. The committee furthermore presented statistics regarding the availability of handguns in the United States, IBID. Inan noted that they had become easy for juveniles to obtain, even despite then-current district laws prohibiting juveniles from possessing them ID, at 26. In the committee's view, the current district firearms laws were unable to reduce the potentiality for gun-related violence, or to cope with the problems of gun control in the district, more generally. IBID. In the absence of adequate federal gun legislation, the committee concluded, it becomes necessary for local governments to act to protect their citizens, and certainly the District of Columbia, as the only totally urban state-like jurisdiction, should be strong in its approach. Idisors, at 27. It recommended that the Council adopt a restriction on handgun registration to reflect a legislative decision that, at this point in time, and due to the gun control tragedies and horrors enumerated previously in the committee report. Pistols are no longer justified in this jurisdiction. Idiger, at 31, see also EBID, handgun restriction, denotes a policy decision that handguns have no legitimate use in the purely urban environment of the district. The district's special focus on handguns thus reflects the fact that the committee report found them to have a particularly strong link to undesirable activities in the district's exclusively urban environment. CED at 2526. The district did not seek to prohibit possession of other sorts of weapons deemed more suitable for an urban area. CED at 25. Indeed, an original draft of the bill and the original committee recommendations had sought to prohibit registration of shotguns as well as handguns but the council as a whole decided to narrow the prohibition. Compare ID at 30, describing early version of the bill, with D. Se, code parar o 7, 2502 para 2. Su, next, consider the facts as a court must consider them looking at the matter as of today. C, E, G, Turner, 5 on 20 U, S at 195, discussing role of court as fact finder in a constitutional case. Petitioners and their amici 
have presented us with more recent statistics that tell much the same story that the committee report told 30 years ago. At the least, they present nothing that would permit us to second-guess the council in respect to the numbers of gun crimes, injuries, and deaths, or the role of handguns. From 1993 to 1997, there were 180,533 firearm-related deaths in the United States, an average of over 36,000 per year. Depth of Justice Bureau of Justice Statistics, M. Zawitz and K. Strum, Firearm Injury and Death from Crime, 1993-97, Pier 2, Octia 2000. Online at http www.ojpusdj.gov BJS pub taught PDF FID C9397 dot PDF Here and after firearm injury and death from crime 51% were suicides 44% were homicides 1% were legal interventions 3% were unintentional accidents and 1% were of undetermined causes See bid. Over that same period, there were an additional 411 and 800 non-fatal firearm-related injuries treated in U. S. Hospitals, an average of over 82,000 per year. Ibid. Of these, 62% resulted from assaults, 17% were unintentional, 6% were suicide attempts, 1% were legal interventions, and 13% were of unknown causes. Ibid. The statistics are particularly striking in respect to children and adolescents. In over one in every eight firearm-related deaths in 1997, the victim was someone under the age of 20. American Academy of Pediatrics, Firearm-Related Injuries Affecting the Pediatric Population, 105 Pediatrics, 888, 2000, Here and After Firearm-Related Injuries. Firearm-related deaths account for 22.5% of all injury deaths between the ages of 1 and 19. IBID, more male teenagers die from firearms than from all natural causes combined. Dresang, Gun Deaths in Rural and Urban Settings, 14J. M. B.D. Family Practice 107, 2001. Persons under 25 accounted for 47% of hospital-treated firearm injuries between June 1, 1992 and May 31, 1993. Firearm-Related Injuries 891. Handguns are involved in a majority of firearm deaths and injuries in the United States. Fritcher at 888. From 1993 to 1997, 81% of firearm homicide victims were killed by handgun. Firearm Injury and Death from Crime 4. See also Depth of Justice, Bureau of Justice Statistics, C. Perkins, Weapon Use and Violent Crime 8, Cetron 2003. Table 10. HTTP. Jata www.ojp. Jawestdoj.gov. BJS. Pub. PDF. WVC01. PDF. Here and After Weapon Use and Violent Crime. Statistics indicating roughly the same rate for 1993-2001. In the same period, for the 41% of firearm injuries for which the weapon type is known, 82% of them were from handguns. Firearm injury and death from crime 4. And among children under the age of 20, handguns account for approximately 70% of all unintentional firearm-related injuries and deaths. Firearm-related injuries 890. In particular, 70% of all firearm-related teenage suicides in 1996 involved a handgun. Adji at 889. See also Zwirling, Lynch, Burmeister, and Gortz. The Choice of Weapons in Firearm Suicides in Iowa, 83 AM. J-Pub. Health, 1630, 1631, 1993. Table 1. Handguns used in 36.6% of all firearm suicides in Iowa from 1980-1984 and 43.8% from 1990-1991. Handguns also appear to be a very popular weapon among criminals. In a 1997 survey of inmates who were armed during the crime for which they were incarcerated, 83.2% of state inmates and 86.7% of federal inmates said that they were armed with a handgun. See Depth of Justice. Bureau of Justice Statistics, C. Harlow, Firearm Use by Offenders 3, November 2001, online at http www.ojp.usdoj.gov, .bjs, pub, .pdf, fuo.pdf. See also Weapon Use and Violent Crime 2, Table 2. Statistics indicating that handguns were used in over 84% of non-lethal violent crimes involving firearms from 1993 to 2001. And handguns are not only popular tools for crime, but popular objects of it as well. The Federal Bureau of Investigation received on average over 274,000 reports of stolen guns for each year between 1985 and 1994, and almost 60% of stolen guns are handguns. Depth of Justice, Bureau of Justice Statistics, M. Zawitz, Guns Used in Crime 3, July 1995, 
online at http.www.ojpusdoj.gov. BJS, pub, PDF, GUIC, PDF. Department of Justice studies have concluded that stolen handguns in particular are an important source of weapons for both adult and juvenile offenders. Ibid. Statistics further suggest that urban areas, such as the district, have different experiences with gun-related death, injury, and crime than do less densely populated rural areas. A disproportionate amount of violent and property crimes occur in urban areas, and urban criminals are more likely than other offenders to use a firearm during the commission of a violent crime. See Dept. of Justice, Bureau of Justice Statistics, D. Duhart, Urban, Suburban, and Rural Victimization, 1993-98, PPU 1, 9, Oct 2000, online at http www.ojp. Uzdur.gov BS Pub PDF with Aravinatoid PDF. Homicide appears to be a much greater issue in urban areas. From 1985 to 1993, for example, half of all homicides occurred in 63 cities with 16% of the nation's population. When to Mute, The Future of Firearm Violence Prevention, 282, JAMA 475, 1999. One study concluded that although the overall rate of gun death between 1989 and 1999 was roughly the same in urban and rural areas, the urban homicide rate was three times as high. Even after adjusting for other variables, it was still twice as high. Branus, Nance, Elliott, Richmond, and Schwab, Urban Rural Shifts in Intentional Firearm Death, 94 AM. J. Pub. Health 1750-1752-2004. See also EBIT, noting that rural areas appear to have a higher rate of firearm suicide. And a study of firearm injuries to children and adolescents in Pennsylvania between 1987 and 2000 showed an injury rate in urban counties 10 times higher than in non-urban counties. Nance et al., The Rural Urban Continuum, 156 Archives of Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine, 781, 782, 2002. Finally, the linkage of handguns to firearms deaths and injuries appears to be much stronger in urban than in rural areas. Studies to date generally support the hypothesis that the greater number of rural gun deaths are from rifles or shotguns, whereas the greater number of urban gun deaths are from handguns. Dresang, Supra, at 108. And the Pennsylvania study reached a similar conclusion with respect to firearm injuries. They are much more likely to be caused by handguns in urban areas than in rural areas. See Nance et al., Supra at 784. 3. Respondent and his many amici, for the most part, do not disagree about the figures set forth in the preceding subsection. But they do disagree strongly with the district's predictive judgment that a ban on handguns will help solve the crime and accident problems that those figures disclose. In particular, they disagree with the district council's assessment that freezing the pistol, population within the district, D.C. Rep. Mears at 26, will reduce crime, accidents, and deaths related to guns. And they provide facts and figures designed to show that it has not done so in the past and hence will not do so in the future. First, they point out that since the ban took effect, violent crime in the district has increased, not decreased. See brief for criminologists et al. as Amici Curiae 48, 3A, here and after criminologists brief. Brief for Congress of Racial Equality as Amicus Curiae 35 to 36. Brief for National Rifle Association et al as Amici Curiae 28 to 30, here and after NRA brief. Indeed, a comparison with 49 other major cities reveals that the district's homicide rate is actually substantially higher relative to these other cities than it was before the handgun restriction went into effect. See brief for academics et al., as Amici Curiae 7 to 10, here and after academics brief. See also criminologists brief 6 to 9, 3A, 4A, 7A. Respondents Amishi report similar results in comparing the district's homicide rates during that period to that of the neighboring states of Maryland and Virginia, neither of which restricts handguns to the same degree, and to the homicide rate of the nation as a whole. See Academics Brief 1117, Criminologist Brief 6A, 8A. Second, Respondents Amishi point to a statistical analysis that regresses murder rates against the presence or absence of strict gun laws in 20 European nations. See Criminologists Brief 23, citing Cates and Mauser, would banning firearms reduce murder and suicide? 30 Harvern, J.L. and Pub, Poli 649-651-694, 2007. That analysis concludes that strict gun laws are correlated with more murders, not fewer. See Criminologists Brief 23, 
see also ID SOA 2528. They also cite domestic studies based on data from various cities, states, and the nation as a whole, suggesting that a reduction in the number of guns does not lead to a reduction in the amount of violent crime, see ID SOA 1720. They further argue that handgun bans do not reduce suicide rates, see ID SOA at 2831, 9A, or rates of accidents, even those involving children, see AP. Too brief for International Law Enforcement Educators and Trainers Association, et al. As Amici Curie app, 7 to 15, here and after Elita brief. Third, they point to evidence indicating that firearm ownership does have a beneficial self defense effect. Based on a 1993 survey, the authors of one study estimated that there were 2.2 to 2.5 million defensive uses of guns, mostly brandishing, about a quarter involving the actual firing of a gun, annually. See Kleck and Gertz, Armed Resistance to Crime, 86J, Crim, L, and C. 150 164 1995. See also Elita Brief App. 1 6. Summarizing studies regarding defensive uses of guns. Another study estimated that for a period of 12 months ending in 1994, there were 503,481 incidents in which a burglar found himself confronted by an armed homeowner, and that in 497, 646, 98.8% of them, the intruder was successfully scared away. See Akita, Dahlberg, Sachs, Mercy, and Powell. Estimating intruder-related firearms retrievals in you as households, 12 violence and victims, 363, 1997. A third study suggests that gun-armed victims are substantially less likely than non-gun-armed victims to be injured in resisting robbery or assault. Barnett and Cates, Under Fire, 45 Emery LJ, EU 39, EU 43, Luce 44, and Quar 278, Mi 1996. And additional evidence suggests that criminals are likely to be deterred from burglary and other crimes if they know the victim is likely to have a gun. See Kleck, Crime Control Through the Private Use of Armed Force, 35 Social Problems, 1, 15, 1988, reporting a substantial drop in the burglary rate in an Atlanta suburb that required heads of households to own guns. See also, I lead a brief 1718, describing decrease in sexual assaults in Orlando when women were trained in the use of guns. Fourth, Respondents Amici argue that laws criminalizing gun possession are self-defeating, as evidence suggests that they will have the effect only of restricting law-abiding citizens, but not criminals, from acquiring guns. C.E.G. Brief for President Pro Tempore of Senate of Pennsylvania, as Amicus Curiae 35, 36, and N. 15. That effect, they argue, will be especially pronounced in the district, whose proximity to Virginia and Maryland will provide criminals with a steady supply of guns. See brief for Heartland Institute as Amicus Curiae 20. In the view of respondents Amici, this evidence shows that other remedies, such as less restriction on gun ownership or liberal authorization of law-abiding citizens to carry concealed weapons, better fit the problem. C.E. Criminologists Brief 3537, Advocating Easily Obtainable Gun Licenses. Brief for Southeastern Legal Foundation Inc. Enst et al. As Amici Curiae 15, Here and After, SLF Brief advocating widespread gun ownership as a deterrent to crime. See also J. Lot, more guns, less crime, 2D at 2000. They further suggest that at a minimum, the district fails to show that its remedy, the gun ban, bears a reasonable relation to the crime and accident problems that the district seeks to solve. C.E. G. Brief for Respondent 59-61. to These empirically-based arguments may have proved strong enough to convince many legislatures, as a matter of legislative policy, not to adopt total handgun bans. But the question here is whether they are strong enough to destroy judicial confidence in the reasonableness of a legislature that rejects them, and that they are not. For one thing, they can lead us more deeply into the uncertainties that surround any effort to reduce crime. But they cannot prove either that handgun possession diminishes crime or that handgun bans are ineffective. The statistics do show a soaring district crime rate, and the district's crime rate went up after the district adopted its handgun ban. But as students of elementary logic know, after it does not mean because of it. What would the district's crime rate have looked like without the ban? Higher? Lower? The same? Experts differ, and we as judges cannot say. What about the fact that foreign nations with strict gun laws have higher crime rates? Which is the cause and which the effect? The proposition that strict gun laws cause crime is harder to accept than the proposition that strict gun laws in part grow out of the fact that a nation already has a higher crime rate. And we are then left with the same question as before.
What would have happened to crime without the gun laws, a question that Respondent and his Amici do not convincingly answer. Further, suppose that Respondent's Amici are right when they say that householders' possession of loaded handguns help to frighten away intruders. On that assumption, one must still ask whether that benefit is worth the potential death-related cost. And that is a question without a directly provable answer. Finally, consider the claim of Respondent's Amici that handgun bans cannot work. There are simply too many illegal guns already in existence for a ban on legal guns to make a difference. In a word, they claim that given the urban sea of pre-existing legal guns, criminals can readily find arms regardless. Nonetheless, a legislature might respond, we want to make an effort to try to dry up that urban sea drop by drop, and none of the studies can show that effort is not worthwhile. In a word, the studies to which respondents Amici point raise policy-related questions. They succeed in proving that the district's predictive judgments are controversial. But they do not by themselves show that those judgments are incorrect. Nor do they demonstrate a consensus, academic or otherwise, supporting that conclusion. Thus, it is not surprising that the district and its amici support the district's handgun restriction with studies of their own. One in particular suggests that, statistically speaking, the district's law has indeed had positive life-saving effects. See Lofton, McDowell, Wiersema, and Cotty, Effects of Restrictive Licensing of Handguns on Homicide and Suicide in the District of Columbia, 325 New England J., Medirmer 1615, 1991, Here and After Lofton Study. Others suggest that firearm restrictions as a general matter reduce homicides, suicides, and accidents in the home. C.E. G. Duggan More Guns More Crime 109 J. Poll. Econ. 1086 2001. Kellerman, Soames, Rivara, Lee, and Banton Injuries and Deaths Due to Firearms in the Home. 45 J. Trauma. Injury, Infection, and Critical Care. 263. 1998. Miller, Azrael, and Hemingway. Household Firearm Ownership and Suicide Rates in the United States. 13 Epidemiology, 517, 2002. Still others suggest that the defensive uses of handguns are not as great in number as respondents Amitsi claim. C.E. G. Brief for American Public Health Association at Albor as Amici Curiae, 1719, here and after APHA brief, citing studies. Respondent and his Amici reply to these responses, and in doing so, they seek to discredit as methodologically flawed the studies and evidence relied upon by the district. C.E. G. Criminologist Brief 9-17, 2024, Brief for Association of American Physicians and Surgeons in Carrick, as Amicus Curiae 12th and 18, SLF Brief 17 to 22, Brit, Kleck, and Bordua, a reassessment of the D. C. Gun Law 30 Law and So. Reverend 361, 1996, criticizing the Lofton study. And of course, the district's Amici produce counter rejoinders, referring to articles that defend their studies. C. E. G. APHA Brief 23 N. 5 citing McDowell, Lofton, and Wiersema, using quasi-experiments to evaluate firearm laws, 30 Law and Sakin, Rev. 381, 1996. The upshot is a set of studies and counter-studies that, at most, could leave a judge uncertain about the proper policy conclusion. But, from respondents' perspective, any such uncertainty is not good enough. That is because legislators, not judges, have primary responsibility for drawing policy conclusions from empirical fact. And given that constitutional allocation of decision-making responsibility, the empirical evidence presented here is sufficient to allow a judge to reach a firm legal conclusion. In particular, this court, in First Amendment cases applying intermediate scrutiny, has said that our sole obligation in reviewing a legislature's predictive judgments is to assure that, in formulating its judgments, the legislature has drawn reasonable inferences based on substantial evidence. Turner, 5 and 20 U. S. at 195, internal quotation marks omitted, and judges, looking at the evidence before us, should agree that the district legislature's predictive judgments satisfy that legal standard. That is to say, the district's judgment, while open to question, is nevertheless supported by substantial evidence. There is no cause here to depart from the standard set forth in Turner, for the district's decision represents the kind of empirically based judgment that legislatures, not courts, are best suited to make. C. Nixon, 528U, S. at 402, Breyer J. concurring. In fact, deference to legislative judgment seems particularly appropriate here. 
where the judgment has been made by a local legislature, with particular knowledge of local problems and insight into appropriate local solutions. See Los Angeles vs. Alameda Books, Inc. of 535U. S. 425, 440, 2002. Plurality Opinion. We must acknowledge that the Los Angeles City Council is in a better position than the judiciary to gather and evaluate data on local problems. CF. DC Repetures at 67. Statement of Repers Goude. Describing district's law as a decision made on the local level after extensive debate and deliberations. Different localities may seek to solve similar problems in different ways, and a city must be allowed a reasonable opportunity to experiment with solutions to admittedly serious problems. Renton v. Playtime Theaters Incomers 475U S. 41, 52, 1986. Internal quotation marks omitted. The framers recognized that the most effective democracy occurs at local levels of government, where people with first-hand knowledge of local problems have more ready access to public officials responsible for dealing with them. Garcia v. San Antonio Metropolitan Transit Authority, 469U. S. Finders 28 Finders in 18, 1985, Powell J. Dissenting. Citing the Federalist No. 17, Ponder 107, J. Cook, Adrian 1961, A. Hamilton. We owe that democratic process some substantial weight in the constitutional calculus. For these reasons, I conclude that the district's statute properly seeks to further the sort of life-preserving and public safety interests that the court has called compelling. Salerno, 481 U.S., at 750, 754. B. I next assess the extent to which the district's law burdens the interests that the Second Amendment seeks to protect. Respondent and his amici, as well as the majority, suggest that those interests include 1. The preservation of a well-regulated militia. 2. Safeguarding the use of firearms for sporting purposes, e. Hunting and marksmanship. And 3. Assuring the use of firearms for self-defense. For argument's sake, I shall consider all three of those interests here. 1. The district statute burdens the amendment's first and primary objective hardly at all. As previously noted, there is general agreement among the members of the court that the principal, if not the only purpose of the Second Amendment, is found in the amendment's text, the preservation of a well-regulated militia. See Supra, at 682-683. What scant court precedent there is on the Second Amendment teaches that the amendment was adopted with obvious purpose to assure the continuation and render possible the effectiveness of militia forces, and must be interpreted and applied with that end in view. Miller, 307 to U. S. Cobb at 178. Where that end is implicated only minimally, or not at all, there is substantially less reason for constitutional concern. Compare Ibid. In the absence of any evidence tending to show that possession or use of a shotgun having a barrel of less than 18 inches in length at this time has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, we cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear such an instrument. To begin with, the present case has nothing to do with actual military service. The question presented presumes that respondent is not affiliated with any state-regulated militia. 552U S. 1035, 2007. Emphasis added. I am aware of no indication that the district, either now or in the recent past, has called up its citizenry to serve in a militia, that it has any inkling of doing so any time in the foreseeable future, or that this law must be construed to prevent the use of handguns during legitimate militia activities. Moreover, even if the district were to call up its militia, respondent would not be among the citizens whose service would be requested. The district does not consider him, at 66 years of age, to be a member of its militia. CDC Code Par 49401, 2001. Militia includes only male residents ages 18 to 45. Appy, to pet. For cert. Fontuania, indicating respondent's date of birth. Nonetheless, as some amici claim, the statute might interfere with training in the use of weapons, training useful for military purposes. The 19th century constitutional scholar, Thomas Cooley, wrote that the Second Amendment protects learning to handle and use arms in a way that makes those who keep them ready for their efficient use during militia service. General Principles of Constitutional Law 271, 1880, Ante at 618, Opinion of the Court. See also Ante at 618-619, citing other scholars agreeing with Cooley on that point.
and former military officers tell us that private ownership of firearms makes for a more effective fighting force because M military recruits with previous firearms experience and training are generally better marksmen and accordingly better soldiers. Brief for retired military officers as Amici Curie 1 2. Here and after military officers brief. An amicus brief filed by retired army generals adds that a well regulated militia, whether ad hoc or as part of our organized military, depends on recruits who have familiarity and training with firearms, rifles, pistols, and shotguns. Brief for Major General John D. Altenburg Jr. et al. as Amici Curiae 4, here and after General's Brief. Both briefs point out the importance of handgun training. Military Officers Brief, 2628. General's Brief 4. Handguns are used in military service, see Military Officers Brief 26, and civilians who are familiar with handgun marksmanship and safety are much more likely to be able to safely and accurately fire a rifle or other firearm with minimal training upon entering military service, Yeditsu at 28. Regardless, to consider the military training objective a modern counterpart to a similar militia-related colonial objective and to treat that objective as falling within the amendment's primary purposes makes no difference here. That is because the district's law does not seriously affect military training interests. The law permits residents to engage in activities that will increase their familiarity with firearms. They may register, and thus possess in their homes, weapons other than handguns, such as rifles and shotguns. See DC Code, Parverv 7-2502-017-2502.02a. Only weapons that cannot be registered are sawed-off shotguns, machine guns, short-barreled rifles, and pistols not registered before 1976. Compare General's Brief 4, listing rifles, pistols, and shotguns as useful military weapons, emphasis added, and they may operate those weapons within the district for lawful recreational purposes. Paragraph 72507.02. See also, Paragraph 72502, Shay 1b, 3. Non-residents. Participating in any lawful recreational firearm-related activity in the district or on his way to or from such activity in another jurisdiction may carry even weapons not registered in the district. These permissible recreations plainly include actually using and firing the weapons, as evidenced by a specific D. C. Code provision. Contemplating the existence of local firing ranges. See Paragraph 7203. And while the district law prevents citizens from training with handguns within the district, the district consists of only 61.4 square miles of urban area. See Depth of Commerce, Bureau of Census, United States, 2000, Port 1, Pies 11, 2002, Table 8. The adjacent states do permit the use of handguns for target practice, and those states are only a brief subway ride away. See Mut. Crim. Law Code Ann. 4. 203b4. Lexus Sub 2007. General handgun restriction does not apply to the wearing, carrying, or transporting by a person of a handgun used in connection with inter alia, a target shoot, formal or informal target practice, sport shooting event, hunting, or a Department of Natural Resources sponsored firearms and hunter safety class. EVA. Code Ann. Far 18.2, 287.4. Lexus SUP in 2007. General restriction on carrying certain loaded pistols in certain public areas does not apply to any person actually engaged in lawful hunting or lawful recreational shooting activities at an established shooting range or shooting contest. Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, Metro Rail System Map, online at http.d.wwmata.com Metro Rail System Map.cfm. Of course, a subway rider must buy a ticket, and the ride takes time. It also costs money to store a pistol, say, at a target range, outside the district. But given the costs already associated with gun ownership and firearms training, I cannot say that a subway ticket and a short subway ride and storage costs create more than a minimal burden. So, so Crawford v. Marion County Election Bead, 553 U.S. 181, 238-239-2008. Breyer, J. Dissenting. Acknowledging travel burdens on indigent persons in the context of voting where public transportation options were limited. Indeed, respondent and two of his co-plaintiffs below may well use handguns outside the district on a regular basis, as their declarations indicate that they keep such weapons stored there. See App. To Pet. For Cert. 77A Respondent. 
See also E.D. Bond at 78A, 84A, co-plaintiffs. I conclude that the district's law burdens the Second Amendment's primary objective little, or not at all. 2. The majority briefly suggests that the right to keep and bear arms might encompass an interest in hunting. See E. G. Ante at 599. But in enacting the present provisions, the district sought to take nothing away from sportsmen. D.C. Repperers at 33. And any inability of district residents to hunt near where they live has much to do with the jurisdiction's exclusively urban character and little to do with the district's firearm laws. For reasons similar to those I discussed in the preceding subsection, that the district's law does not prohibit possession of rifles or shotguns, and the presence of opportunities for sporting activities in nearby states, I reach a similar conclusion, namely, that the district's law burdens any sports-related or hunting-related objectives that the amendment may protect little, or not at all. 3. The district's law does prevent a resident from keeping a loaded handgun in his home, and it consequently makes it more difficult for the householder to use the handgun for self-defense in the home against intruders, such as burglars. As the Court of Appeals noted, statistics suggest that handguns are the most popular weapon for self-defense. See 478F, Toddy at 400, citing Kleck and Gertz, 86J Crim LNC at 182-183. And there are some legitimate reasons why that would be the case. Amici suggest, with some empirical support, that handguns are easier to hold and control, particularly for persons with physical infirmities easier to carry, easier to maneuver in enclosed spaces, and that a person using one will still have a hand free to dial 911. See Ilita Brief 3739, NRA Brief 3233, see also Ante at 629, but see Brief for Petitioners 5455, citing sources preferring shotguns and rifles to handguns for purposes of self-defense. To that extent, the law burdens to some degree an interest in self-defense that for present purposes, I have assumed the amendment seeks to further. See, in weighing needs and burdens, we must take account of the possibility that there are reasonable, but less restrictive, alternatives. Are there other potential measures that might similarly promote the same goals while imposing lesser restrictions? See Nixon, 528U, S, at 402, Breyer, J, concurring, Existence of a clearly superior, less restrictive alternative can be a factor in determining whether a law is constitutionally proportionate. Here I see none. The reason there is no clearly superior, less restrictive alternative to the district's handgun ban is that the ban's very objective is to reduce significantly the number of handguns in the district, say, for example, by allowing a law enforcement officer immediately to assume that any handgun he sees is an illegal handgun and there is no plausible way to achieve that objective other than to ban the guns. It does not help respondents' case to describe the district's objective more generally as an effort to diminish the dangers associated with guns. That is because the very attributes that make handguns particularly useful for self-defense are also what make them particularly dangerous. That they are easy to hold and control means that they are easier for children to use. See Brief for American Academy of Pediatrics et al. As Amici Curiae 19. Children as young as three are able to pull the trigger of most handguns. That they are maneuverable and permit a free hand likely contributes to the fact that they are by far the firearm of choice for crimes such as rape and robbery. See Weapon Use and Violent Crime 2, Table 2. That they are small and light makes them easy to steal. See Supra at 6998 and Concealable CF Ante at 626, Opinion of the Court, suggesting that concealed weapon bans are constitutional. This symmetry suggests that any measure less restrictive in respect to the use of handguns for self-defense will, to that same extent, prove less effective in preventing the use of handguns for illicit purposes. If a resident has a handgun in the home that he can use for self-defense, then he has a handgun in the home that he can use to commit suicide or engage in acts of domestic violence. See Supra, at 697, Handguns Prevalent in Suicides. Brief for National Network to End Domestic Violence et al., as Amici Curiae, 27, handguns prevalent in domestic violence. If it is indeed the case, as the district believes, that the number of guns contributes to the number of gun-related crimes, accidents, and deaths, then, although there may be less restrictive, less effective substitutes for an outright ban, there is no less restrictive equivalent of an outright ban. Licensing restrictions would not similarly reduce the handgun population, and the district may reasonably fear that even if guns are initially restricted to law-abiding citizens, they might be stolen 
and thereby placed in the hands of criminals. See Supra at 698. Permitting certain types of handguns but not others would affect the commercial market for handguns but not their availability, and requiring safety devices such as trigger locks or imposing safe storage requirements would interfere with any self-defense interest while simultaneously leaving operable weapons in the hands of owners or others capable of acquiring the weapon and disabling the safety device who might use them for domestic violence or other crimes. The absence of equally effective alternatives to a complete prohibition finds support in the empirical fact that other states and urban centers prohibit particular types of weapons. Chicago has a law very similar to the districts, and many of its suburbs also ban handgun possession under most circumstances. See Chicago Ilverse Municipal Code Parafar 8 Dunner 030K 820-40-82-2050C 2008 Evanston Illidorer City Code Power of Navarro 8 2007. Morton Grove, Ilver, Village Code, Power of 6 C, 2007. Oak Park, Ilker, Village Code, Power of 1, 2007. Winnetka, Ilshur, Village Ordinance, Power of Narn Dual, Marro 2, 2008. Online at http www.mlegal.com, Library, Il, Winnetka. Shartiml. Wilmet, Il. Si Ordinance, Paragraph 2, 24B, 2008. Online at http judge w.mlegal. Come library il Wilmet Ashmel. Toledo bans certain types of handguns. Toledo, Ohio. Municipal Code, Parada of 549-25-2008. And San Francisco in 2005 enacted by popular referendum a ban on most handgun possession by city residents. It has been precluded from enforcing that prohibition, however, by state court decisions deeming it preempted by state law. See Fiscal v. City and County of San Francisco. 158 Cal. App. 4th 895-900-902-70 Cal, RPTR, 3D-324-326-328, 2008. Indeed, the fact that as many as 41 states may preempt local gun regulation suggests that the absence of more regulation like the districts may perhaps have more to do with state law than with a lack of locally perceived need for them. See Legal Community Against Violence, Regulating Guns in America. 14, 2006. HTTP www.lcav. Org Our Library Reports Analyses National Audit Total 8 DIN 606 PDF. In addition, at least six states in Puerto Rico impose general bans on certain types of weapons, in particular assault weapons or semi automatic weapons. See Cal. Penal Code N. Paragrafo 1280 B. West Supin 2008. Con. Kinderstadt. 53202C2007, Hall, Revenor Stat, Farav 134.8, 1993, Mod, Crim, Law Code Anne, A433A, Lexis 2002, Mass, Gender Laws H, Tsatamal Fundriemi, West 26, N, Weiss Penal Law Anne, Paragraph 26027, West Supper 2008, 25 Laws PRN, Paragraph 436 M. Sub 2006, see also 18U, S. C. For if Nova Vincido, a federal machine gun ban. And at least 14 municipalities do the same. See Albany, NY, Municipal Code, Parav 193 A, 2005, Aurora Ills Ordinance, Parav 2949 A, 2007, Buffalo, NY, City Code, Parav Sanawin 1 F, 2007, Chicago Ills Municipal Code, Parav 824 025 A, 820 030 Cincinnati, Ohio, Municipal Code, Parav 708 A, Supino 2008. Cleveland, Ohio Ordinance, Parar of 6 Avenue 8 or 3A, 2 M7. Columbus, Ohio City, Code Parar of 23 Avenue 3 31, 2 M8. Denver, Colo. Revised Municipal Code, Paragraph 38, 1 to 30, 2 M8. Morton Grove, Ilant Village Code, Paragraph 6, 2 3B, 2 M7, N. Waitsi Admin. Code Paragraph 10, 303.1, 1996 and Suprems 2007. Oak Park, Illin Village Code, Paragraph 27-21, 2007. Rochester, N.Y., Code, Paragraph 47-5-F, 2008. Online at http www.citerochester.ny.us here index. CFM, ID Prima 12, South Bend, End the Ordinance, Paragraph 1397-B, 1398, 2008. Online at http library time unicode dot com default doc view three nine seven quatro one two Toledo Ohio municipal code paragraph quinhentos e quarenta e nove um vinte três a 
These bans, too, suggest that there may be no substitute to an outright prohibition in cases where a governmental body has deemed a particular type of weapon especially dangerous. D. The upshot is that the district's objectives are compelling. Its predictive judgments as to its law's tendency to achieve those objectives are adequately supported. The law does impose a burden upon any self-defense interest that the amendment seeks to secure. And there is no clear, less restrictive alternative. I turn now to the final portion of the permissible regulation question. Does the district's law disproportionately burden amendment-protected interests? Several considerations taken together convince me that it does not. First, the district law is tailored to the life-threatening problems it attempts to address. The law concerns one class of weapons, handguns, leaving residents free to possess shotguns and rifles, along with ammunition. The area that falls within its scope is totally urban. C.F. Lorillard Tobacco Co. v. Riley 533U. S. 525. 563. 2001. Varied effect of statewide speech restriction in rural, urban, or suburban locales demonstrates a lack of narrow tailoring. That urban area suffers from a serious handgun fatality problem. The district's law directly aims at that compelling problem, and there is no less restrictive way to achieve the problem-related benefits that it seeks. Second, the self-defense interest in maintaining loaded handguns in the home to shoot intruders is not the primary interest, but at most a subsidiary interest that the Second Amendment seeks to serve. The Second Amendment's language, while speaking of a militia, says nothing of self-defense. As Justice Stevens points out, the Second Amendment's drafting history shows that the language reflects the framer's primary, if not exclusive, objective. Siante, at 652-662, dissenting opinion. And the majority itself says that the threat that the new federal government would destroy the citizens' militia by taking away their arms was the reason that right was codified in a written constitution. Ante, at 599, emphasis added. The way in which the amendment's operative clause seeks to promote that interest by protecting a right to keep and bear arms may in fact help further an interest in self-defense. But a factual connection falls far short of a primary objective. The amendment itself tells us that militia preservation was first and foremost in the framers' minds. C. Miller, 307U. S. at 178. With obvious purpose to assure the continuation and render possible the effectiveness of militia forces, the declaration and guarantee of the Second Amendment were made, and the amendment must be interpreted and applied with that end in view. Further, any self-defense interest at the time of the framing could not have focused exclusively upon urban crime-related dangers. Two hundred years ago, most Americans, many living on the frontier, would likely have thought of self-defense primarily in terms of outbreaks of fighting with Indian tribes, rebellions such as Shays' Rebellion, marauders, and crime-related dangers to travelers on the roads, on footpaths, or along waterways. See Depth of Commerce, Bureau of Census, Population, 1790 to 1990, 1998, Table 4, online, at http www.census.gov population census data table 4 pdf of the 3,929,214 americans in 1790 only 201,655 about 5 percent lived in urban areas insofar as the framers focused at all on the tiny fraction of the population living in large cities they would have been aware that these city dwellers were subject to firearm restrictions that their rural counterparts were not see supra at 683-686 they are unlikely then to have thought of a right to keep loaded handguns in homes to confront intruders in urban settings as central. And the subsequent development of modern urban police departments, by diminishing the need to keep loaded guns nearby in case of intruders, would have moved any such right even further away from the heart of the amendment's more basic protective ends. C.E. G. Dusklansky, The Private Police, 46 UCLAL, Rev. 1165, 1206-1207, 1999. Professional urban police departments did not develop until roughly the mid-19th century. Nor, for that matter, am I aware of any evidence that handguns in particular were central to the framers' conception of the Second Amendment. The lists of militia-related weapons in the late 18th century state statutes appear primarily to refer to other sorts of weapons, muskets in particular. C. Miller Supra, at 180-182, Reproducing Colonial Militia Laws. Respondent points out in his brief that the federal government and two states at the time of the founding had enacted statutes that listed handguns as acceptable militia weapons. Brief for Respondent 47. 
but these statutes apparently found them acceptable only for certain special militiamen, generally certain soldiers on horseback, while requiring muskets or rifles for the general infantry. See Act of May 8, 1792, CH, Ix in New Stat, 271, Laws of the State of North Carolina, 592, 1791, First Laws of the State of Connecticut, 150, J. Cushing Adard, 1982, see also 25 Journals of the Continental Congress, 1774, 1789, pp. 741, 742, G. Hunt, Idim Lai, 1922. Third, irrespective of what the framers could have thought, we know what they did think. Samuel Adams, who lived in Boston, advocated a constitutional amendment that would have precluded the Constitution from ever being construed to but prevent the people of the United States, who are peaceable citizens, from keeping their own arms. 6. Documentary History of the Ratification of the Constitution, 1453, J. Kaminsky and G. Saladino Eds, 2000. Samuel Adams doubtless knew that the Massachusetts Constitution contained somewhat similar protection, and he doubtless knew that Massachusetts law prohibited Bostonians from keeping loaded guns in the house. So how could Samuel Adams have advocated such protection unless he thought that the protection was consistent with local regulation that seriously impeded urban residents from using their arms against intruders? It seems unlikely that he meant to deprive the federal government of power to enact Boston-type weapons regulation that he knew Boston had and, as far as we know, he would have thought constitutional under the Massachusetts Constitution. Indeed, since the District of Columbia the subject of the Seat of Government Clause, U.S. Constituar Caros Artenriae, Paragraph 8, C. Lawrence 17, was the only urban area under direct federal control. It seems unlikely that the framers thought about urban gun control at all. So, so Palmore v. United States, 411 U. S. 389, 398, 1973. Congress can legislate for the district in a manner with respect to subjects that would exceed its powers, or at least would be very unusual, in the context of national legislation enacted under other powers delegated to it. Of course, the district's law and the colonial Boston law are not identical, but the Boston law disabled an even wider class of weapons, indeed all firearms. And its existence shows at the least that local legislatures could impose, as here, serious restrictions on the right to use firearms. Moreover, as I have said, Boston's law, though highly analogous to the district's, was not the only colonial law that could have impeded a homeowner's ability to shoot a burglar. Pennsylvania's and New York's laws could well have had a similar effect. See Supra at 686. And the Massachusetts and Pennsylvania laws were not only thought consistent with an unwritten common law gun possession right, but also consistent with written state constitutional provisions providing protections similar to those provided by the Federal Second Amendment. See Supra at 685-686. I cannot agree with the majority that these laws are largely uninformative because the penalty for violating them was civil rather than criminal. Ante, at 633-634, the court has long recognized that the exercise of a constitutional right can be burdened by penalties far short of jail time. C.E. G. Murdoch v. Pennsylvania, 319 U. S. 105-1943, invalidating $7 per week solicitation fee as applied to religious group. See also Forsyth County v. Nationalist Movement, 505U, S. 23, 136, 1992. A tax based on the content of speech does not become more constitutional because it is a small tax. Regardless, why would the majority require a precise colonial regulatory analog in order to save a modern gun regulation from constitutional challenge? After all, insofar as we look to history to discover how we can constitutionally regulate a right to self-defense, we must look not to what 18th century legislatures actually did enact, but to what they would have thought they could enact. There are innumerable policy-related reasons why a legislature might not act on a particular matter, despite having the power to do so. This court has frequently cautioned that it is at best treacherous to find in congressional silence alone the adoption of a controlling rule of law. United States v. Wells, 519 U. S. 482 496, 1997. Internal quotation marks and brackets omitted. It is similarly treacherous to reason from the fact that colonial legislatures did not enact certain kinds of legislation to a conclusion that a modern legislature cannot do so. 
The question should not be whether a modern restriction on a right to self-defense duplicates a past one, but whether that restriction, when compared with restrictions originally thought possible, enjoys a similarly strong justification. At a minimum, that similarly strong justification is what the district's modern law, compared with Boston's colonial law, reveals. Fourth, a contrary view, as embodied in today's decision, will have unfortunate consequences. The decision will encourage legal challenges to gun regulation throughout the nation. Because it says little about the standards used to evaluate regulatory decisions, it will leave the nation without clear standards for resolving those challenges. See Ante at 626-627 and then 26. And litigation over the course of many years, or the mere specter of such litigation, threatens to leave cities without effective protection against gun violence and accidents during that time. As important, the majority's decision threatens severely to limit the ability of more knowledgeable, democratically elected officials to deal with gun-related problems. The majority says that it leaves the district a variety of tools for combating such problems. Ante at 636. It fails to list even one seemingly adequate replacement for the law it strikes down. I can understand how reasonable individuals can disagree about the merits of strict gun control as a crime control measure, even in a totally urbanized area. But I cannot understand how one can take from the elected branches of government the right to decide whether to insist upon a handgun-free urban populace in a city now facing a serious crime problem, and which, in the future, could well face environmental or other emergencies that threaten the breakdown of law and order. 5. The majority derides my approach as judge-empowering. Ante at 634. I take this criticism seriously, but I do not think it accurate. As I have previously explained, this is an approach that the court has taken in other areas of constitutional law. See Supra, at 690. Application of such an approach, of course, requires judgment, but the very nature of the approach, requiring careful identification of the relevant interests and evaluating the law's effect upon them, limits the judge's choices. And the method's necessary transparency lays bare the judge's reasoning for all to see and to criticize. The majority's methodology is, in my view, substantially less transparent than mine. At a minimum, I find it difficult to understand the reasoning that seems to underlie certain conclusions that it reaches. The majority spends the first 54 pages of its opinion attempting to rebut Justice Stevens' evidence that the amendment was enacted with a purely militia-related purpose. In the majority's view, the amendment also protects an interest in armed personal self-defense, at least to some degree but the majority does not tell us precisely what that interest is. Putting all of the Second Amendment's textual elements together, the majority says, we find that they guarantee the individual right to possess and carry weapons in case of confrontation. Ante, at 592. Then, three pages later, it says that, we do not read the Second Amendment to permit citizens to carry arms for any sort of confrontation. Ante, at 595. Yet, with one critical exception, it does not explain which confrontations count. It simply leaves that question unanswered. The majority does, however, point to one type of confrontation that counts, for it describes the amendment as elevating above all other interests the right of law-abiding, responsible citizens to use arms in defense of hearth and home. Ante, at 635. What is its basis for finding that to be the core of the Second Amendment right? The only historical sources identified by the majority that even appear to touch upon that specific matter consist of an 1866 newspaper editorial discussing the Freedmen's Bureau Act. See Ante at 615. Two quotations from that 1866 Act's legislative history. See Ante at 615 to 616. And a 1980 state court opinion saying that in colonial times the same were used to defend the home as to maintain the militia. See Ante at 624-625. How can citations such as these support the far-reaching proposition that the Second Amendment's primary concern is not its stated concern about the militia, but rather a right to keep loaded weapons at one's bedside to shoot intruders? Nor is it at all clear to me how the majority decides which loaded arms a homeowner may keep. The majority says that that amendment protects those weapons typically possessed by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes. Anti- at 625. This definition conveniently excludes machine guns, but permits handguns, which the majority describes as the most popular weapon chosen by Americans for self-defense in the home. Ante, at 629, see also Ante, 
at 626-627. But what sense does this approach make? According to the majority's reasoning, if Congress and the states lift restrictions on the possession and use of machine guns, and people buy machine guns to protect their homes, the court will have to reverse course and find that the Second Amendment does, in fact, protect the individual self-defense-related right to possess a machine gun. On the majority's reasoning, if tomorrow someone invents a particularly useful, highly dangerous self-defense weapon, Congress and the states had better ban it immediately, for once it becomes popular, Congress will no longer possess the constitutional authority to do so. In essence, the majority determines what regulations are permissible by looking to see what existing regulations permit. There is no basis for believing that the framers intended such circular reasoning. I am similarly puzzled by the majority's list, in part three of its opinion, of provisions that in its view would survive Second Amendment scrutiny. These consist of 1. Prohibitions on carrying concealed weapons. 2. Prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons. 3. Prohibitions on the possession of firearms by the mentally ill. 4. Laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings. And 5. Government conditions and qualifications attached to the commercial sale of arms. I bid. Why these? Is it that similar restrictions existed in the late 18th century? The majority fails to cite any colonial analogs. And even were it possible to find analogous colonial laws in respect to all these restrictions, why should these colonial laws count? While the Boston loaded gun restriction, along with the other laws I have identified, apparently does not count. See Supra at 685, 717, 718. At the same time, the majority ignores a more important question. Given the purposes for which the framers enacted the Second Amendment, how should it be applied to modern-day circumstances that they could not have anticipated? Assume, for argument's sake, that the framers did intend the amendment to offer a degree of self-defense protection. Does that mean that the framers also intended to guarantee a right to possess a loaded gun near swimming pools, parks, and playgrounds? That they would not have cared about the children who might pick up a loaded gun on their parents' bedside table? That they, who certainly showed concern for the risk of fire, see Supra, at 684-686, would have lacked concern for the risk of accidental deaths or suicides that readily accessible loaded handguns in urban areas might bring. Unless we believe that they intended future generations to ignore such matters, answering questions such as the questions in this case requires judgment. Judicial judgment exercised within a framework for constitutional analysis that guides that judgment and which makes its exercise transparent. One cannot answer those questions by combining inconclusive historical research with judicial ips dixit. The argument about method, however, is by far the less important argument surrounding today's decision. Far more important are the unfortunate consequences that today's decision is likely to spawn. Not least of these, as I have said, is the fact that the decision threatens to throw into doubt the constitutionality of gun laws throughout the United States. I can find no sound legal basis for launching the courts on so formidable and potentially dangerous a mission. In my view, there simply is no untouchable constitutional right guaranteed by the Second Amendment to keep loaded handguns in the house in crime-ridden urban areas. 4. For these reasons, I conclude that the district's measure is a proportionate, not a disproportionate, response to the compelling concerns that led the district to adopt it. And, for these reasons as well as the independently sufficient reasons set forth by Justice Stevens, I would find the district's measure consistent with the Second Amendment's demands. With respect, I dissent. Breyer, J dissenting.